basketball for the to learn with each learn uh, working with each other uh, on the fly and embrace a culture of unselfishness and hard work. Their strong work ethic, determination, and genuine care and respect for one another created a memorable championship season. The entire city of Corpus Christi is very proud of these young men who represented their school and community with the passion and love of the game that has set the bar for the future. Their run to March Madness puts their university and the city of Corpus Christi in the national spotlight, and we know that Tamu CC Islanders will be back stronger and hungrier than ever next season. The entire city of Corpus Christi is very proud of your outstanding accomplishments, both on and off the field. What an amazing accomplishment today. Congratulations to the Texas A&M University Corpus Christi Islanders men's basketball team on an unbelievable season. I think as a team, we want to thank the city of Corpus Christi for accepting all of us, um, giving us an opportunity to represent the community on such a big stage. Um, we all put a lot into this year, and we worked our butts off. And um, we're thankful that you guys are here to support us. And um, <laughs> I'm not much on uh, uh, being in the spotlight, and, and I, I like it for these guys. Um, they they deserve it. They earned it. Um, you know, our hope obviously is the same that uh, we said when we arrived as a staff was to make you guys proud, uh, to make this your your team, and uh, we wouldn't have done it without your support. But uh, each and every person in here, if I could ask one favor, come to a game next year. Bring your neighbor, bring your friend, bring your aunt, your uncle, whoever you need to bring. But these guys deserve to have you supporting them in the stands. This is great today, um, but we'll have, you know, anywhere from 15 to 18 home games the next year that we'd like to have you there as well. So uh, thank you for everything, and we really do appreciate it and look forward to seeing you next year. I'd just like to take a moment to thank the city. This is an opportunity certainly for us to show Corpus Christi on a national stage, and certainly these young men have brought 14,000 unique visits to our campus website in the one day. Uh, a 1,407 percent increase, letting people know about Corpus Christi, letting them know about uh, Texas A&M, Corpus Christi, and all our wonderful programs. But I do want to say something. I hope you realize the significance of their accomplishments. So we have three, raise your hands, three guys stuck it out from last year. Right there they are. These men decided we're going to stay with this university, and they got the reward for it. We're so proud of them. But with, that, with these three gentlemen as the foundation, everyone else in this group is new. They started last like late summer, so they got a chance to get started. All the coaches, all the staff, all the players came together and, and formed a championship team right out of the gate year one, and you ain't seen nothing yet. So we plan to continue going. Thank you very much. Awesome. And now I'll ask the councilmen to stand on their chairs behind you <laughs> for a picture.
Okay, now we're going to ask any individuals in the audience who are here to be sworn in to any city board commission or committee uh, or corporation to please come forward. Yes. So ladies and gentlemen, these individuals have been appointed by the city council to serve on city boards, commissions, corporation, or uh, committees, and we appreciate your willingness to volunteer your time to serve the city of Corpus Christi. We're very proud, and, and again, we thank you in advance for serving. So with that, um, today, let's see. Well, we don't have Joe. Do we have everybody? Johanna Ortiz? No. Pardon? Oh, okay, okay. John Solberg, okay, John is with Building Standards Board, or will be. Albert Montes, okay, Landmark Commission. Elgin Williams, Elgin, Landmark Commission. Chad Rolstein, Rolston, Rolston, Construction Trade Advisory and Appeals Board. And that's it, right? Mike Munoz was not able, or, oh, Mike, I'm sorry. Mike Munoz, Airport Zoning and Planning Commission. Okay, would you all please raise your right hand and repeat after me. After uh, I. So I do solemnly swear that I will faithfully execute the duties of a member of the board to which I have been appointed and upon which I am about to enter and will, to the best of my ability, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution and laws of the United States and of this state, so help me God. Congratulations. Okay, I'll go ahead and call this meeting to order. Uh, and today our invocation will be given by Pastor Rob Bailey from Southside Community Church. Let's pray. Almighty God, we thank you for the many blessings that you've given us. We thank you for the blessings of living in this great and beautiful city. We thank you for our police officers and firefighters and other first responders that protect us so that we can do things like come to the city council meeting today that you would keep them safe as they protect us. Father, we also thank you for our mayor, for our city council. We thank you for our city manager, Mr. Zanoni, for our city attorney, Mr. Risley, for our city secretary, Ms. Huerta, and pray for them and all of their staffs as they uh, meet together to do the business of this city. We pray that you would give them wisdom. We pray that you would let them uh, hear and deliberate and decide in a way that pleases you today. For we pray all this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. And our Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States and to the Texas flag will be led by Isabella Ryland, who is a senior uh, at Collegiate, and uh, she's a city intern in our Contracts and Procurement uh, Department, working on her liberal, liberal arts degree. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. 
I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please join me in honoring the Texas flag. Honor the Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to thee, Texas, one state under God, one and indivisible. Thank you so much. Okay, hey, Ms. Huerta, would you please call the roll? Mayor Paulette Guajardo. Present. Council members Roland Barrera. Here. Gil Hernandez. Here. Michael Hunter. Here. Billy Lerma. Here. John Martinez. Here. Ben Molina. Present. Mike Pusley. Mike Pusley will be a little bit late. Greg Smith. Here. City Manager Peter Zanoni. Present. City Attorney Miles Risley. Here. Mayor and Council, a quorum of the Council, and the required charter officers are present to conduct the meeting. Thank you, Ms. Webster. So I'll go ahead and move to item C, um, public uh, comment. Um, before we begin, um, Mr. Risley, would you please review the Council meeting rules of decorum? Did you? Citizens are authorized and encouraged to present their views to the council on city-related matters. However, such should be done in a factual, precise presentation and questions of council or staff are inappropriate. Loud, boisterous, profane, or obscene language or behavior is not allowed. Thank you, Mr. Risley. Mr. Zanoni, did you have a comment? Yes, ma'am. Yes, thank you, Mayor. Yes, I want to uh, alert the council and the audience that item number 24, which is a zoning case, on Flower Bluff, specifically at 220 Ramsfield Road, that uh, the applicant is withdrawing uh, his application at this time. So this item we want to remove from today's city council agenda. So that's okay. item number 24. Okay, so that okay. won't be heard today. It won't be heard today. And then if you don't mind, also number 19, uh, city staff is recommending we postpone that by a week. That's the city's power purchase agreement. Okay. Uh, so we'll put that so back on So that's also the, off. Yeah, we're going to take that off today. We'll put it back on for next week. Okay. Okay, no, number 19. Okay, mm. great. Okay, so um, I will be calling each person in order in which um, you signed up. In-person public comments will be taken first, followed by virtual public comments. Corpus Christi residents will be allowed to speak uh, before non-residents. And for those commenting in person, um, I'd like to remind everyone that a recording is made of this meeting. Please speak into the microphone located at the podium and state your name and address prior to speaking. Citizen comments are limited to three minutes. Non-resident comments are limited to one. For those commenting in person, there's a timer underneath the base of the microphone, and it will let you know exactly how much time you've left. Um, once your time is up, you'll hear the buzzer, at which time we would uh, kindly appreciate you wrapping up the comments. And if you have a petition or any information pertaining to your subject matter, if you would please present it to Rebecca Huerta, our city secretary, prior to approaching the podium. Thank you. So with that, we will start with uh, Jerry Hooper. Good afternoon or morning, whichever it may be. Mayor and council members, I'm Jerry Hooper. I'm located at 341 Flower Bl uh, Valley Drive in Flower Bluff. I serve on a couple of boards in Flower Bluff and stay active in the community. Uh, I carry the vision of Flower Bluff as a constituent, a school board member, and citizens council board member. Today, I'm specifically speaking against the item you removed from the agenda, item number 24, the rezoning case number 0122-07, the Ramfield development, and my sentiments of my comments needs to carry through to any land use in Flower Bluff going forward. And any future decisions made by any of the employees and the council and the mayor in the future. As with any of the proposed developments in Flower Bluff, there are consistent issues and themes, substandard infrastructure for the area, safety of the school children, flooding, and of course the encumbrances of air installation compatibility zone, a uh, use zone the, in the, of the Navy. In this particular case, I believe that the opposition and recommendation against it on January 26 by the Planning Commission was correct. And I would like to thank them for considering our ADP our sentiments and the implications of this proposed development in their recommendation. As many of you know, Flower Bluff has been heavily involved and spent an inordinate amount of time working with the city on the area development plan and your adoption of it last June. The ADP and its discussions and its use must be the backbone of all the decisions that are made. 
considered by the city council, city employees, or the commissions. As you can see in our ADP future land use map, Flower Bluff has ser seriously considered the Navy in our plans and is generally opposed to high density or medium density residential areas around the Waldron Field area. We want to maintain the Navy presence and fully support the ACUS requirements. In this particular case, the development would be in the ACUS of accident PZ, PZ1, potential zone one and two. In understanding these zones, APZ2 in particular, recommends lower overall density rather than residential development. Now and in the future, development services, the planning commission, the zoning board, city management, city council, and for that matter, anyone else, needs to follow the ADP and desires of the community to support as well as maintain the ACUS standards and to prevent any encroachment. As the commission did and the staff recommend, I'm asking you, if it comes back up again, to vote against this rezoning and any future such rezoning which is not compliant with our ADP. As our representatives upholding our desires, I implore you to use our developed plans. By following our plans, your decision becomes very easy and you can build the trust between the city and the residents regarding their desires and your representation of them. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Huber. Charlie Thornton. Next will be Michelle Ewing and then Carmen Delgado and Tim Dowling. Good afternoon, Honorable Mayor and Council. I'm Shirley Thornton, 1917 Woodcrest Drive, Flower Bluff. I'm here today to encourage you to follow the lead of the Planning Commission and staff by voting to deny the rezoning of the Ramfield property described in agenda item 24 that was pulled. Such a vote honors development goals three and four of Plan CC and supports policy initiatives 4.10 and 4.11 of the Flower Bluff Area Development Plan. 4.10 encourages development that is compatible with the AQs around Waldron Field. 4.11 encourages large lot development in the southwest quadrant consistent with the existing development trend in the area, which also preserves the area's environmental qualities. I appreciate all of you have laid, who have laid eyes on Flower Bluff and have even gone on one of my free tours. In fact, it's time for more tours. Just call me, we'll meet at Coffee Wigs, grab a cup of joe, hop into my silver minivan, and we'll really see what created the spirit Flower Bluff. You will learn why Flower Bluff is so fiercely independent and how it almost became a town. You'll hear of how fishing, farming, ranching, oil and gas, NAS Corpus Christi, tourism, and an innovative school shaped the community. You'll see infill projects, on 7,500 square foot lots that are bringing older neighborhoods back and providing affordable housing with yards with space for kids. You'll learn about the importance of preserving our natural areas and plans to make them more accessible by foot and bicycle. You'll get to know why the people of the Ensenal Peninsula love it so much that we're willing to give our time, talents, and treasure to preserve its character. This is why, in 2016, about 30 people came together to start the Flower Bluff Citizens Council. For me, it was a response to a calling to bring peace between the city and our little community of about 22,000 residents. It was a struggle in the beginning, but then along came this council and Mr. Zanoni. Unlike our experience with past councils and city managers, you have shown a willingness to listen to us, learn about us, and that oftentimes results in healthy conversations about what is needed and wanted in Flower Bluff. Let there be no mistake, people are not drawn to Flower Bluff because they are looking for a great subdivision. Great subdivisions are all over this city. They are drawn to Flower Bluff because it has a small town feel mom and pop businesses, and big box stores. Incredible recreational opportunities along the Laguna Madre and the Oso. Beautiful, wide open spaces where nature abounds, livestock graze, and kids have room to grow. And they like having a premier school with programs to meet every child's needs. When decisions are made that strip the character of our little town, then we will look just like every other place in the city where rows of cornfields have been replaced by rows of houses. I thank you for your time and your service. And you know, don't forget to contact me for our tour. I'm up for it. All right, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Thornton. Michelle Ewing. Good afternoon. Uh, my name's Michelle Ewing. I'm at 1901 Caribbean Drive. Um, I'm, I can't say I'm shocked that the item was pulled from the agenda, but here are 100 and 17 households that are opposing this. Because I know that you don't always have a time, 
to visit our part of Flower Bluff and, and see what it is we live with each day and what our kids get to enjoy. Um, we thought we'd bring to you a video so that you can see for yourself. Thank you for your time and service, and I hope you will vote no to this and every other development that comes into Flower Bluff. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sewing. Carmen Delgado? Good afternoon, Ms. Mayor, Mr. City Manager, and esteemed City Council. My name is Carmen Tejeda Delgado, and my family resides at 241 Chandler Lane, Corpus Christi, Texas, 78404. I'm here representing the myriad of concerns my family and neighbors have, and those of many of our neighbors in the surrounding neighborhoods who could not be here today. Our issues concern and are directed to the Commodore Apartments located at 2930 Santa Fe. You will hear from a handful of highly concerned Corpus Christians today, who will be providing you with the fact-based information as well as supporting the documentation located in your individual folders that help to illustrate the vast and broad array of issues surrounding these apartments which date back to 2017. And despite our multitude of correspondences with a variety of city departments, the posture of the city has resulted in little to no improvement. In fact, the situation has become dangerously worse. The owner and manager has ignored repeated attempts by neighbors, tenants, and city officials to make any significant repairs for over five years. The most pressing issues include, but are not limited to the following three categories. Criminal activity, ranging from gun violence, witness drug trafficking, peddling and supplying, to home and vehicle invasions, vandalism, domestic violence, and sex offenders living in close proximities to school. Substandard living conditions ranging from inadequate plumbing and toilet systems where other tenants' excrement come up in other apartments due to improper drainage and broken pipes within the building walls. Inadequate building foundation leading to electrical issues such as not being able to run a refrigerator to keep a baby's milk fresh. Worn, broken, and torn down stairways causing fire hazards and cracked brick and mortar walls leading to an unsafe foundation. Code violations, reported and documented, parking violations, illegal dumping, illegal littering, illegal fencing, gas leaks, right-of-way obstruction, animal cruelty and trapped animals, grass clippings in gutters, tall weeds, junked motor vehicles, mud on the streets, barking dogs and feces on sidewalks, broken and overfilled dumpsters, bulky items such as sofas, appliances, furniture, etc., left on the side and on the street, caved in holes left behind by shoddy and unfinished plumbing and electrical work, 
We implore you here today to take these illegal activities and code violations seriously. My kids, Gilbert, Diego, Susana, and Viviana, along with all the other children in this city, deserve a safe, healthy, and crime-free place in which to live and play. So many lives have been negatively impacted for so long now, and our lives have been put in peril. Our health, safety, and our peace of mind have all been deeply compromised and negatively affected. The time to act is now. We urge our city protectors and leaders to pass this ordinance 220563. Enough is enough. In the end, we will not only be remembered by the words of our enemies, but the silence of our friends. Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr., thank you. Thank you, uh, Ms. Delgado. Uh, Tim Dowling? Madam Mayor, I'm going to withhold my comments till it comes around on the agenda. Okay, thank you, Mr. Dowling. Michael Morgan? Leona Mar Morgan will be next, and then B.B. Dalrymple, and then Austin Anderson. Mayor, City Council members, my name is Michael Morgan. I live at 3502 Golden Oak in Flower Bluff. <clears throat> Matter of fact, I was brought to Flower Bluff in 1968 as a military brat. Um, we came here because of NAS Corpus Christi. I'm very concerned about item 24 that was pulled or any rezoning uh, request that might affect our mutual uh, uh, beneficial relationship with Naval Air Station Corpus Christi. The economic welfare of Corpus Christi is largely a result of this military presence and the base is a major hub of mili military activity in South Texas. As I previously stated to you before, that this insul installation supports over 10,000 jobs and has an overall impact of approximately 3.6 billion which is equivalent to 21% of the area's $17 billion economy. Also, the Planning Commission has previously unanimously voted against the recommendation of this rezoning to higher density development. And I, that, that's just something that uh, we uh, need to take light of. Uh, moreover, the Flyer Bluff Development uh, Plan, the ADP, uh, is an instrument that the city and Flyer Bluff community has set up together for us to move in, in a planned development. Uh, this plan calls for low density development around areas of Waldron Field, and uh, this current rezoning development falls within or near the ACU zones that the Navy and the city have set up. Encroachment into the NAS uh, Corpus Christi ACU zone can jeopardize our relationship with the Navy, and uh, this shared mission facility, uh, because of encroachment, could cause the Navy to pull out. And if the Navy pulls out, that's going to be devastating, but even more important than that, is the base out there is a shared military installation and the Army is a tenant. The Army cannot afford to remain there by itself. Uh, our community in the late 70s, early 80s, uh, we basically uh, benefited from bases closing, closing down or restructuring the Army from Hershey, Pennsylvania. It brought a lot of uh, new SeaCAD uh, employees to our area and we need to keep that, that here and not lose it. Uh, the main thing is we, we're not against logical and planned development, but what we need to do, we need to move forward with low density development in areas in Flower Bluff that involve and encroach on the mi mission of the, the Navy, NAS Corpus Christi. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Morgan. Leona Morgan? Good afternoon. Thank you, Mayor Gajardo, City Manager, and City Council members for listening to Citizens of Flower Bluff again. Um, I am Leona Morgan, and I live at 3502 Golden Oak Drive, the corner of Golden Oak and Ramfield. And I want to speak a little bit more personally today about our area and how I feel about this rezoning of the item 24 that was taken off the agenda. I have lived in Flower Bluff for 51 years. My husband, Michael, and I met at Flower Bluff High School. Got married on Padre Island the summer after I graduated, and, <clears throat> and I lived in Flower Bluff ever since that time. We built our current house on Golden Oak Drive in Ramfield in 1987, and we've raised our two sons there, and we're still there. We have always loved this area. It is a mixture of country living with wonderful natural areas, including abundant wildlife, while being in the city limits. 
We have amazing bird populations, deer, skunks, possums, raccoons, javelina, coyotes, etc., all around us, and it's wonderful. We do not have city sewer, and all houses in our area have septic systems. It used to be a challenge when we had heavy rains that often in December come right in time for Christmas, and the ground became saturated outside, and our ground is pure sand, and our septic would back up into the house. That was always a problem. All that changed last March because of the city, and I want to thank you for that. The city of Corpus Christi came in and spent months widening our ditches and installing an elaborate industrial-looking culvert system that could move water away from the houses in our neighborhood. The water from our properties drains down Ramfield Road to Rocher Road to a natural floodplain. There are two large natural ponds in this area where all of our neighboring streets drain to. Bird watchers and wildlife enthusiasts come from all over Texas to this area to view the natural wildlife there. I've heard some are endangered species. This area is precisely where the rezoning area is proposed. If this natural floodplain is changed by a new housing development next to it, it would undo the months of work the city did in our area to alleviate the flooding. Also, our natural wildlife habitat would be gone. There are too few natural areas left for wildlife to coexist with habitation. This is the one thing that makes our area unique and beautiful. Please don't let it be destroyed. I ask you that you follow the Flower Bluff Area Development Plan that was developed by the city, by the citizens of Flower Bluff and the city of Corpus Christi. The planning board unanimously denied the developer's request for rezoning. I ask that you uphold, uphold this denial to the developer for the citizens of this community. And thank you for your time. Thank you, Mrs. Morgan. Uh, B.B. Dalrymple. Good afternoon, Mrs. Mayor, City Council members, and staff. My name is Bibi Dalrymple. I live at 2925 Denver Avenue. My concern today <coughs> is the condition of the Commodore Arms apartment complex located at 2920 Santa Fe Street. I have lived one block from the apartment building for over 30 years, and since Aziba LLC, owned by Mohammed Motagi, acquired this property in January 2016, it has deteriorated at an alarming rate, creating health and safety concerns. After a shootout between residents of the apartments in May 2020, several of us neighbors met with Chief of Police Mike uh, Markle and Mayor Wajardo, and on May 27, 2020, code enforcement inspected the property and found 13 code violations, including plumbing and electrical hazards. Between August 2021 and January 2022, nine citations were issued under code 604.3 for electrical system hazards. This is just one example of the substandard condition of this apartment building. One of the things I love about my neighborhood is that there is a mix of single family homes, duplexes, and apartment complexes. This neighborhood close to the bay offers people of all income levels the opportunity to live close to within walking distance of the bay and Cole Park. Affordable housing is scarce in our city, so I welcome low-income housing in the neighborhood. Unfortunately, the Commodore Arms apartments are now a blight on the neighborhood. In December 2020, Channel 10 News troubleshooters reported that a tenant at the apartments had contacted them because sewage from other apartments had been backing up into her apartment for over two weeks. Despite her pleas to management, it wasn't until her story appeared on the news that Mr. Motagi sent a plumber to make repairs. This is just one example to illustrate the callous disregard that the property owner has for his tenants' safety and well-being. He collects public money to supply affordable housing, but what he is supplying is substandard and dangerous. We expect housing to meet basic standards and offer people the opportunity to live with dignity in safe and clean conditions. The conditions at the Commodore Arms Apartments, unfortunately, create negative impressions of low-income housing and erode citizens' trust that public money is being spent judiciously. I suggest you drive or walk by the property 
at 2920 Santa Fe Street and observe the privacy fence that was built just a few years ago. During construction, the posts were set askew, the pickets were never aligned. This demonstrates in plain sight the substandard care and maintenance afflicting the entire apartment complex. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Dalrymple. Austin Anderson. Christy Ray would be next, Aaron Costilla, and then Linda Snyder. Good morning, Mayor Guajardo and uh, city council members. Some of you I know, some of you are colleagues in the legal profession, and others I have not had an opportunity to meet. So thank you for hearing our matter here today. Um, I, I'm a lawyer by trade. Uh, Carmen contacted me uh, as one of her neighbors, uh, gosh, it, almost two years ago, it seems now. And I was not as up to speed on the issues. I live at one end of the street, as about as far away as you can get from the apartments. Um, Carmen lives a little closer on Chandler, uh, just a street over. And as we began to discuss, and, 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 and I started to research the issue at my law firm, which, you know, as, as a good neighbor and a good attorney, we're just doing it for free. There, there's, there's no money being made here at my law firm on this. Um, I started looking at the, the potential remedies available for the neighborhood. And unfortunately, because of the way the statutes are written and because of the way the law is analyzed for private citizens bringing an actual cause of action, um, I've actually brought these kinds of causes of action before on behalf of residents here in the Coastal Bend and actually in some other states for nuisance violations. And a nuisance violation that we would have to bring in this situation is really, really a tough one because the, the property rights here in Texas uh, uh, for somebody else to bring a nuisance claim against you they have to rise to such a, a degree uh, that, that involves constant um, and, and, and violent, uh, really constant and violent type of crime going on. And there, and there, is, there, is, there is enough crime in my mind uh, for me to make sure that my 11-year-old and my 9-year-old don't cross a certain threshold on the street getting towards the apartments. And that's not, that's not due to the young children that live there, uh, and there are. I drive by every day. Uh, I see young children who do live there, lots of them, and, and, it, and it pains my heart to see it. Um, I, I, I'm thinking about inviting them down to my house to let them play with my kids because where they are is not a suitable environment, quite frankly, for an adult or a child. Um, it's bad. It is very bad. But back to the legal part of it, which is what they've asked me here to do, and I said, well, there's not much I can do because the law is not really on our side as a private right of action. But there is, there is a statute under the government code, chapter 54, uh, the local government code, which will allow the city attorney um, to bring a civil action against the owner of the property and, and the LLC. And I would strongly, strongly encourage uh, the city attorney's office and, and anybody else who wants to visit with me about it separately to talk about it, I'd be happy to do that. I would strongly encourage you to do that. Obviously passing the ordinance that is also at issue here is going to give you a tool to put in your toolbox to use. And I really think that needs to happen as well. That should absolutely happen because it can, it can you know, get, get people's attention and that's what needs to happen here. Um, but chapter 54 under the government code is exactly going to give another tool in the toolbox uh, to really get this landlord's attention. And that's what you need to do because you don't have it right now. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. Uh, Christy Ray. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Christy Ray. I live at 2020 Ramfield Road. I thank you for your service to the community. I'm also a, a hospice nurse. I've served this community for 22 years. Um, there is a video. It is a video of a flight path for the 11 acres that need to be, or are wanting to be rezoned. Is somebody gonna, there, there we go. So if you'll watch this video with me, it is coming up uh, to that 11 acres. This is how the planes fly. And this is clearly in the uh, safety area number one, or the AQ1. So the, they're gonna turn and bank, and you can see all of these ponds are full to capacity already without any rain in the last few days or last few weeks. So the path flight of these planes is to turn at the barn with the blue trim, which happens to be 2020 Ramfield Road, 
So that is also the most dangerous part of their flight path. So right now, that corner, we're seeing those are the 11 acres. So it's a very dangerous area to put any homes. And they're going to turn and start coming back. And you're going to then, when, at the end of the turn, you're going to see that pond. That is the pond where all of the sand and the silt has come from that drainage ditch on Ramfield and has filled those two areas that were needed for drainage. So any more impermeable surfaces, such as roads or driveways or houses, will continue to just flood out this area. Uh, just personally, you know, I've lived there since 2016, where if it rained, I could get out to see my patients, and that's very important. We need to serve, you know, doctors and nurses and other healthcare workers in this area need to be able to get to work. Now, if we have any significant rainfall, if I am able to leave, I may not be able to get back. Um, it, is, it is a major issue. But the safety of these pilots and the safety of the people, if there is a crash, need to be considered strongly. So I am asking that the city council please vote no. Please follow the denial of the planning committee, the actions of the Flower Bluff Development Plan, and the Navy's AQ uh, safety and rezoning. I appreciate all of your time and consideration in this matter. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Ray. Uh, Aaron Costillo? Hello, thank you all for your service. My name is Aaron Costillo. I live at 2020 Ramfield, along with Christy. I've been there for 16 plus years. And as you saw by the drone footage, I didn't get it uploaded in time. But I have photos and videos showing the massive flooding issues we've had with the development over the last few years, showing from, I wish I would have got it up there, but pretty much the whole subject property is completely covered in water. Like if you try to walk in the back corner of that property, 11 acres, it's probably up to my waist. So that's why I'm highly encouraged, you know, to deny any further de uh, rezoning or any development in that area because, as Christy stated, all the water down Ramp Hill comes, drains into that area, and also some of the pictures I was going to show shows all the water coming from Glen Oak and Flower Bluff Drive. You can clearly see it just flowing all the way through and ending up in that area. And Michelle Ewing's home is on Caribbean right there, and it connects to that 11 acres right at the corner. And I believe it was probably less than 20 feet when the last floods we had back in July of last year was right almost to her house. So if we ever got a truly substantial rain for a longer period of time, she would be totally flooded out. I know she can't even get into her property, quote, when we have any substantial rains. So in short, I would just like to encourage you all just to think about that. Not only the AQs1 is a danger factor, as you saw the low density housing in that whole area as a flight path, but just to think about all of us that live there, the wildlife that will be displaced, because I see a uh, uh, I see coyotes, uh, skunks, jacarundis. I've seen a uh, mountain lion there. It's been years, but we have really interesting life, uh, wildlife in that area, and I like to keep it that way. But thank you very much for your time, and have a good day. Thank you, Mr. Costilla. Linda Snyder. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council Members. My name is Linda Snyder, and I'm a homeowner in District 3 at 6213 Angelique Court. <clears throat> I'm also a precinct chair for 118 and an active member of the League of Women Voters and the Congregation Beth Israel Synagogue. My father and brother lived in Corpus Christi or the island since the 70s, and there were other relatives decades before that. I have lived in many states during my lifetime, and when my husband and I retired, we could have lived anywhere in the country. We chose here. I care about this city and I care about this county. I also care about the way citizens get their information and transparency on how and why decisions are made is very important. My biggest concern today about the redistricting boundaries isn't for my District 3, and I'm very pleased with the responsiveness of Councilman Barrera. 
I do not agree with any plans that lump North Beach downtown and Cal Allen together. These communities do not share the same interests. After reviewing all of the maps, plan D1 appears to be the most logical and balanced for redistricting. In my opinion, having North Beach and downtown in District 2 makes more sense. It would maintain the minority majority in District 2 and all the hospitals will be in one district. Even though it's too late for happening this year, I would also like to go on record as saying that I would really like to see efforts made to create an independent redistricting commission. I don't believe that politicians should draw their own maps and an IRC is the most nonpartisan fair way to do this. 15 states have already done this in one form or another. Texas should not be the last. It's puzzling to me why there is such a small window of opportunity for citizens to sign up to make in-person public comments. It should be more than one day. I understand deadlines, but with something this important, I do not believe that interested citizens or groups have had sufficient time to review the proposed district maps or submit their own. Before I stop, I'd like to give credit where credit is due and thank the City Council for conducting redistricting public input hearings in every district. I was there and for creating a redistricting website that is user friendly. After all, the goal should always be to help citizens be engaged in decision making for where they live. Only God knows who of us will be around 10 years from now, but we do know that you have the power to make a difference right now. Thank you for your time and attention today. Thank you, uh, Ms. Snyder. Shannon Murphy. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council Members. My name is Shannon Murphy at 2157 Shoddy Street. I'm here to speak in opposition of item 24 that was withdrawn, the zoning change request on Ramfield near Rocher. It's another zone change request in Flower Bluff that's inconsistent with our area development plan. I would like to thank the Planning Commission and staff for the recommendation to deny the zoning change, and I encourage you all to vote the same whenever it does come back. We want to preserve the rural character of this area in Flower Bluff. Um, large lots with single homes. The video that you saw a little earlier, my family and I, we ride those um, streets on our bikes. We do see all that wildlife. It's a really special place. My favorite thing about coming home from work is you literally start driving through rural areas and your body just relaxes. And then you get home. This property is also in the ACUS, and we need to ensure it remains large lot development to continue to strengthen our relationship with the Navy. What's nice is that we have a tool in place to guide development in Flower Bluff, the area development plan that you all adopted. So I respectfully request city staff to consider all zone change requests by reviewing that ADP first and for foremost. We need to work together to preserve the vision themes and policies that came directly from Flower Bluff residents. If possible, I also request city staff to add the president of the Flower Bluff Citizens Council to the mailing list when notices get sent out to property owners when there's a zone change in Flower Bluff. Thank you for your time and the opportunity to speak. Thank you, Ms. Murphy. Justin Brandt. There you are. <laughs> Good afternoon, Council, Mayor. Really appreciate y'all's time today. Uh, my name is Justin Brandt at 3301 Rocher Road in Flower Bluff. And like many others here today, I would like to express my opposition to the Ramfield Rocher subdivision development uh, that you've heard about today. I'd like to touch on a few reasons uh, that the proposed rezoning should be denied. And first and foremost, uh, the Planning Commission and staff, of course, have recommended denial of this rezoning due to its ACUS designation. Of course, these are uh, experienced individuals with a lot of wisdom, and we rely on them to make decisions like this one. And I'd urge you to consider and reflect the opinion of the team. Uh, second, Ramfield and Rocher simply don't have the street infrastructure necessary to host a high-density neighborhood such as this one. I grew up off Ramfield, and my brothers and I spent summer afternoons riding bikes down these streets, visiting neighbors on, uh, you know, uh, neighboring streets. 
Uh, back then, there were no sidewalks, and there still aren't any sidewalks today. I encourage you to drive out, park alongside either one of these roads, and take a short walk. You'll marvel at the quiet atmosphere. You may see a, a mother and my wife walking uh, any of our kids down the, the edge of the road there. Uh, you may see my mom riding her paint horse uh, down Ramfield, which she really enjoys. You may also spot a deer or two, or maybe some other wildlife that would certainly be displaced if this project sees fruition. These streets were not designed for high volumes of traffic. It's, very ins it's simply unsafe. So third, um, our area relies completely on septic systems to handle waste. This area is notorious for groundwater issues. This specific acreage is actually very notorious for groundwater issues. I've called three different septic installers, all of which recommend to require an aerobic system over a conventional septic system given the groundwater in the area. I'm actually installing one myself right now just down the street. Uh, so I have a little personal experience here. And <clears throat> an aerobic system requires at least three sprinkler heads to redistribute water across the property, each of which must spray in a full circle. Each, head spray, each head's spray radius must not touch that of another head, which according to professionals requires about 5,000 square feet of spray area for a half acre lot. Furthermore, the spray can't touch driveways, houses, trees, fences, or any other, anything other than grass. The spray, not the spray head, must be 10 feet away from the nearest property line. A half acre lot is comprised of 21,500 square feet, and I took some measurements on Google Earth um, today from a nearby subdivision designed by the same developer and determined the following. Assuming a square half acre lot and taking into account a 10 foot no spray perimeter of 2,832.57 square feet, a spray size of 500 or 5,000 square feet, a primary residence footprint of roughly 5,800 square feet, and that would include like an, an attached garage or any patios, things like that, the primary footprint of the home, um, and a driveway of about 2,100 square feet, the total area left on the entire half acre is uh, 5,730 square feet, which is just over a tenth of an acre. And this is if everything is done in exactly right. It doesn't account for easements, sidewalks, entry walks, sheds, carports, exterior AC units, play areas, auxiliary buildings, animal shelters, or even swimming pools, which is a big thing that we have. Neighborhood with lots of this size simply can't support the waste produced in the neighborhood. And I would uh, ask that you consider the positions of individuals like myself and many others who enjoy the quiet, secluded community in Flower Bluff. Continuing to allow developments like these sets a precedence for similar developers and developments to forever change a one-of-a-kind landscape, one that can be found nowhere else in Corpus Christi. Thank you all for your Thank time. Thank you, Mr. Brandt. Uh, Jane Kratzig. Good afternoon, Mayor, City Council members. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Uh, I have lived at 235 Chandler Lane for 46 years, since 1976. I'm one of the old, older members on the street. Uh, it's a wonderful, wonderful neighborhood. I brought up three daughters there. Uh, they had free roaming privileges of the neighborhood. I felt very safe. There were many children around. Um, for the last six years, we've had a real problem. Uh, I don't feel safe anymore, and it's not healthy. Uh, one day, I heard my dogs barking, and um, so I was going, going to go see what was happening, and the, the uh, doorbell rang, and it was a policeman. He said, two boys that we've been chasing have jumped over the street from your apartment, you know, from Amistad into your yard, and your dogs have them up against the fence. I said, oh, good. <laughs> so we, um, you know, he said, would you please call your dogs off and then let me go out and collar the victim, the, the two boys, but uh, please uh, don't get near a window because they may have guns. Well, you know, this is a really nice morning. Um, it, it's, da it's more dangerous, it, the policemen and ambulances are at that apartment complex all the time. There's trash everywhere. Uh, they park, it's like a party all the time. On one side of the road next to the apartment, is, it's okay to park, but on the other side, it's illegal. And that doesn't stop it. So you've got parking on both sides of a very, very lane, it's Chandler Lane, so that when you try to drive out onto Santa Fe, you know, somebody's gonna be turning in. If you try to move, drive into Chandler Lane from Santa Fe, the same thing. 
uh, there are just so many violations over there. It's unbelievable. And uh, it is no longer a place where I want my children to be. I'll have my grandchildren this summer, and they're all three under seven, and I, I'm not going to feel safe to let them play outside. They have to be in the backyard in our fenced yard, which is fine, but we, there are children in the neighborhood that it would be nice for them to play with, and I could just leave them, and that would give them some of the freedom that Corpus Christi has been known for, for, you know, safe neighborhoods. Anyway, that's really about all I wanted to say. Uh, thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you, Ms. Krentzig. Um, Ann Engel. Hi, my name is Ann Engel. I am not good at public speaking, so forgive me. I have lived at 230 Amistad for the past 26 years. Over this time period, I have observed that under the current ownership, the respectable apartments that were at the corner of Amistad and Santa Fe have deteriorated to a point where they do not appear to be habitable and must likely be on repair, and there has been a huge increase in crime. I feel sad for the people who live there to have a landlord that has not kept the property up to a satisfactory, safe level. I do not understand how city officials can allow substandard housing to exist. I am no expert on code, but it's obvious from the outside there are issues, and I can only imagine what it's like within these apartments. You've been shown a number of times that the police and code enforcers have been to that property. Nothing changes. Several times I've personally expressed my concerns to the owner and his son-in-law, made them aware with, of the situation with no response. With that said, I have witnessed several episodes of the police being called out to deal with the tenants, and the final straw was two weeks ago. While walking by the apartments, I see a young man run from the police into my backyard. After a short search, he was found between my house and my neighbors, and according to what I was told by the officer, they had intercepted an active drug deal, and the man had a gun in his possession. I do not know the owner's criteria for approving tenants. There seems to be no issue allowing convicted registered sex offenders to live there. And again, I know everyone is entitled to a place to live, but on, only do we have a lot of children living by nearby, but there are many living in this apartment, and Incarnate Words Playground is in within 1,000 square feet of this apartment. Since this episode, I know the city has cited the owner and placed no trespassing signs, which I assume that means the apartments are not hab habitable. However, as of today, there are still tenants living there. I encourage you to approve the recommendation of passing number 22-0563 to allow the city officials to cut the water off in situations like this. The efforts of the city council and the police over the past five years have done nothing to force the landlord to change his way of operating this apartment complex. It is a danger to the tenants and the neighborhood. We are one step away from an innocent bystander getting hurt. It's time for these apartments actually to be torn down and replaced with better housing. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Engel. Ken Herring. Oh, okay. Thank you, Mr. Herring. Uh, Encarnacion Serra. And then we'll have Scott Barker, Sylvia Campos, and Julie Rogers. <clears throat> Good afternoon, City Council. Uh, my name is Encarnacion Serna, and I live in Portland, Texas, uh, San Patricio County, on the other side of the bridge. Uh, and so I know officially I'm an outsider. We've been categorized outsiders. But I don't consider myself an outsider because important decisions are made here uh, uh, that affect or could have, you know, even catastrophic consequences on the other side of the uh, bridge. And I have grandchildren in here that I care very much for. I am a member of LWV, and I'm speaking about a little bit and asking a couple of things about uh, redistricting. Uh, primarily, give it time 
Don't decide today, wait, maybe give it a week, two weeks. Uh, think about what the people need, what the people want. Uh, I personally would like to see uh, the jury, uh, redistricting that is conveyed on map D1 to be uh, voted on or adopted by the city, but more fair and more objective. You all decide, but give it time. Give it time and think it out. Uh, again, redistricting, uh, gerrymandering, voting, human rights, all that, even though <laughs> I'm an outsider, I have a lot of grandkids in here, and sometimes decisions are made in here by the city, by the county, and we end up with a lot of bad stuff in San Patricio. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Serna. Scott Barker. Hello, my name is Ricky Barker. Um, oh. Scott wasn't able to be here. Uh, I live at 217 Chandler Lane. Um, as residents and parents on Chandler Lane, we are saddened by what's come to define our neighborhood. On a daily basis, we're concerned our for our family's safety. It's not uncommon for us to enter our neighborhood from Santa Fe, greeted by multiple police cars due to issues with the apartment's tenants, trash, cars parked illegally, the smell of sewage, loitering, and more. While this is bad enough to cause people to question why they live near something like this, the impact of the Commodore Arms reaches far further. The known crime that has and is taking place on a daily basis has justifiably limited our children's freedom to play on their own property and around the residential, around the resident safely. As a result, our children are not free to be in the front yard. We have a rule. They cannot be outside without an adult. And that rule extends to our backyard. We have had criminals run through our backyard that's gated and locked. Um, <clears throat> on occasion, while on a daily walk, I had to shelter our 80 plus year old neighbor during a police canvas of our neighborhood. It should be mentioned that her home was also burglari burglarized within the last two years while she and her husband were home. Additionally, at least and least of which, at any given time, there have been one to three residents of the Commodore Arms that are registered sex offenders, with a past manager of the property being one of those. Currently, a 43-year-old male convicted sex offender with two counts of this awful crime resides there. The police records state that his assault was on a child. We see drug deals happen in front of our homes, in front of the apartments on Chandler and Amistad. We see people sleeping in their vehicles in front of our homes. We have strange cars slow as they drive by our home while we're outside with our children. When my children and I used to take walks to the end of the street, we would find drug paraphernalia, prophylactics, etc. Simply put, we fear for our safety and that of our children on a daily basis. I have a 15-year-old girl, a six-year-old girl, and a three-year-old boy, and they should be free to be in their front yards. We purchased our home in 2018, followed by an extensive remodel. When we chose to be here, we knew we were making a large investment in our future and in the city of Corpus Christi. We wanted Besser Park in Chandler Lane, what, what Besser Park in Chandler Lane was known for, in the ways of an older, established, and safe neighborhood. We thought our investment in an older home and neighborhood would be one which helped the neighborhood and ourselves, one that breathed new life into property that would offer us and those around us better area for our children and others to grow and appreciate the city. Sadly, since our move, we have continued to question our investment, trust in the city of Corpus Christi, as the Commodore Arms has brought into question every additional investment that we think about when it comes to our home. In closing, I want you to know that when visitors come to town, to our home, this crime-ridden complex represents us as a city, family, and neighborhood. When turning onto our street and leaving our street, it's the title one is left with. It's very sadly that it defines us. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Barker. And Sylvia Campos? Good afternoon, uh, Mayor, City Council. Uh, I come to you this morning to speak, well actually afternoon I guess, uh, redistricting. I'm a member of the League of Women Voters but do not speak for the League. In 10 years, you will not be sitting there, but your legacy will. How these lines are drawn up will depend on your vote, but yet in order to have a more holistic result, you need to remove yourself from the equation. This approach is the most difficult, and yet this is where we are. 
We tried to advocate for an independent redistricting committee for this reason. It didn't happen, so now we have certain council members that are concerned with uh, what will happen to their districts. It is not anyone's district. We are advocating for the whole city. One of the most popular map suggestions has been to move the lines in District 2 to include downtown and North Beach. This could be known as the Bay District. It would mean the council member would be advocating cohesively with common interests. We ask you to please consider the alternate maps. As a matter of fact, we were made aware that even an additional map was brought up yesterday. So I feel, or we feel at this time, that we should postpone the vote uh, for on redistricting. So um, we, uh, we also uh, want you to please consider all the comments that are being placed on the website. Thank you, Ms. Huerta. Um, and uh, to please consider yourselves just taking yourselves out of the equation, especially the district members. Your vote should be based on what uh, the best, is best for the citizens. Uh, we also uh, want to thank you. Thank you, especially you, Ms. Huerta, uh, for giving us such you know, opportuni more opportunities to speak. The sad thing is that the city, uh, some of the uh, members, or some of uh, the community did, were not able to come out. So, um, 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 but the good thing is that we have Delmar Board of Regents. I don't know if y'all heard, but they're actually going to have a redistricting committee uh, or meeting for the public. The sad thing, though, is that I think it's going to be after y'all's vote. So we're all still trying to get this information out. Um, I also just uh, wanted to uh, pay homage and, and gratefulness for, for all the people that come out here and, and try to make the city better. Uh, we ask you to please listen to us. Uh, I want to also especially thank the League of Women Voters. Um, they're here in the audience. And uh, just think this through. Uh, it's not too late. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Julie Rogers. Margaret Dudon would be next. David Gerlock after that. Alrighty. Hello, I'm Julie Rogers, 710 Furman, and I'm representing myself. Participatory democracy is my special interest. That's why I'm a member of the League of Women Voters of Corpus Christi. The League is proud to defend democracy and empower voters, which is why we have advocated for fair maps during the state, county, and city redistricting process. An independent redistricting commission would have been the most effective way to achieve fair maps, but no elected officials chose that proven, unbiased, and democratic method. Instead, elected officials chose to try to be fair and impartial individuals. So I implore you to be fair and impartial when deciding on the final maps. The community input sessions were a way to inform your decision. I have heard you all celebrate that there were seven community input sessions this go round instead of only one like last time. It's too early to celebrate this accomplishment if they did not matter. At the last workshop, most of you indicated that you will vote for Plan B map, which is the one prepared by your council. There have been no changes and very little discussion based on the community input sessions or the public comments posted on the city's redistricting webpage, although several community members submitted maps and several community members support map D or D1, which would decouple North Beach and downtown from District 1 and move them to a bayfront community of interest with District 2. You can celebrate your achievements after you show us that participatory democracy is your special interest too. Listen to the community and make some changes to the current and proposed maps and we will celebrate you. Thank you very much, Ms. Rogers. Margaret Dudon. Good morning, Mayor Guajardo, um, our dear manager, council members and neighbors. My name is Peggy Duran. I live at 4022 Congressional Drive for the last um, 33 years. And redistricting has been quite an exercise on how democracy can work. 
we who have been participating hope that you will take the best suggestions into redrawing our outdated 30-year-old 1983 maps to represent the varied and changed interests in our differing communities. At this time, I support uh, the Plan D1. It just makes sense to have one council member representing the port and petrochemical industries in District 1 and another different member for the North Beach, downtown, Ocean Drive area of District 2. Let's balance industry with tourism, health, education, our military, and very importantly for our future, the maintenance of our magnificent bay and bayfront. We had hoped for an independent redistricting commission. Currently, they are used in 15 states. Even Austin has an IRC. Um, they're nonpartisan, bipartisan formations. They'll have problems, too. I don't think there's any perfect way ever to get this right. But let's, let's just keep trying. Um, you gave us the next best thing with all of these meetings, the website, the, um, the district meetings. I must add that I was disappointed with the state redistricting hearings. In the words of Henry Higgins in My Fair Lady, they listened very nicely, then went out and did precisely as they pleased. <laughs> Show us that this is a good faith effort. Your consideration of our suggestions will let us know that you do take public comment, transparency, and participation seriously. I thank you for this opportunity, especially now, seeing how fragile democracies can be. I think this whole time of public comment today has just been fascinating to see all that you are faced with. It's never just one issue, is it? So good luck and thank you very much for your service. Thank you, Ms. Dudon. David Gerlach and Jack Gordy would be next. Good afternoon, Mayor, members of the Council. Uh, my name is David Gerlach. I live at 581 Yorktown. <clears throat> I'm here to speak out against item 24 that's been pulled. Uh, Mayor, members of the Council, first, thank you for your service to the community. I realize that many times the Council bears the brunt of frustrated citizens like myself. Because I am frustrated that the city development services and the various commissions that determine how the city develop time and time again show deference to the developers over the wishes of the citizens and their communities. I am fully aware of the importance that developers play in growing a city, as are many of the people who have spoken out against this item, as well as the Sweet Bay development the same developer is trying to push through. The, many of the other projects that the city has approved have been forced on the Flower Bluff area against the citizens' wishes. I'm aware of many times the developers seem to play by a different set of rules. I'm not talking about land swaps or tax breaks or any of the other various ways the city encourages developments. I'm talking about fairly and evenly applying the codified set of ordinances and development plans the city has adopted. For me, that's personal, as I have first-hand experience with the different standards that sometimes citizens versus developers have to deal with. When I built my house, I was told I had to tie into the city sewer system. Might not seem like a big deal. The city wouldn't allow me to install a septic system, even though I have five acres. Instead, when I went to get my building permit, development services cited the city ordinance stating that septic tanks would be disallowed when a sewer line is within a reasonable and economically feasible distance of an existing line. When I went to city engineering, I was told that the city was trying to move away from allowing septic systems on lots of less than one acre, <clears throat> or as stated in the ordinances, when a line, again, was within a reasonable distance or economically feasible distance. Reasonable and to whom, nobody would define for me, because that would set precedence. Uh, so I had to tie into the city sewer system a thousand feet away from my house at my cost, which was far from economically feasible for any person trying to build a single house. Why do I bring this up? Because the city has let the same developer who's trying to rezone this property in question build dozens of houses on half acre lots with septic systems, no more than a half a mile from my house. Uh, the developer wants to build more of the same without extending any sanitary sewer infrastructure with zero benefit to the community, just like all of the other developments that he's pushed through over there. Uh, 
Only benefit is to his bottom line, honestly. The community doesn't, doesn't gain any infrastructure from these houses whatsoever. Uh, certainly given the amount of houses that the developers already built on septic and got variances for, uh, should the city see fit to ignore the wishes of the citizens of Flower Bluff and allow this rezoning to go through, we should make the developer extend the sewer line as a condition of rezoning and platting. It's easy enough to annotate on the plat before it's submitted that he has to do so. Uh, given the number of houses he's already built, it is most certainly economically feasible for him to do so. Uh, or better yet, don't allow the rezoning at all. In closing, development should be done in line with Plan CC, the Flower Bluff Area Development Plan, codes and ordinances equally applied, and the community should at the very minimum benefit from this developer as much as he stands to benefit from the community. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gerlach. Jack Gordy. Yes, my name is Jack Gordy and I live at 4118 Bray Drive. And I'm here for one thing. I want to ask the city council to start doing what you were elected to do. I've been here since 1974, and this is the worst city council that I've seen since 1974. You keep ignoring stuff that's wrong. Every one of you, I know good and well, when you drive around your neighborhood or drive around the city, you're seeing illegal signs. Every political sign in this city is supposed to have been down by 9 p.m. on the 11th, 10 days after the election, and they're still up and nobody's doing anything. And the, there's 14 roadways in the city that falls under the Highway Beautification Act. Those signs, there's 14 roadways, and I know good and well when you people are driving, you see the signs in the right-of-way. Those signs in those right-of-way on those 14 roadways are violating the federal law, state law, and the city ordinance. On Weber Road, from Holly Road, from, on Weber, from Holly Road to Saratoga, there's nine signs in the right-of-way, and every one of them are violating the law. They've been there for seven months, and I've called the city at least ten times about those illegal signs, and they're still there. And if the city would enforce it, each one of those signs is a $2,000 fine each day that it's there. But the city just ignores it, and this city council ignores it. And you can't tell me you don't see the illegal signs when you're driving, but I guess you don't care. Because if you did, you would do what you were elected to do. Make sure that the city does what they're supposed to do. And I'm asking you, start doing it. Start doing what you were elected to do. Thank you, Mr. Gordy. Barbara Welder. Oh, thank you, Mayor. <laughs> Uh, I appreciate the time with you, all of you and uh, Mr. Zanoni and staff. I wanted to thank you again for coming out and visiting with us last I'm year sorry, and Ms. this year. Sorry, Ms. Welder, hang on, because we can't hear you. Excuse me, I can't hear, but Excuse yeah, me. hang on. Oh. Where's Mark? Mark? Herod? Okay. Go ahead. Oh, okay. <laughs> Deep breath here. All right. Um, I'm here, Barbara Welder. I live on North Beach. I don't just talk about North Beach. I live there every day, 24-7. So um, what I'm about to talk about, it, 20, 202 Reef Avenue, and I'm also president of NBCA, although I'm representing myself today as well. <clears throat> I am for Map B and Plan B in the redistricting process. In order to understand all of this, I had to read everything. And that one thing that I read carefully was the website of the city of Corpus Christi, which asserts that there are several resolutions adopted for this process of 2022. Number one says that the district should be compact and composed of contiguous territory. That means touching. So if we decide to put North Beach in some other district, although I certainly appreciate every councilman here, it's not meant personally. But if we separate North Beach, we would 
be more isolated, and that follows your resolution. We don't want to be res uh, separated. We want to be part of the city of Corpus Christi as we are now. Number two, I keep hearing about commonalities. We ought to have a district with a lot of commonalities. Well, our nation was founded on not commonalities at all, diversity, and that's what we live in. That's reality. So District 1 has a lot of diversity. That's very true. We may even have some imbalance of numbers from Cal Allen to little old North Beach and all of that. But it works. We support the downtown management system, Alyssa Barrera and all that group, the Main Street program. We support the historical district and all the Bayfront district as well. We're in the business of tourism. So we have a lot of commonalities between North Beach within District 1. Number three is uh, my reason, uh, <laughs> which is very important for all of us to remember here. Um, the consideration, and this came from the website as well, on uh, the overall recommendations. It says, finally, consideration must be given to the preservation of the incumbent and constitui constituency relations. Now, I'm just going to say this. We're very pleased with the government we have right now, with Mr. Lerma and with our three elected uh, councilmen at large. We have had no, no push off like a little bitty thing from any person in the Cal Allen area. So that system is working, and for that reason, we want to keep it as it is. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Welder. Uh, Catherine Aller. Mario Valdez would be next. Uh, following would be Tony Jimenez. Good afternoon, Mayor Guajardo and Councilman. My name is Catherine Oler, and I'm a resident of District 2 at 1400 Ocean Drive. However, um, this afternoon, I'm speaking on behalf of the League of Women Voters of Corpus Christi. I would first like to thank each of you and City Secretary Rebecca Huerta and her staff for the work you have done in making this redistricting process as fair and open as as you have done in the short amount of time prescribed for yourselves. This has been a learning experience for everyone who has participated, as well as those who have not. Since the beginning of this process, the League of Women Voters has advocated for a process that is fair and open. Some citizens, including many League members, have valued and acted upon this opportunity to make their voices heard. Many, far too many, have not. As you reflect upon your actions today, and if there is a, hearing, a vote today of the first hearing or the second hearing, I ask you to ask yourself if you have done enough. Today is my 47th wedding anniversary. Strangely or not, when I woke up this morning, and started thinking about this day, the word negotiate kept floating around in my brain. A marriage, like any transaction, has give and take, and sometimes a peace negotiated through meaningful conversation. I ask you to ask yourself again if you have done enough to have these meaningful conversations with the people of your district the people who rely upon you to make monumental decisions about how their tax dollars are spent, how their city streets are maintained, how their housing is habitable, how their water is delivered or diverted, and how their livelihoods, health, and safety are secure. Your votes can and will have a profound impact on what this city is like at the end of the next 10 years. On that anniversary, will you be able to say, I negotiated a fair 
and open redistricting process and implementation that has served my people, my district, my city well. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you. Uh, Mario Valdez. My name is Mario Valdez. <clears throat> Excuse me. I live on 5206 Pickville Drive. This is regarding the 5G mini tower located on the corner of Pickville Drive and Ridgestone Drive. <clears throat> Excuse me. Oh, the mark. Sorry. Uh, I guess this will be directed to the city manager. Uh, at the last council meeting, there was a discussion about a meeting or conversation that was going to occur between AT&T Representative uh, Kelly Kerbo uh, and your ITT specialist. Uh, we would like to know what was the outcome of that meeting. And uh, uh, I'm going to give my time up to you to discuss that with the city council. Thank you. Can you do Miss? Yeah. Can you do that? No. Uh, questions are not allowed of staff or council okay. at Citizen Communication. Okay, and we will have Mr. Tony. Two minutes. Well, there, that was the thing. There oh. was supposed to be a meeting between AT representative, so we would like to know what was the outcome of that meeting or the minutes discussed. There's got to be some kind of documentation. Okay. Where yeah. can we find Mr. that documentation? Mr. Valdez, what we'll do here in this forum, we cannot do that, but as with other issues, I have staff or the manager has directors address certain issues, so we can certainly do that with yourself. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Mayor? Uh, Ms. Mayor? Uh, Ms. Um, Peter Collins is in the back of the room. Maybe you can have him well, talk to him. Well, that's what I just said, was we're going <laughs> to do that. So let Mr. Zanoni. Yeah, right. Uh, Mr. Valdez, Peter Collins, uh, the gentleman next to Chief Blackman in the back will speak with yeah. you. Mr. Jimenez, would can you, you like him? to come up, please? Tony Jimenez, the 7002 uh, Richstone Drive, and I'm also here about the 5G tower. Uh, again, we're not against technology. Everybody loves technology. We're against the placement of technology. Uh, you yourself said that some of these towers have been moved. You've mentioned that in the past. The, the small cell towers have been moved, like in the marina, Flower, I mean, uh, excuse me, King's Crossing. Uh, in your neighborhood, it was one. It disappeared the other day because I want to take a picture of it on okay. Strasburg. You live in King's Cross. I don't live on Strasburg, but yes, I know. I do but live in Kings, Kings, yeah, disappeared. Okay. The hole still there. They put, they patched that up with dirt, but that's okay. I've asked Mr. Hernandez to look at, at the uh, Boca Raton deal. You know, the tower that was a Boca Raton that was in Mr. Barrera's deal in our district. And I asked you if you can, you know, if he had it move, how can we help you to get it moved from our neighborhood? And you explained to me that Mr. Barrera said that he had nothing to do with that, correct? Okay, well, I have talked to Mr. Barrera's. That's what Mr. Hernandez said. <laughs> okay. Uh, I've talked yeah. to Aaron Munoz, who's your assistant, and he told me you guys were all over that thing to get it removed. So one, one guy's telling me one thing, another guy's telling another thing. Meanwhile, we're still there. In two weeks, it'll be a year since that thing's been there, on and off. Mm -hmm. I mean... My daughter still sleeps in the back. I still get headaches every day I go home. I got to tell you, my either Tyler or Advil, I probably won't have any kidneys or liver in about a year, but my daughter still sleeps in the back. None of, the neighborhood had 10, 20 kids. Nobody plays outside anymore. Everybody had those three swings. I don't know if you guys watched the movie Terminator, when they nuke everything and the swings are just sitting there. That's the swings. There's no, no kids play outside. You're hurting, I mean, this is hurting the kids. And it seems to be like nothing, I mean, I don't know what else they do. I mean, we've talked to Mr. Kerbo. Kerbo says the city, it was the city's fault. The city says that is, I know, House Bill, please, 1003 or 4, I, we already know about that. But nothing gets, nothing is moving. We're going, we're going on a year. This is crazy. I mean, how would you like to go home every day and you have to take a Tylenol and Advil because your head is killing you? Two weeks ago, those, that couple was here, Mr. Goodman, Mrs. Goodman, you remember her because she was pointing you out. She was, you know, she had ended up with a CAT scan the other day. Her head hurt so bad, they took her in for a CAT scan because the, the doctor couldn't find anything. I mean, this, this is crazy. I mean, and, and, and it's just, it's like the can is just keeps getting kicked and kicked and, and it's like we're getting nowhere. We just want this thing relocate it. There's plenty of places to put it. You relocated the one and 
King's Crossing, the one in your area, and the other ones have been re relocated. Why can't we not relocate this? What is so special about this one? Well, okay, Mr. Jimenez, and I, I truly believe, I understand <laughs> you've spoken with council members, but this is at a level of which it's Mr. Collins and the company, obviously, and I know you've had conversations mm -hmm. with them, but that's really where it is. That's, okay. I mean, Mr. Zanoni, unless you say otherwise. No, I would agree with that, Mayor. <laughs> okay, mm -hmm. so Mr. Collins, would you like to maybe visit? Yeah, thank you. Uh, Tim Tease. Oh, I think he, is that open over here? Oh, Mr. Tease, could you go around? I'm sorry. Esther Martinez would be next and just, didn't we hear from Justin? Right, okay. Uh, good morning, uh, good looking council. I'm uh, Tim Tease, I live at 4737 Mount Vernon. Uh, and on the adjacent property to 5007, where they're putting up a 130-foot cell tower on Everhart Road. And the reason I'm here, I'm going to come for that later tomorrow or whenever the hearing is about the rezoning, but it makes little sense to put a tower on a 130-foot by 150-foot lot. It has to be one and a half times the height for setback, to have a variance on the setback that still hits the house and goes across Everhart in case of a storm. And from what I understand today when I was driving here, there's some towers down and we're having problems because, and I looked it up, OSHA, apparently their towers go down all the time. 139 mile an hour winds are not necessarily what's required for a tower to go down or even the component of the tower to come down. People have been beheaded because They've walked under a tower and a 25 mile an hour wind has blown off a component and beheaded them. It's on OSHA report if you want to look it up. OSHA reports daily on cell tower accidents. So uh, it's just, it's the right thing. 5G is the right thing. Like the gentleman said, it's just the wrong place. I mean, why put it on Everhart when you can't put a drive through on Everhart? You can't back up traffic. And uh, city staff says, well, that's not an arterial road. However, the arterial road ends at the north side of Mount Vernon, which the cell tower at 195 feet easily you know, crosses into that arterial road. Not to include that if you can, with this redistricting, and I know that's been a big issue, and that's very, very difficult, and I feel sorry for you, but you're doing a good job. District two, people do need to evacuate using Everhart because that's the highest, that is the designated routed so why put a, any kind of obstruction, even a heavy rain, and I know we talk about 130 mile an hour wind, but you have rain, you have uh, hail, you have, we had snow before, you have other things that could cause the collapse of a tower. Just put it in a, a neighborhood, that, and I'm zoned neighborhood, why, why not put it in Star Dental, right above there? It came from Chick-fil-A, like all these other towers that are moving from the south side, they seem to be ending up in District 2. So as the population, according to the census, moves south, the cell towers are moving north. And it doesn't seem to make a lot of sense, but uh, I'm sure there's some way to say uh, you're stepping over a dollar to get to a dime when the MPO is looking for money for infrastructure right now. And we have the money to do it, $3 million, to get infrastructure done that hasn't been done and we, we can do it, but that's not going to be a positive point to have a, a, a obstruction on Everhart Road. Thank you. Thank you. And I appreciate your good work. Um, oh. Sorry, Esther Martinez and then Alicia Cowan. And those are the last two in person. Esther Martinez is coming. Do we have Alicia Cowan? No. Oh, maybe so. Maybe not. Pictures around for people to see them. Can you start that? Um, yes, I'm Mr. Martinez. I live at 1742 Triple Crown Drive in Corpus, and I'm here to talk about the flooding that is occurring behind my house. 
um, every time that it rains. I bought that house uh, 33 years ago, and uh, I never had to buy flood insurance. That was not a problem. Um, when the residential, re residential area started being built, uh, Barth Bresselton came by, and he said he would get a few of his guys to, um, to build some trenches in my backyard. So he knew exactly what was going to happen as a result of that, uh, that taking place. And um, I, I contacted Roland Barrera. I contacted the mayor regarding uh, the problem, and the problem has not been rectified. I went out and got, uh, I ordered some sandbags from Amazon. I bought some sand, picked them up by myself, had no help. Uh, and I bought these uh, bags called dam bags, which inflate with water. But as, as, as you know, as you'll see in the pictures, the, the flooding is really, really bad. My dogs have to go out and poop in, 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 the, in the rain, and I have to wear um, uh, rain boots to be able to get in there. Uh, recently, uh, like I said, I've lived in that area, in that house for 33 years, and recently I received a letter from the city encouraging me to bl buy flood insurance. I contacted my uh, insurance man, and it will be $498 a year for flood insurance, which is pretty high, I think. Um, I have just uh, uh, installed the brand new AC unit, and um, I'm having to protect that to keep it, um, you know, from, from getting in the rain. Uh, I put the dam bags all over to absorb the, the rain, and, and, and it's ridiculous. When I bought that house, I had planned to stay there and, uh, and fix it up. Um, LKM Homes, it's the land developer, and uh, they sent me a threatening letter that if I didn't move my property line, uh, that they were going to take some legal action against me. Yet, there is a natural flow rule that imposes liability on any landowner that changes his or her land in a way that changes the natural flow of surface water across the land. So how is that? She, she was threatening to take me to court for, for um, not moving my property fence line, and yet, uh, you know, she's doing... You know, she elevated the land about, I was told, 12 to 18 inches. So, of course, all the rain comes into my backyard, and I have to deal with it. I feel that she's cre also created a health hazard because my dogs have to poop in the water. And as a result, I think it's the man that issues, that works for the city, that issues the city permits and allows this to take place. That is at fault. Uh, I'm a master gardener, and I have nothing growing in my backyard, nothing. Ms. I Martinez, used to plant everything. We are going to address this with our staff. Right, yeah, Ms. Martinez, uh, Gabriel, the gentleman standing in the back with the checkered tie will help you out. Okay. Okay. Yes. He's an assistant director in our public works, the okay. storm, stormwater right. division. I appreciate it. Yes, ma'am. Thank you for being something. here. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Uh, my pictures are the... Oh, oh your pictures are... Yeah. Uh, okay, and then our last in person, Alicia Cowan. Oh, here she is. Hello, Council. My name is Alicia Cowan. I um, originally came here on behalf of the Ramfield development. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. And I did want to, uh, I emailed uh, our council member, Mr. Smith and Ms. Wajardo, and I do appreciate Mr. Smith uh, with your email reply in opposition for the rezoning, um, um, and I do hope that the rest of the council um, keeps his opposition in mind when y'all do go to a vote on that. And what else brings me here today is the um, the rezoning um, item number 23 at Graham and Humble Road for uh, approval for an RV um, mm -hmm. park. And I did look at your uh, information you had posted on your website about the proposal from the developer. And this 21 acres is the mouth of that proposed park is right in front of residential homes where this is already a low density residential area. I think there were 29 notices put out and that's how low of a density this spot is. And um, all that came back, I think there were six 
in in that area and three outside that were all opposed um, from the front, which lies on Humboldt Road and Graham, to the back, which is at the in, the back side of Knickerbocker Street. Um, so, also when you have the that intersection, it's there's not enough. Um, Paved road, I understand that that will all change if this is approved, but you have to take into consideration the people that have lived there. I'm fourth generation. My um, family has owned land in Flower Bluff for nearly 100 years, and we're not a against development, but we are proponents of a good balance of future development and ecological diversity. The proposed um, RV park is not that far from Laguna Shores Road, which is a protected estuary. It's one of the most unique ecological systems, probably globally. And we need to think about the impact that it has on our residents that live there and have lived there and don't want an RV park in their backyard or their front yard. Um, and so I appreciate y'all's time and listening, and have a great day. Great. And one final thing is that with all of these factors, I do believe in compromise. And as one of the public commenters spoke about negotiation, again, it's a vacant, it's vacant now, but if we can come to a compromise as a low-density residential neighborhood, I think that that would be mm -hmm. more acceptable for the residents there now and in future use. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Callen. Oh, right, 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 right. Uh, okay, so that is that is the end of our list for in-person comment. We do have some WebEx uh, public comment, but Mr. Zanoni, could you address, we had quite a number of people <clears throat> commenting on Commodores, um, and then I have a question on the signs. <laughs> Yes, thank you, Mayor. Uh, so we have been, uh, Commodore's uh, has been brought to my attention. I've been here about three years, and uh, up to this point, it hasn't been uh, brought to my attention. So it, it has now. Um, we put together a work team that met last week uh, for the first time that included about five departments, including our code compliance, uh, development services, police, fire, housing, legal, and the city manager's office. And um, today's agenda item to give us one more tool, as, um, as Mr. Anderson stated, which is to turn water off when a property gets to a substandard condition, mm -hmm. uh, will help us in trying to um, uh, fix these situations that exist in the city. Uh, I think Commodore's is not unique. There's probably a few other properties like that. Uh, so what we want the community to know is that we're focused on this, the work team is, uh, we really should have zero tolerance for these types of uh, situations. Uh, I've driven by it myself several times, and uh, it's, it's substandard. Um, also, as Mr. Anderson and as Miles would state, the law makes it tough for us to just come in and, and close the place down to right. condemn it or to uh, have people leave. But what we're doing is going out every day, the new work team, and citing uh, with violations. We have, let me see if I have it here. Uh, we have numerous violations, right, that have spanned over the mm -hmm. years. These are a couple pages um, of and, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to interrupt you. So yeah. are those paid or are those just, are they written and then the he goes? The violations? Uh-huh. Uh, what, what was the question? Well, that? like, are they paid? They're, they're violations that are issued to him, I, I'm, I'm oh, assuming, with a fine. That, right. Some of them have a fine. Some of them, uh, there's court hearings. Okay. Uh, he has numerous court dates that were postponed probably due to COVID. So mm -hmm. some of them you pay, others you have to go to court. Okay. But the, the issue is, is this page after page after page of violation. Mm -hmm. And um, so what we're doing is putting more pressure on the, on the owner. Uh, I've told my staff, uh, even on the weekends, you know, people that aren't following code don't rest on the weekend. They're continuing to break the code. So mm -hmm. we're going to start going out on the weekends to continue to cite. Uh, so we'll continue the site, continue to inspect. Al Raymond uh, has talked to the owner about the correct way to build a, uh, a staircase and, a, and a, a landing. You have to follow state law, which says that you need an engineer's um, opinion on the structural integrity of the patio and the stairway. 
it seems like the owner's not doing that. So we're going to continue to go out. Uh, I think today's action, if City Council approves that the new policy that will allow us to turn water off, if a certain number of cases exist, will help us uh, to, um, to have one more uh, tool that we can use, right? Right. Okay. So that's it. So we are working on it, and we're putting more and more pressure uh, on the owner, and we're more mindful of the situation. Okay, great. Okay. Uh, Mr. Smith, did you have a comment? Uh, not on that, but uh, you know, we, we talked a lot about item 24. It's been pulled, and I, I think there's some real items of interest in, in 24, particularly concerning the ACUs with it. Is it possible for us to discuss some of those since it was an agenda item? You know, this, this council uh, with the ACUs and the importance of ACUs um, on there. Yeah, so Councilman, the staff didn't pull it, but the applicant asked that it be withdrawn. But I think Al Raymond, he could probably talk about the ACU situation. The applicant says he doesn't want it processed. That's why we removed it from okay. the agenda. Right. Okay. It's not that we didn't want to discuss it. It's that the applicant yeah. said. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But we can. We can have Al Raymond. He has a presentation. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Thanks. Okay. So I wanted to just touch on that because I know that's a very, every, everyone who comes forth to advocate for or against anything is extremely important to us. Um, but this issue has... I mean, we've been together for years now on this, and it's progressively gotten a lot worse. So I say that in um, <clears throat> in the spirit of, yes, we've been working together, but you all are living your lives every day, and I understand that, and this situation has gotten worse, and um, I wasn't even aware that the tool that Peter Zanoni brings forth to say, hey, there is something we can do. We don't have the tool to do it with. That's what we're doing. And so thank you all for being you know, really good stewards of your of your neighborhood and where you should live because everything you said is absolutely right. And your children, that's the biggest thing there for me. Your grandchildren should be able to play in that front yard if, if they choose to. Um, so just know we, we are we are we are on this, we're watching it, we are doing. And so um, again, thank you for your advocacy. So the other question I had was on those signs, and, and Mr. Gordy, I understand he, he, he has a good point. Right. How do we address that um, in terms of signs, illegal signs being left and such? Right. So we do have, uh, and uh, development services here helps to regulate signs. Uh, in the case of a runoff election, though, the signs uh, stay uh, from oh, yeah. the runoff election. Right. Uh, so once that point, though, uh, Al, do you know the answer? Well, but well, and, and it's okay. I don't mean. They, I, I know yeah. there's a, there's a time frame, but do our code enforcement, I guess, code enforcement or whomever, yeah. walk, do they do they drive around and you know do they do kind of like a like a what is a roundup they do for um, <laughs> that was it called the uh, Let's see if uh, warrant, warrant, yeah. the warrant roundup <laughs> a sign uh, roundup every, every time one of mine is two inches out of place you they get a call, call me yeah. <laughs> I don't right. know. Who's we need not a sign. Called, but I was about to say I could answer this Tracy question D. for you. Yeah, do you know? <laughs> I'm sorry, Mayor. I don't know. Tra the answer, I think Tracy yeah. does. Tracy, okay. I'd like to start a program. Okay, yeah. A sign warrant roundup. So, uh, the code enforcement is acutely aware of, of the political season and, and the regulation for the signs to come down 10 days after afterwards. As Mr. Zanoni stated, if there's a runoff, the signs will remain. If they're on. Uh, private property. There is some, some uh, case law that, that permits the sign to remain on the property. Um, but if they're in the right-of-way, of course, that's illegal. And code enforcement will address the signs that are in the right-of-way. And so uh, we, we do weekly sweeps for okay. any illegal signs in the right-of-way. If we have missed some, yeah. we will make sure we go back to address okay. those. My attorney here just told me. <laughs> go ahead, you tell you say it. <laughs> yeah, no, my, my understanding with private property is that the owner of the private property has a First Amendment right to have whatever sign or, you know, that they want to have political signs. So they could have a sign there all the time if they wanted to. Yeah. Um, and I'm, I'm sure a lot of what Mr. Gordy is seeing is signs on private property that, you know, we have the First Amendment issue to deal with. Is that right. correct, correct, Mr. Risley? Yes. A private property owner may have a sign of up to 36 square feet 
may say anything he or she wants in a political context. Mm-hmm. And then and there's the HOA. keep it on as, up as long as he or she wants. Well, then there's the HOA. Anyway, okay, my point is, <laughs> how do we deal with that? So thank you, right. Tracy. Can I just ask, on the right-of-way, do, you, do we remove the signs or do you? Yes, if so they're in the right-of-way, we will remove them. The city staff removes that. them, right? Yes, sir. Okay, and disposes okay. of them? Yes, sir. Mm, okay. okay. Mr. Presley, do you have a question on this? I did have a question to staff uh, with respect to this apartment complex. Um, it's, it's my understanding um, that state law gives us and the county as far as that goes a great deal of power if we adjudge that something is a public safety issue. Right. We can the governmental entity can come in and condemn those properties and shut them down. Right. Have so we investigated that? Absolutely, Councilman. Yeah, so it's the violations, while they're numerous, uh, don't pose a, a public safety risk. With a the stairway except, that's not built correctly? Is well, it's not built. They took, they removed it, and they're in the process of building it, but it obviously well, people won't. People have to jump off the balcony now, yeah. Well, so, here, so they haven't built it, but we'll be citing them every day for either not having a permit or building it incorrectly. It, ultimately, it won't get built. Uh, however, uh, without that fire escape or that balcony, they are, uh, there is a fire risk. The fire marshal... That's public safety, guys. Right. Well, the fire marshal ordered that they have 24-hour uh, fire watch service. Uh, so that's something that's in place right. right now. Yeah. Okay. Right. Okay. Mm-hmm. You're good? Well, I think, I think we are doing, and I don't want to get the wrong message. We're doing everything that we possibly can, including today's ordinance. Without that ordinance, we do need to be tougher. Right. Now, Councilman Pusley, we, this community, this city, the organization, I should say, hasn't done what I've done before in San Antonio. That's where I was for 22 years, but we closed down apartment complexes. We moved people out. Mm -hmm. Uh, We turned off the water. And as, as can be done, we, we, um, we're teaching this organization how to do it. Uh, one tool we needed is that water turnoff yeah. that's on the agenda today. Uh, once we met last week uh, uh, on, I think it was Thursday, we put this, ag- this agenda on on Friday, and it's on the agenda mm-hmm. for consideration today. So we're, we're working quickly. Uh, the law, though, in Texas, it, there's a fine line where the property owner has certain rights and there's due process and they have time to fix things. Uh, but uh, but I'm, t- I'm telling you and I'm telling the owner, Mo, and the community that we're, uh, I'm involved now and we're going to work to get it resolved. Uh, we're going to yeah. keep the team in place. We're going to keep pressure on the, the owner. And it's not fair to the community that was here today, but more importantly, it's not fair to the, the, t- the renters that are there. Yeah. Uh, substandard housing is something we're not going to accept. So yeah, and, and Thank you, Ms. You know, there's a certain amount of sympathy that go to the people who live there you know, if we cut the water off and force them to move, they're not the culprits. Mm-hmm. Right. That, that's, right, and that's why, Councilman, part of the program includes a relocation effort. Right. Uh, so we've already contacted some of our partner agencies who will help them relocate, uh, and we can use some of our federal dollars to help with first-time uh, connections and down, uh, down payments at their new place. So there's, there's a level of compassion that we have as well for the tenant. Okay. Yep. Thank you, Mr. Zanoni. Uh, Mr. Molina, do you have a comment? Yes, it was uh, going back to the, the signs. Okay, um, yes. And I guess this would be a question for Tracy here. Um, you know, Mr. Gordy, um, and, and I'll have to confess, I was actually getting worried about him because it had been a while since he's, he'd shown up. So I'm, I'm glad he's okay. He's okay. <laughs> Live and well. Alive and kicking. Um, I, I'm sure he was talking about campaign signs and but but I, I know that he also uh, speaks about uh, other signs that are located in our right-of-ways um, do we, and there's a lot of them throughout the city I, I know I see him as I'm driving back and forth um, with the signs that are located in in our easements uh, and signs that are, are uh, I guess not permitted when they should be uh, what, what's the action there? Do, does, does code enforcement or uh, I guess it would be code enforcement, uh, a complaint would have to be made to them first, to that department, uh, and then once it's processed, then you have code enforcement visit the property and, and, uh, and what, what's the action there? 
Right, and, and you're talking about two different actions. If you're, you're speaking about an illegal sign in the right of way, then that sign is, is illegal, could not be permitted, uh, such as political signs or bandit signs, we see those. And those can be removed at any point in time from the city property, from the city right of way. When you're talking about signs that require a permit, then there is a process. There is that due process of notifying the owner, giving them the opportunity to uh, rectify the situation. And if not, then there is ramifications, such as a citation that can be issued for having a sign that's unpermitted. Does the code enforcement officer have the authority to, uh, I guess it's these bandit signs, the ones that are the small signs that are in the right of ways as, as you're driving along SPID and stuff like that. Do they have the authority to, to stop at the site uh, while they're driving uh, by w without a phone call being made or without a complaint being made to just stop in and, and pick up the sign? Yes, sir. Those are those are in in our right of way, and those uh, yes can be removed at that point in time. There are instances if we see that it's that it's located adjacent to the business that's maybe uh, maybe advertising, then we will stop and and educate that business um, about our ordinances and, and give them the opportunity to remove the sign. But however, if it's just random signs along the right of ways, uh, those can be removed because those cannot be permitted. Those are just simply illegal and not allowed. Yeah, I, I've seen those signs. Yeah. Um, uh, buy houses cash or, or you know stuff like that um, are, are your code enforcement officers actively picking up those signs those bandit they signs? are we, we organize sweeps now I, I will say that we do prioritize our calls and, and we obviously yes. prioritize health and safety issues above all else and so um, signs in the right of way are not, not at the top of the list of the priority just being honest with you but we do organize um, sweeps and, and we increase those sweeps during um, or after the political season when we know that there's an abundance of, of those types of signs that might be uh, out and about. But we do organize um, sign sweeps with the uh, code enforcement officers to address those bandit signs. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank yes. you, thank you. Did you have something, Mr. Russell? I'd like to say the code enforcement officers can remove those signs from the city right of way and anybody else can. It's just litter removal. Okay, we'll all be doing it. <laughs> Thank you. All right, so moving on, Ms. Uh, what the, do we still have people on WebEx public comment? Yes, ma'am, just a few people. James um, Carbilla. We have James Carbilla. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Would be the next person. Yes. Yes, sir. <laughs>
Mr. Carbola, your, your time is up. Thank you so much. Next we have um, Elisa Gonzalez. Ms. Gonzalez, Ms. Gonzalez, your time is up. Thank you so much, Ms. Gonzalez. Next, we have Seema Mathur Hopkins.
structurally and, um, and with sewage issues. And so we just respectfully ask that there is a plan to move them um, safely to a place that they can live with dignity and that that um, apartment complex be condemned. Um, we feel like it's the only solution to happen and that would not only help everyone involved for their safety, but I think also send a clear message that um, these type of buildings aren't tolerated. Thank you, ma'am. Next is Taylor Nichols. Mr. and Ms. Nichols is not available. Uh, Christopher Phelan. Yes, uh, Chris Phelan, 3806 Kingston Avenue. Um, there's several things I need to talk about today. Uh, one of them is item 14, uh, that's H&S, doing a contract at the Chill Canyon. Um, they're not a civil engineering firm. I know they've done a little bit of civil engineering, but in your packet, you're pointing to a, a port job that they did as being a Corpus Christi job. And if you even looked at that, they went, they had cost overrides, $110,000 on a $2 million project. You've got a good firm, Associated Construction Partners. They were a little higher, only $80,000. They, they adjusted their, their last uh, contract at, that y'all say was ours, but wasn't even ours, uh, more than that. Then we moved on to 18. Oh, one other thing about H&S, they killed one of their workers in 2011. So we should definitely not give them a contract. Um, uh, we moved on to number 18. Um, we need more protected bike lanes. Uh, looking at that plan on number 18, y'all are spending a lot of money, but we need uh, protected bike lanes. A lot of that looks insufficient. Um, we'd like to see more money uh, spent on that, on uh, transportation for pedestrians and bicycles. When we get to number 26 on the uh, adjustments for the park fees and we're going to change all that around, this is, there's been an insufficient public debate. Y'all are counting today as one of the uh, public opportunities or public hearings for this. We haven't got enough information. We oppose that now. It could be a good plan, but, but, but looking at it, you know, the amount of time we've had, and I know you're going to say it's been from March 6th, but who reads the call at times? Um, uh, we, we, we think we need more public input, so we want you all to uh, table that and give us more chances to talk about that. Moving on to number uh, 32, uh, the charter, uh, we need a charter amendment, we need to get rid of, rid of our at large uh, North Beach. It doesn't belong in District 1. You're trying to protect the port. We see what's going on out there. Um, number 33. Now, that, you know, we're, we're talking about zoning. We're talking about people feeling unsafe. Well, you know, I got some bad news for everybody. Uh, there's H2S gas coming out of plants. We've got monitors over there with high readings for H2S, high readings for uh, 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 sulfur dioxide. These are poisonous gases that, that hurt our families. And you're looking at industrial users agreement or industrial district agreements to protect them from our code. You want to make code and go in and shut down in, uh, uh, businesses and, and shut down and move people out. You need to make sure that those people are not going to end up homeless. Mr. Phelan? I want to make sure that that's going to happen. Mr. Phelan, uh, your time is up. Thank you. Okay, Mayor and Council, our last speaker is Sally Ferris. She is a San Antonio resident, so we um, we are allowing them to speak in. My apologies on Mr. Sedna. It was just an oversight. We So I know he was in Portland, but um, at this time, uh, Sally Ferris is a, a San Antonio resident, so we'll be giving her the one minute. Ms. Ferris? Thank you so much. My name is Sally Ferris. I'm 
already, Corpus Christian, but displaced and returned. I am not a special interest. My family made a living on North Beach and the waterfront beginning in the 1930s until about 2012, when I roamed North Beach as a child, and even later my family lamented the lack of development attention the beach received. That's still the case. Creative engineering solutions and sustainability investment anticipating sea level rise will not be enjoyed by the beach until it's appropriately paired with Sea District, Downtown Hospitality, and Ecotourism. Some of the beach might be reclaimed by Mother Nature for productive wetlands, but that will not be appreciated or taken advantage of so long as the beach is paired with agricultural and refinery activities. Please, choose Plan B or D1 to give North Beach proper representation in the future. The problems of potential for public good will not be resolved without undue burden to taxpayers until the beach is included in a D or D1 map configuration. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Barris. That concludes the public comment period. No, ma'am. Oh, it's not? Oh, yeah, there it is. Okay. Mr. Zanoni, you want to go into your um, manager's report? Yes, ma'am. Okay, you. great. Uh, we have three items today, Mayor and Council, on the city manager's report. And the first one is going to be to highlight our police uh, uh, graduating a class that graduated a couple of weeks ago. Oh, yeah. So that would be the 80th Police Academy graduation. And we know Chief Markle's here with us today. Uh, so that graduation was held uh, on March 11, two Fridays ago, at Del Mar College. Uh, the mayor was there and spoke, and many council members, including Pusley, Martinez, Lerma, and Barrera, were in attendance as well to show their support uh, for the cadets. So the 80th session graduated 40 cadets. That, that class started with 51. Oh, sorry, Councilman Hernandez was there as well. Um, <laughs> Yes, sir. Wow. I want to make sure you're listening. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, so the class uh, graduated 40 cadets that are 40. close to, after they do their ride along, being uh, independent officers. The class started at 51, uh, but through uh, the time, uh, some dropped out. Um, the, uh, the 40 cadets uh, were uh, of diverse nature, and, and they add to our already diverse workforce in the police department. So of the 40, 31 are in a protected class. Uh, that means they're either female or Hispanic. So 30, 30, 31 of the 40 were in that protected class. Uh, we know that family plays a big part in law enforcement, and especially in our police department. And eight of the cadets had relatives uh, that were or are in law enforcement and they help to uh, badge or pin uh, the graduating officers. Four of those family members are active members in our police department, and so they're either uh, their sister or, so, uh, or uh, son or daughter uh, were graduating. Um, <clears throat> just to give you some context, uh, graduation wasn't easy. It's, it's, it's a tough uh, set of months uh, to go through. The, the new police officers spent over 1,000 hours learning about local, state, and federal laws in a classroom setting. Uh, they took part in, in vigorous physical training and spent over 108 hours in firearms training. Uh, so some real good training uh, by our department. We know that here in Corpus Christi, our community really embraces and has trust and confidence uh, in our police officers, and we know that's not always the case across the country. Uh, we want to thank the mayor, uh, I do, and I know the chief has done it many times, the mayor and the city council uh, for making public safety priority number one, right? We have added uh, millions in equipment and in vehicles and in contracts uh, for the police officers. Uh, in our past three budgets, we added 20 additional police officer positions, uh, eliminating a decade of not adding any police officer positions. Uh, right now, we're in the final stages of design for a brand new police training academy, over $30 million facility that will replace the, really, I guess it was a, a gun shop, I guess is what it started out to be, uh, the inadequate uh, uh, training academy we have today. Um, we do have a video that we want to play uh, real quick just to show you in the community some of the highlights of the event and some of the activity that the class goes through, so we'll, we'll roll that real quick. So this academy, we graduated 40 cadets, largest academy ever. I'm putting your life on the line to protect 
protect the lives of others, you are embarking on an extraordinary path. I'm extremely proud. It's not an easy task. It's just competing against 1,200 other applicants to get into the academy. To graduate is, is no small feat. Trust us to always do what is right no matter what. Displays to the world that we can be trusted to make life and death situations without hesitation. Reign in lawful control at all times. And when the cuffs are on, exercise his dignity and respect. After graduation, they, they move into what's called the field training program. So for the next six months, they're going to ride with a lead officer every day, and they're going to be evaluated how they apply what they've learned in the academy to real time in the streets. And during that six months, they're going to have to transition into being a solo officer. They'll learn how to apply their knowledge. They'll become the lead officer in the car, making the decisions, knowing how to communicate with people, knowing how to enforce the law knowing how to be good stewards of uh, their profession. Right? That doesn't mean arresting everybody. That means interacting, being kind, understanding what their job is. You are now the merciful guardians of our community. I congratulate you today on your graduation. That's a great video, right? That's a yes. real good breath. I love it. <laughs> Yeah, good job, Chief, on that. We want to thank Senior Officer Travis Pace uh, for shooting much of the video, and then Cameron Gorman, our multimedia manager, for editing it together uh, today. There were several cadets at the graduation that received special achievement, and I just want to highlight them today in case they're listening or their families are. Uh, so Kimberly Silva was the cadet with the highest grade, grade point average. Uh, Andrea Sa uh, Salazar was the highest scoring physical fitness person. His body fat count was what, Mayor? I think like uh, less than 10%. Eight, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I remember. Thanks. Uh, we asked him, right? Built like a rock. Yes. <laughs> and then uh, Lissandro Luna. Lissandro Luna received the highest score during the firearms training. And Romero Tamez had the highest score for driving training. And then each year they award the Thebo Award, and that went to Joe Vera, and that's for overall excellence in every aspect of training. So some distinguished and diverse. Uh, uh, recruits or cadets graduating were acknowledged. We want to thank Chief Markle and, and your team, Chief, uh, for the fine work. We know that uh, you all uh, manage 100% uh, the training of our new cadets. You can see how young they are in that video when we see them yeah. on stage. But uh, we feel and we know that they're well-trained uh, by the time they leave and uh, they keep us protected, uh, the new folks coming in. So with that graduating class of 40, I think we just have about five vacancies, a small number of vacancies left, which is commendable as well. A lot of departments across the country struggle with keeping every position filled. So mm -hmm. I think we're in real good shape and the next class is, is getting ready to be selected and we'll start in July uh, mm -hmm. soon. So real good accomplishments. We'll give you that link to that video. That's something that was specially yeah. done for this council. It'd be Thank good you. to share. And I might add, quickly i was in washington for four days last week at national league of cities conference and i attended um a public safety uh committee right uh, it was it's a meeting of there were probably 30 20 at least 20 20 mayors and it felt so nice and it was really unbelievable to sit and hear a lot of the issues that they all have we've already proactively um, moved on, if you will. Right. I mean, we are really sitting in a really good place in terms of our police department, and that's leadership. And it's these these guys, you know, these and girls who just um, who just graduated, and of course, all those on the streets. But anyway, I was very, very proud to to, to uh, represent Corpus Christi and be able to say all the things that we're already doing that they're not. A lot of them, not all of them, a lot of them. And so that was just amazing to, to you know, to have that feeling and, and to be there um, representing us and your team. So thank you. Great. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, sticking with um, our, our law and legal system, I want to give the council an update on the municipal court uh, presiding judge. Uh, we know that on Thursday, March 10, uh, presiding judge Gail Loeb announced that she would retire uh, from the city. Uh, the city, uh, through um, its uh, municipal courts committee, has developed an aggressive timeline to fill her vacancy uh, so that her successor can be hired uh, before Judge Loeb leaves and have a little bit of uh, cross-training for about a week, and so that's the goal. Uh, the city posted the municipal court presiding judge position on March 10, 
and um, the the post uh, was the posting included on our website at the Texas Municipal League, uh, the Corpus Christi Bar Association, the Texas Bar Association, Strategic Government Resources, and Indeed.com. So the posting has been there. Uh, we received a couple of internal applicants and one external as of yesterday, uh, and we'll have it. We'll have the posting uh, up for a little bit more. Uh, there's uh, two special municipal court committee meetings, and I just want to remind the community uh, and the council knows, but the municipal court committee is chaired by Councilman Martinez, and the members on the committee include Councilman Barrera, Hunter, and Molina. And so this committee is the one that said, we want to fill this position pretty quickly, and th all the timeline I'm talking to you about was uh, from their direction. So uh, to help get to that point, there's a committee meeting this Thursday, a special committee meeting of the municipal court committee, uh, they will review the applications and select uh, those candidates they want to interview. They'll also finalize the interview questions, so that'll be the work this Thursday. And then a second committee meeting will be held this coming Monday, the 28th. And in that meeting, they will actually conduct the interviews uh, to select the next presiding judge uh, for consideration by the City Council. The, the full City Council uh, needs to consider that uh, selection. Uh, following the selection next week, early next week, uh, Human Resources will conduct background screenings and reference checks. That'll be during the week of March 28. And then on Friday, April 1st, uh, through the Secretary, we're requesting a special City Council meeting uh, to appoint the new Municipal Court Judge on uh, that Friday. So the schedule will allow uh, Presiding Judge Loeb to uh, kind of sh uh, share some of the uh, inside operating procedures with that new person uh, and have about uh, f four or five days on the job uh, with her. And then finally, one other thing real quick, Mayor, is the uh, vessel turn-in program. Uh, we know that we're a boating community and um, the city has a program to uh, get uh, rid of boats that no longer float or just be on their useful life. Uh, we're partnering with, uh, with the Texas General Land Office and the, parks and the Texas Parks and Wildlife System uh, to uh, have this program. It's called Vessel Turn-In Program, or VTIP. Uh, it's a voluntary free way to dispose of boats. Um, the, initial, uh, the, the initiative aims to minimize those number of watercrafts that are uh, either abandoned on the waterways or sometimes you'll see them in ditches or on the roadside, especially in the uh, Island Flower Bluff area. Uh, it also helps to uh, maintain our groundwater, so uh, leaking uh, gasoline and battery acid and, and other uh, contaminants are, are minimized. Uh, the VTIP program was suspended during the COVID pandemic, but we're bringing it back, and that's why I'm speaking to you today about it. Uh, vessels can be disposed of at our transfer station, known as the J.C. Elliott Transfer Station, at no cost to the, the person dropping it off. Uh, commercial haulers, though, will pay $49. So for a residential person, uh, no charge. You can bring your boat in for disposal, free of charge. If somebody's uh, in a commercial setting, they would pay a minimal fee of $49. Uh, those boats that we do accept are 26 feet in length or, or less uh, in this program. Larger boats are accepted on a case-by-case -case basis, and so David Layfeld will work with those persons. And so there's a special uh, recognition of bringing this program back that'll take place for three days, starting Thursday through this Saturday at the uh, J.C. Elliott, Elliott Transfer Station. The hours are eight to five. And then one final video, I know we wanna move on to the council meeting, but we wanna show you this video real quick that just talks a little bit more about the B-tip. And then finally, after the video, I'll turn it back over to you, Mayor, but people can go to our website at cctexas.com forward slash B-tip or call our solid waste department if there's more uh, questions that they have. So we're gonna show this video real quick and that'll conclude it. Great. Mm -hmm. Need to get rid of an unused or broken down boat? The Vessel Turn-In program is a free, safe, and legal way to get it done. Residents can dispose of all inoperable and unwanted watercraft, including boats, jet skis, and boat trailers, all for free. The year-round program is available Monday through Saturday from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m at the J.C. Elliott Transfer Station at Highway 286 and Air Street. Make sure to bring your boat's title as proof of ownership and remember to drain all gas and oil before dropping it off. Pre-register to drop off your boat by going to cctexas.com slash vtipcc or contact the City Solid Waste Department at 361-826-1966. Okay, great. Thank you, man. We want to thank the uh, Texas Parks and Wildlife and also the uh, GLO for their partnership. 
uh, we know that Corpus Christi uh, needs our partners and in a program like this, it's appreciated. That concludes my comments for this, this afternoon, Mayor. Great, thank you, uh, Mr. Zanoni. Um, before we break to lunch, we're gonna go through the consent agenda and uh, we'll pull whatever uh, council members would like to um, have questions on and then um, address those when we get back. So do we have any, uh, any items that anyone would like to pull between items numbers tw two through 20? Uh, Madam Mayor, I, I need to recuse myself on 14. On 14, okay. Well, Mayor, I was going to ask to pull it anyway, so. Okay, great. Anyone else? Uh, Mr. Hunter? No? Anyone else? Okay. Um, then I will entertain a motion to approve consent agenda with the exception of item number, item number 14. So moved. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say no. The motion carries. Oh, and 19, Mayor, was pulled. Um, I'm sorry? 19 was pulled by the city manager, just for the record. Oh, so for the record. There was no vote on 19. That, right. That's excluded. I'm sorry. Right, right, right. right. That's correct. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. Okay, so with that, we are going to break for 30 minutes. Uh, the council will go into executive session. Mayor, you I just want to vote on 14 really quickly? It's just to abstain on 14? Oh, because. Yeah, no discussion. We're just going to abstain. Sure. Oh, I'm sorry. You did have I a pulled question. It. I'm, I apologize. Oh, you have discussion. Right, so we'll wait on that. Um, but we're going to go into executive session for item number 37 per Texas Government Code Section 551.071. And we'll be back in 30 minutes.
Good enough. Okay, we'll reconvene our meeting now with no action coming back from executive session. So, uh, Rebecca, let's see here. We have uh, item 14 on consent. Oh, we pulled item 14. Yes, okay, so item number 14 is a motion awarding a construction contract to H&S Constructors, Inc., Corpus Christi, Texas, to perform repairs and improvements to the Choke Canyon Dam in the amount of 5.5 million dollars. Um, yeah, okay. <laughs> Go ahead. No, well, you know what, um, Mr. Okay. Hernandez, yeah. You okay, thank, a thank you, Mayor. Yes, uh, specifically on this one, we're considerably over the, uh, the budget that was in, uh, in the CIP, if you don't take into consideration the uh, design phase, which is not part of this, but uh, it's, it's 800,000 over what you have for um, construction. And with all the, you know, all the, um, inspection and all the other fees associated with it, you're still 800,000 over. So where is this funding coming from? The additional funding. Services. I'm gonna let. Sure, Gabriel Gabriel is uh, interim okay. director of water utilities. So yes, so this is gonna have to come from uh, other savings and other projects uh, in the water CIP. Uh, the cost of everything's gone up a lot, so we're going to have to prioritize what gets done um, and looking at that. Okay, so w with re respect to that, that might be something that we could have uh, information on within the uh, agenda memos as to where this funding is coming from mm -hmm. uh, so we understand what is not going to be done in the, or you know, what you're prioritizing sure. or where you're getting savings from other places. Uh, you know, this is something we went through with the general obligation bonds. We had balances out there that, you know, now we're putting them into the streets. So I just want to be clear so we understand where this funding is coming. $883,000 is a lot of money to be, to just kind of make up from for us. So can you tell me exact, kind of exactly where this is coming? I mean, how you're going to, how you're going to do this? Right. Um, I'll have to look that and get back with you on that to find the exact answer. Okay, if you wouldn't mind putting in an email and making sure everybody's copied on it. Okay. For just, you know, our responsibility is budget, so. Yes, sir. It's, it's important that we understand it. Okay. Well, and I, I would like to say one more thing, and I think Gabe would agree with me that this is a must-do project. This is a, yeah. it has significant No, I, I'm not, not, not suggesting that it's not. Uh, find it. But since this is, uh, you know, there's, as I recall, we asked, isn't there funding available for this um, be it a Bureau of Reclamation, since this is uh, Choke Canyon? I, I mean, sure, that, that's another good point, is that the Bureau of Reclamation will fund a third of it, but we get reimbursed that after the fact. Uh, and it's not for everything in the project. Like, they're not going to reimburse us for the maintenance building, uh, but the main parts of the project will get reimbursed a third of the project. Okay, so that, that would will, be also some good information to have, good. right, as to, you know, where are some other sources? I don't know, you might make up the 800000 with that, but... Yeah, but it's I, not it's not part of what your your funding source currently, right? No, it's not because we get reimbursed after the fact from the bureau. I mean, because it's not that, and the reason I say that is because it says strictly uh, it's all from revenue bonds in the CIP. Yeah, right. so it, it, but, any of that would reduce that amount, of course. Okay, so uh, I think we need some more information with regards to how this is being paid for uh, now. If you can get back to us on, on, on sure. how that all yeah. works. Yeah, Councilman, we'll get you that in a, in a follow-up email. Uh, next week, there's a few more of these. We'll make sure those memos okay. have that detail. Where, where's the money coming from? We okay. hear you. Thank you. All right. Okay. Thank you. Great. Thank you. I'll entertain a motion to um, approve. 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 Second. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Um, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say no. The motion carries. And for the record, Mr. Uh, Mr. Smith, Smith. Abstained. Abstained. Correct. Okay, so we are going to pull, I'm going to pull item number 34 to go over next. Uh, Mr. Zanoni, if that's okay with you. Item number 34 is um, an ordinance authorizing a temporary pilot program for Lucy's Snack Bar adjacent to 312 North Chaparral. Um, okay, great. Hi, Sarah. Yeah. Good afternoon, Mayor, Council, Sarah Munoz, Deputy Director of Public Works. So a parklet um, increased in popularity, popularity during the COVID-19 pandemic to provide flexible options for businesses. Parklets are fixed and occupy public parking spaces. 
They are created by building a platform that houses benches, planters, tables, or chairs. Um, these structures must not obstruct drainage and must meet ADA requirements. So a few general guidelines for parklets based on some research and best practices that we've conducted. Parklets should only be housed on streets with speed limits of no more than 30 miles per hour and that have on street parking. The applicant is required to hold insurance, limited liability insurance. And again, like I mentioned, they must be ADA compliant. They must not interfere with the visibility of drivers and that's important for people rounding corners and things like that. Are you, oh, there you go. Oh, thank you. <laughs> oh, nope. I'll leave it right there. Thank you. Um, one of the most important aspects uh, that you'll see on the next slide of a parklet is including safety buffers and traffic control devices to protect those sitting in the parklet. Uh, we also require acknowledgement from adjacent property owners that the parklet's going to be in and around. Um, they could be fronting their storefront. Uh, they must hold a license and they must maintain the parklet themselves, whether it's through power washing, pest abatement, and trash removal. On this slide, you'll see um, a diagram that has been the culmination of the research we've conducted for parklets. Um, other cities such as Austin and Fort Worth offer permanent programs for parklets. Other cities like Texas or Dallas, Houston, El Paso, they offer temporary parklet programs. Um, on this particular slide, this is the ideal layout of a parklet. It includes a sidewalk with the parklet housed in the parking lane and a minimum two foot buffer between the travel lane and the back of the parklet. This, this slide shows the proposal for Lucy's snack bar. Um, as you can see, the parklet will front the majority of their storefront. Um, based on some of the initial discussions we've had with uh, the applicant, their parklet is 25 feet in length, which exceeds the 22 foot length for one parking stall. That green area you see there is about, it's kind of hard to see on the screen, but it's about 35 feet, and that's really the area of impact that they can have because it exceeds the length of the one parking stall. Um, and then, like I mentioned, the traffic control devices, devices, it's a little hard to see, but on the white edge line, you'll see traffic control devices, and this could be anything from a bollard to what we call a candlestick, something that um, draws attention to the back of the parklet to the people driving and the traveling. So how did we come up with the fees that you're going to hear uh, about today? So currently, many of you know, an ordinance does not exist for parklet fees. So uh, our team, we worked with um, the current section 53-195, which uh, details fees for using parking spaces. So we averaged all of those out and we came up with an $800 annual license fee per parking stall. Uh, we also include an application fee, uh, resubmission fee, and inspections. So what are our next steps after this pilot program? Uh, Public Works plans to bring the official ordinance that we've been working on to City Council for review April 12th, and that'll include the final parklet policy and a copy of the final application. I stand by for any questions. Okay. Uh, Councilman Bonnet. Um. Thank you, Sarah. I mean, first off, uh, I, um, one of my biggest questions is that uh, why do we wait so long? But, you know, I just I, I know that the, the Rebel Toad has an interesting setup. Uh, when, when did we start doing that? Or uh, I mean, I, it, I, I, I assume they coordinated with us or are we do we know what they're doing or? Right. So it's my understanding that the Rebel Toad is op operating more under a it was like a hybrid sidewalk permit slash uh, use privilege agreement for that particular site. So we already had a sidewalk cafe ordinance, which is why you see some businesses downtown that have chairs and things on the sidewalk. Uh, this really came about, um, like I mentioned, a lot of cities started looking at this when the pandemic hit to offer an extension of that sidewalk specifically in city right away. Okay, okay but what, I guess um, my question though is what's the arrangement with the Rebel Toad? Because they have, they have barriers there, right. and they, they have picnic tables out there, or something right. out there. So what's right. the arrangement? I, I'm, just, I'm just curious. I, I'm not trying to say why them and not this one. I, I, so, 
Again, it's my understanding that uh, I wasn't a part of it at that time, but it's my understanding that they did begin as a sidewalk permit under a use privilege agreement, and it was reviewed. And the suggestions with the traffic, the water filled barricades that you see there was all in an effort to protect that site. They right. are permitted, I will tell you that. Yeah, Councilman, she, uh, Sarah, <clears throat> Sarah's right. So it was a sidewalk permit, uh, extension of the sidewalk permit, um, but it's temporary, where this one was more permanent in nature. Yeah. And so this one, uh, we wanted to have a the parklet ordinance to be able to and, approve and, and this. That's one. good. That's great because right. I, I don't think it looks all that with the water filled barriers. Right. It's, it's yeah. not. It's not. Yeah, very it's very nice. temporary. It's uh, very removable as well. If we had to move it, you could easily move it. So this one at the uh, Chaparral is a lot more permanent, uh, but the pilot program is in place and, uh, for that purpose. And you know, I, 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 it may be new to us, uh, but you know, I mean, you see them and. You know, in Austin, San Antonio, right? You see them, and you they know. may have had. Oops, sorry to interrupt, but they, they may have had enabling legislation already. A lot of them had ordinances on the books to, yeah, yeah. Uh, to accommodate I, I, them. I, I we, would agree, but it, we it's didn't. not. It may be exclusive to us because, a, a, as a result of you know trying to find uh, exterior, alter, outdoor alternatives. But you know, the same thing. Like I said, uh, South Beach. I mean, I was there 20 years ago. There's an area that it's all, mm -hmm. you know, right. uh, walkable. Uh, Denver. Uh, so there's there it's it's not Seattle. I mean, I could right. go on. So um, I, I just want to uh, Obviously, I know this is a pilot program. We're gonna uh, just uh, obviously see what our mistakes are and use it as a program I'm, I'm kind of curious though. How did we come to the fees? Did we would do we check with other communities or? Yes, if someone if you can please bring back the presentation so our team and we're still in the the finishing up the research for our, our process. That's why on April 12th, we'll bring you the finalized, uh, because we still do need to see each structure is different. Each location is different, depending on how the applicant chooses to build. So in some cases, there may have to be a building permit. So that's not factored in here. A lot of, uh, there's a lot of site specific things that have to be looked at. For this particular location, um, let me get to that slide. As I mentioned, we do not have an ordinance that establishes these fees, but we do have an ordinance that establish, establishes how much you have to pay if you're going to take up a parking space. And that's what we use, and that's what's on the screen. Um, so you'll see a metered parking space, unmetered, uh, minimum charge. If it's less than um, the average parking stall, which is 8 by 22, you have to do a minimum charge of uh, in a metered parking space, it's $821 for the year. So what we did was we added them all up, we averaged them, it came out to 778. So that's how we came with $800 a space. Okay, well, in this particular instance, it's an unmetered parking space. I mean, the Correct. parking's free. I, I'm not opposed to having some kind of fee. I just, I just it, it, in, a, in, a, in a situation now where there's no charge for the parking, um, I, uh, and, and granted, I spent a lot of time in that area. And uh, um, so as, as many of you know, so mm -hmm. I, I just I'm just having a little heartburn charging eight hundred dollars for a free parking space. I know uh, it, we're it's obviously public space and they're going to utilize it. I just don't want to you know I, I've, I've been frustrated here the last six months, not exclusive to this, uh, where I've been saying we've been turning easy arithmetic into a calculus problem, and that's what I'm concerned that we're doing here. You know, um, first off, I want to commend um, the owner of Lucy's. I'm, I'm I was just I'm. I'm I think it's a miracle that they're still open, that they lasted through COVID, you know. Uh, and I think uh, I, I was talking to them last week, and I know they're up to 15 employees, which is probably about 400,000 in payroll. So we have a small business owner that has a great success story, and we just need to make sure that we don't put any on. I I I I shouldn't say we. I I'm not in favor of putting any onerous bureaucracy on an individual that number one is paying current taxes has got a spot that used to be blight that's got blight all around it when there's other businesses that have failed and then now is providing payroll in the in the in the in the sense of almost a half a million dollars and this is obviously going to allow them to expand so we want to embrace that and we want to be i i would think that we want to have a reputation that we're easy to work with so uh, if you could 
I, I don't know what the plan is, but I, I just don't. I, I think once again, it's a free parking space, eight hundred dollars. Yeah, and Councilman, so we're going to look at sixteen hundred dollars that we're going to charge. Well, him. Uh, Councilman Lerma is going to make a, a. I think has some comments on a, an adjusted rate, but we did check some of our peer cities in Texas, and they're charging well beyond that. It's mm -hmm. in the two to three to four thousand dollars. So yeah. ours is way below. I I, um, I, I get you. I get you. Right. Man. We also have an incentive that I I don't think Lucy's has ever used an incentive from the DMD. Um, what is it? Uh, they can apply. They should. I'm, I'm sure they could. Yeah. But yeah. what I'm saying now is that this is this is once again an area that we have an incentive, so that right. way we could we could because they've already. Uh, uh, I, I think we just need to look at it from a more pragmatic standpoint. Right. Simply because there's an area that has blight. You know, there. Yeah, if we you, agree. If you go across the street, and I, I I'm just I'm just yeah. offering it. I, uh, Councilman, I want to add that just, uh, I don't know if Sarah mentioned it, but the city uh, gave $100,000 to mm -hmm. the DMD for parklets out of that ARPA money, the American Recovery Rescue Act money. And so the applicant will be eligible for $20,000 to mm -hmm. pay for his parklet. So we're basically paying his parklet and, and uh, we're going to have a reduced fee, as Councilman Lerma will talk about. Well, I remember, I remember supporting that. I right. remember it was unanimous that we supported that. Right. So uh, thank you for reminding me. Yeah, but this uh, applicant is, uh, will get 20000 to pay for his parklet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, but that wasn't included on the slide. I know. That's why I wanted to bring it up. Sarah didn't have it on there. My apologies. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Sarah, okay. Yeah. That's I'm an finding, important I'm finally part. finding yeah. a kink in Sarah's armor. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's anyway, hard to do. Anyway, so <laughs> I, I think that's the thing. There needs to be, we need an incent, and when I see this, you know, um, I, I just see, a, a, as a small business owner myself, as somebody that, that, that basically has that, that challenge of trying to keep the doors open, mm -hmm. and particularly this one in the retail business or the restaurant business and, and during that time, and then all of a sudden now, we have an opportunity where we're capitalizing on his good business plan and we're gonna charge him additional fees. So uh, that just, just uh, obviously that's, that's some, I've made my point, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Councilman. So, um, I, and I guess, in, and, and I'm going to take a little bit of, um, of, of um, it's not fault, um, but, but this all, this whole, th this um, situation we have here is, is something that was very much expedited. So, I, I'm, I know you've worked extremely hard to get what's before us today, because we've been working with the business owner, and, and he is very appreciative. I'm going to add to um, this that the, the rates that we're going off of are very old, and we won't. They're they're what's been on the books. If we updated those, which we've done with many things, we're looking at a much higher rate now. But but the other thing, most importantly, is we want to put something in place that has best practices in it, and there are fees. I think Alyssa agrees with that. There are fees to, you, I don't think you can go anywhere and, and, and set up a parklet for free, correct? We haven't found that, ma'am. No. Okay, and so I understand, you know, there has to be a calculation. Ours is under what would be if we really, uh, if we updated those, those fees. Um, the reason I'm okay with it, and I, and I, I, I support that, is because we have those incentives and i agree that wasn't in there and that that's a big part of it we're going and, and he's interested 15 to twenty thousand dollars is what he's interested in and yeah. he should he was the first one the reason this is here today before what april 12th the actual policy is coming is because he was in line a long time ago and i spoke with him back then um and and you know long story short we need to help our small business owners but but the fee is is anywhere anywhere and and ours is actually um a little lower now we can always do we can cap the fee we can say uh let's do it incrementally um 400 the first year or, or however you guys can figure that out but i think that would be something to do is cap the fee at a 400 in this case 400 um but i think we need to remember that this is going I don't know how big it is. I don't know how big it's going to be or how big it can be. Um, you know, I wish we had, right? Why didn't we think about, we're on the water, we're downtown. Why haven't we had parklets a long time ago? But it doesn't matter. It is what it is, and, and we're doing it now. And so how many come after this? I don't know. I, I have no idea because it isn't. I, I thought you'd think 
Well, this is simple. You just throw out some tables. No, there's a pretty substantial cost to a parklet. Um, but they're super cute, and I think that um, I, I commend Justin and I commend his investment in the community, uh, multiple places. Um, but I think that that we're going to be considering, you know, and, and I know this is your district councilman, so you can speak on that. But um, capping, capping it is capping the fee would be something that that I would support and making it a phased in approach, maybe. Um, but but I absolutely do believe that we have to and we have to, um, I guess, you know, um, this has to be something that we look at obviously now for the future. Um, many other cities have already, they've reached their future with parklets. So we get to look at that and say, okay, what worked, what didn't. Um, but anyway, Sarah, I, I just have wanted to thank you for this. This was extremely rushed and, and, and I appreciate your teams working on it. Uh, Councilman Pusley. Well, thank you, Mayor. Uh, uh, no, I think these are a great idea. Like, like uh, uh, Councilman said, I, I've been to many cities where these are uh, in place and, and utilized and very popular. Um, so uh, the applicant, if they are approved for this parklet, they will be responsible for paying for and providing all of the protection equipment that you talked about or equipment hard, uh, hardware, protection hardware. Yes, sir. Okay. They, so that's, well, they will, Councilman, but we're going to reimburse them twenty thousand dollars. Okay. Out of our money. Out of the hundred thousand. Right. So. Okay. I, when you say twenty thousand, that's not to to one customer. That's the one yeah. customer. It is. That's the yeah. one customer. Okay. Twenty thousand dollars. So here's here's my concern a little, little bit. Yeah. These are going to be very popular. So I can see there are going to be other applicants for these if Lucy's pulls this off and it turns out to be as attractive so for, for me there's two issues is if we reimburse the first one and the second one comes along and the third one comes along and the fourth one comes along we're going to run out a hundred thousand dollars pretty quickly and so that's number one the second thing is uh, as a guy who has set as a member of the downtown tour since its inception the the TERS in the downtown management district and and i know Alyssa's probably listening uh paid for a very high dollar uh parking study which basically said one of the issues that downtown has is lack of parking and now we're going to start i mean this is one parking or two parking two. places mm -hmm. but what if we have 10 businesses that want these at two parking places per business so now we've lost a significant number of parking places in an area where we have a real shortage. So I'm trying, I'm the little voice in the back of everybody's head <laughs> reminding you that, uh, you know, no good deed goes unpunished. So uh, we need to be careful uh, in deciding how we do this. Agreed, Councilman. And a part of the policy you're going to see come in in a couple weeks is going to include um, information on possibly limiting the amount of parklets on one street just to accommodate uh, traffic and parking. Um, a part of this package that I didn't mention was the applicant was able to receive a letter of acknowledgement from adjacent business owners because they will be occupying parking spaces that they can use. So. Um, the owner of the businesses did acknowledge the fact that both parking spots were going to be used, so that uh, that's included as well. Parking place or the, the parklet, is this just going to be certain hours of the day? Uh, or so when they're not operating? No, it's a pretty permanent structure, Councilman. So once it's there, it's there so until. It's there forever. Well, until you disassemble it. Yeah. Yeah, the it, operating hours I think are conducted by the business, but the structure itself. Yeah, is, the structure is there. will be. It's. Right. It has to be elevated for drainage. Uh, so there's a lot. There's a lot of mechanical installation that so, takes place. So, like I said, essentially yeah. you're eliminating two parking. Right. That's right. Correct. Until it goes away. Yep. Okay, and and I'd like to, uh, Alyssa, Alyssa's here, but Alyssa, if you could come up, because I know we've had a conversation in regards to what your outlook is on how many other ones, how many others would come. I know you, you can't tell them, yes, you can't, you know, give us any guarantee of anything, but what does that look like now, future parklets? 
Good afternoon, Council. Um, as the City Manager said, uh, this whole, the parklet idea really started with uh, your support from ARPA funds for parklets to the amount of $100,000. So we had already established communication with the downtown businesses whenever the city provided its first tranche of support out of the first COVID relief funds. We did a lot of sidewalk cafes there. We found some spaces weren't able to fit those sidewalk cafes, and that's when the parklet discussion began. We have three additional parklets that have kind of been identified as uh, priorities, um, but we had, our thought was to try to do one first so we could really troubleshoot all of the hiccups um, associated with doing that. So we have three that are queued up. Uh, the $20,000 allocation has been in consideration for the additional ones that we're also looking to fund. Um, and again, we've been in communication with the downtown businesses for about two years now uh, in order to develop this list. So everyone who was interested in doing this and paying it out of pocket has been accommodated with that grant amount. Okay. You never know, but that's a very good point because, yeah, once they're up and going, everybody's well. Yeah, yeah, okay. I'm sorry, I didn't see you said Oh, I thought you did. I'm always here, sir. Always here. Thank you, Alyssa. Uh, Councilman Lerma. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, this project or May I say the difficulty of this project uh, came to my attention about two weeks ago when Alyssa and I spoke, and then I, I actually went and spoke to Justin one-on-one, uh, -on -one, and then he informed me of the difficulty that he's been waiting over three months for an ordinance or for his uh, parklet to be able to be placed, and, and, and I couldn't figure out what was taking us so long. I mean, we're a professional organization that have engineers and architects and and traffic engineers we have all these people in place and we can't come up with a little simple ordinance but i want to i want to say thank you to peter i want to say thank you to maria and and uh, also uh to you that uh, you guys were able to expedite this project uh on the importance of it the outlook of our downtown or, or the goal of downtown since I've been on the council has been to <clears throat> generate foot traffic foot traffic that's all I keep hearing that we don't have enough foot traffic down there we don't have enough shops we don't have enough restaurants we don't have enough boutiques we don't have all kinds of different things the, the parklets <clears throat> yeah they've been around for quite a while from what I understand except in Corpus Christi you know and we're a coastal community very important People come to the coast to be outdoors, not stuck indoors. Probably the only two months of the year they're going to be indoors is uh, July and August because they can't stand the heat unless you put an, an AC unit that blows some nice cool air out there, Justin. You know, but, you know, I, I'm, I'm real excited about this project. I know it's a pilot project. It, it, and, you know, my biggest concern, and I, and I told Peter and, and Maria, they all know that when we looked at the fees, we seem to be tossing money and money to make it more difficult for small business owners to survive here in Corpus Christi, okay? Uh, it, it, I have a big issue with that, you know? We need to be able to accommodate our small businesses, and, and I, I get it. When Peter and I talked, uh, he said that we can't give a right-of-way free so, so, to a private company to make money off of it, and I agree with him. I don't believe in giving anything free. We have to make some money somewhere. You know, but the fees that were calculated is, is like Councilman Barreta said, this is a uh, no meter fees uh, area that, that they're parking and they get to park there free anyway. You know, but I don't want to be uh, difficult. All, all I want is the small businesses to, to thrive downtown. I want to see more of these parklets. And I am concerned, just like Councilman Pusley said, we keep griping about parking in downtown. Um, I, I get it, you know, now we're going to use an area that that uh, is very popular. <laughs> They're always parking there due to being free. But, you know, I'm supporting this project 100 percent, you know, and, and but I, I want to make an amendment to the fees. I want a, a fee to be two hundred dollars a space for each for a total of four hundred dollars. And, and, you know, Mayor, you brought up a good point. I'd like to see that maybe elevate because this is a pilot program. This is our first one. I want to make sure that this succeeds. 
and we're going to do everything we can in our power, Justin, to make sure that you succeed on this. But we don't want to price you out of a business either, though. Okay, uh, I, I'm I'm not against us maybe the following year going up to to a $400 slot each. You know, but we need to take a look at it. Like I said, it's a pilot program. I'd like to just take a look at it, but I'd like to to amend that the startup fee for this first project is two hundred dollars per space, which is a total of four hundred dollars for the for the year. Councilman, and that would be uh, that would be inclusive of the application and inspection yeah. fee as well, right? Yes, sir. You and I had that conversation yes, sir. earlier. Yes, you and I had that so, conversation. So uh, right now the fee would be eighteen twenty-five, one thousand eight twenty-five, but instead it'd be four hundred, based on the council re councilman's recommendation, which is a seventy-eight percent discount, which is fine. Well, as, uh, but that would be all. That would be all inclusive. Yes, the sir. application and yes, inspection sir. fee for four hundred yes, versus eighteen twenty-five. Okay, Councilman Hernandez. Thank you, Mayor. Um, just, you know, it would be nice to have the presentation in the packet. Uh, <laughs> I know I complain about that a lot. It would to review and get the kind of the information ahead of time. Um, but within that, uh, I don't necessarily have an issue with how this is all kind of transpiring, but there are some questions going forward. Um, you know, we've it's been a lot of effort to try to do street cleaning. I'm assuming they're going to be cleaning around the this parklet, and not and that'll be on their responsibilities. That's stated within the agreement. Yes, it is. Um, as I mentioned in some of the first slides, uh, it's going to be on a platform that allows drainage and the applicants responsible for maintaining uh, any debris that comes in and underneath okay. that and parklet. So that our street cleaners will just go around. It. Yes, sir. So, okay. The um, uh, other side of it. Uh, you know, obviously streets have to have maintenance and that includes a parking spot. So if it's on the time that, that we do a mill and overlay, what, what's the situation? So with mill and overlays, we definitely have a schedule. Um, these parklets, while they are large in structure, they are able to be moved and, and talking with the applicant, uh, if we give them enough notice, I'm sure it's something that we can work with them to have it moved temporarily and perform the roadway maintenance needed and then they can move it back. Okay. And then there's a cost associated with that, I'm, I'm assuming, with in terms of moving uh, the, the parklet. That's correct. Um, but again, we're doing a better job of planning out our roadway maintenance, so we can definitely give the applicant at least a one year in advance notice, um, I believe, to perform that maintenance. Okay. Now, as I understand it, this, this parklet's right in front of where their existing business is. Is there going to be, uh, I'm assuming there's going to be a requirement that if you're going to have one of these, you have to have property uh, right in front of it or adjacent to it. That's correct. Right. You can't just put one of these. Um, at someone else's business. At somebody right? else's no. business. And again, um, just kind of the length of this parklet, uh, it extends the storefront a little bit over to the adjacent property owner, but they've worked with that property owner and received the approval. So that, that being said, leads to my next question. So uh, is it going to be in the future that we have a requirement that adjacent property owners must agree to have uh, allow that in that place yes we're going to have that in the policy okay um other than that i don't i don't necessarily see this as an issue other than you know to just do this as a pilot program see how it works see where there's the uh, pitfalls uh, associated with this you know i'm, I'm not sure I'd... in terms of protection obviously you're going to be in a parking space and you're going to have people in the facility um, you know, you're on the street. Sometimes you get cars run into things. Is there going to be some aspect of, of a safety a, a component to this? That's correct. So um, you can kind of see it better on the other picture, but the back side of the uh, parklet will have traffic control devices, like I said, to enhance reflectivity. Well, I, I, I see that, but yeah. I mean, yeah, the it's structure not going to stop itself, a vehicle from... No, um, but in talking with the applicant, he's very familiar with building construction. He's talked to us about the rating of the materials that he's using, so um, he's very confident that the structure itself okay, is sound. Okay, I understand his confidence. <laughs> yes, uh, so we once we I'm, review I'm those looking specifications... In, looking in terms yes. of, you know, you know, this... They're on mm -hmm. the street. Mm -hmm. Yeah, correct. You know, you're going to have a, a, a temporary structure, relatively speaking, mm -hmm. on your. You know, there's always a possibility of a, a vehicle hitting it, so there's got to be some safety aspect to it. Correct. Um, you know, to where, you know, I don't know, a crush zone or something that that will, 
you know, or something solid that won't allow, you know, won't kill anybody. Right. That, and then part, I mean, some of the council members talked about that was taking time, seemingly to take time. But that's, what, that's what we've been working on is the safety aspect of this. We actually have to have the gentleman, the applicant trim the current construction because it's too far, it's too close to the drive lane. Uh, with some of the big trucks today and those big extended mirrors, that's real easy to hit somebody in the head that's sitting there or uh, not to mention a crash. So I think any engineer will say we it's not built to be 100% foolproof in terms of safety because a vehicle coming in at 20, 30 miles an hour could plow right into that thing and cause harm. That's that's We want to make people situationally aware of that. But the engineer's design standards and approval process includes safety you know safeguards to minimize that as much as possible because you are right in the street you're not on the sidewalk uh, which provides a little bit of a protection even on the sidewalk you know there's risk so uh, but that's in part what we've been working on is the design that's the that's our primary focus is safety uh, because of the location of the parklets which is in a parking spot which is on the street so the pilot will include that too uh, to look at how can we make them even safer. Yes, sir. Right. Well, what, whatever we do, I think there's some evaluation after this is in place, which I think is actually you know, a decent idea. Um, but we do an evaluation of how that looks going forward, and maybe standards for construction, whatever that may be, we should have some safety aspect to it. So that's all my questions. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councilman Smith. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> Sarah, what is the term? So it's uh, you're proposing $800 for a year. Is that a year to year or? Yes, sir. So right now we're proposing the full ordinance when it comes to council to be a one year license. Um, this pilot program will end upon the approval from council uh, April 12th and then start the full year process. Okay. And, you know, when I read the packet, I, I was thinking the $800 uh, on there, that's, that's a little bit steep, but I didn't realize at all that uh, we were going to give $20,000, a free parklet, so to speak, and $800 over 25 years, that's $20,000. And it does expand uh, business opportunities and, and those kind of things. And if, if we're under the market rate, we uh, do $20,000 worth of uh, who's going to have title to those improvements? The applicant will own the structure. So, uh, and uh, the structure expands their business footprint? Okay. I, I think the $800 is reasonable uh, with that. When, when you throw the $20,000 in a, uh, a free grant, like I say, that's $800 a, a month for, or $800 a year for 25 years. So, you know, we're, it's, it's a pretty good giveaway on there and then uh, the other aspect uh, to councilman pusley's is is on parking spaces so if we're looking at retail space on there uh, the eight hundred dollars where we're expanding the not retail or consumer space on there i, I think it's a very reasonable charge uh, with it particularly if if it's below market rates elsewhere and if, if we get too far along we're losing parking spaces and uh, not getting much back for them uh, with it but like I say, I, I think a uh, test is worth a thousand expert opinions, and on a one-year type of thing, I don't have a, a big issue. But I, I think once that year is up, it, it ought to be a, a rate that uh, is um, comparable to, to other areas uh, with it. And if it's the rates that you come up with uh, on there, because uh, we're not, we're not charging, you know, We'll have five of these at 20,000 uh, 20, per on there. So, uh, you know, that, that's quite a uh, incentive, I, I think. And that gets us five of the parklets up there so we can all see, the community can see how they do. So, thank you. Okay. Uh, Councilman Martinez. Thank you, Mayor. Yeah, I, I agree with Councilman Smith on the, on the price. I think that giving up the spots, it's not just the value of whether it costs anything to park there, right? I mean, you can come and park there and, and leave, but if you wanted to reserve that spot just for you all the time so that it's always there, you, you can't do that, right? It, it's, it's the value of that in addition to the value of basically the property that's being added for, um, for the use of the business. Um, at $800 a year, that comes out to about $66 a month. You know, it's so... I, I want to be reasonable as well, and I don't want to put any impediments, but, but I think that at that amount, 
it's still reasonable. Um, and I also think that it helps for, um, I don't want to say minimizing, but for controlling the amount of these parklets that go out there. Um, I think that that's going to be a, a real important issue that uh, Councilman Pusley and some others have mentioned is, is the parking. Um, you know, if, if, it, if, it's, if the price is so low that there's really no barrier, well, then every, every business is going to want it in front of their business. You know, so I, I think that we have to be careful in the planning of this so that, um, so that we do make sure that the parking issues may still be um, addressed and taken care of and, and, and that it still looks, um, I'll say it looks nice, but so that, that it still maintains the, um, the look that you want it to have down there. And um, I'll just add in our draft policy that we're going to be uh, bringing to you, it does include things about the facade and those kind of design elements as well. And, and I think it's probably also very important that we have some kind of provision that allows us to take back that yes. um, that piece of property or, or the parklet um, in the event that we do need the additional parking um, or that for whatever reason they're not doing their part or actually for, for no reason at all. It just gives us a, a recapture uh, opportunity. Yes, sir. We'll make sure that's in there. Okay. Councilman Hunter. Thank you, Mayor. Sorry I missed the beginning of the presentation. I was back there making sure the coffee was right, which reminds me that the uh, City Secretary should think about some Lucy's coffee back there. <laughs> <laughs> you, you brought up aesthetics and stuff like that. In our incentive program, do we offer anything extra for shade? I'm not too sure about in the incentive program. Um, Alyssa could probably speak more to that. But in terms of visibility for parklets, uh, we are uh, at this stage, we're not encouraging anything higher than 36 inches for railing and for visibility. Anything higher than that, our initial proposal is it needs to be clear with plexiglass so drivers and pedestrians can see what's coming at them. But Alyssa, okay. you may want to talk about, I'm not too sure any incentives for shade. We just, shade. We've been talking about shade. Alyssa knows right. this. We've been talking trees. about shade on <laughs> trees. everything. Yeah, tree. Natural not stuff. a palm tree either. Yeah. 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 Yeah, we don't need a roach lady back here. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, yeah, but, yeah. Yeah. Go ahead, Alyssa. Uh, we have our streetscape and safety improvement grant program that will reimburse for half of the cost of awnings or other kind of shade structures for a project. Um, typically, that will kind of extend from an existing building and so this project particularly is on the other side of the building line so I think um, the city's reimbursement of twenty thousand dollars will is is very generous I think we really appreciate that amount of support for this particular project and I think that'll accommodate a lot of the design elements that are necessary to make this so, pleasant I think this is great for the experiment pilot program right uh, mm -hmm. I yes. think we're justifying every dollar being given away and put into this but we need shade downtown. Yeah, yeah Councilman, Councilman Lerma said that we don't have enough people walking downtown. One of the main reasons is we don't have shade down there. Yeah, and I yeah, don't want to melt. And uh, of course, y'all probably want to see me melt because I'd lose 50 pounds. But, it's, <laughs> but uh, yeah, shade would be part of their designs. Uh, so there are some uh, engineering requirements uh, to include uh, flame resistant uh, ca uh, canopy covers. Nothing permanent, though, because the whole structure could be lifted up and tossed around with winds that we had yesterday, as an example. So they have to be removable, uh, so like an umbrella of sorts. Uh, uh, sure. So those will be some of the design standards uh, that they can conform to with the final policy that will come to council soon. Sounds great yes, to sir. me. But they are eligible for reimbursement in that $20,000 uh, that we'll be giving them. Thank you, and great job. Councilman Presley. Yeah, I, if it weren't for the $20,000 bonus I I would think $800 would probably be a little high to get started off with if we were trying to you know get one of these jump started but I just want to be sure we're fair to everybody in the downtown area and to businesses that may not have the ability to have a parklet for whatever reason maybe they're you've said that located on a corner is going to be difficult for them to have a parklet and 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 I'm not sure I'd want to be sitting at a table uh, <laughs> on a corner anyway in downtown, but um, I, you know I th I think it's fair uh, being that they're going to get the twenty thousand dollar help on it, and um, and the city has to provide a certain amount of services in those areas as well, um, so 
Uh, Alyssa, the question I have for you is if, if we approve this one, do you think that there's a good likelihood that these other three you're talking about will, will come forward pretty quickly? Um, one of the things I think that was really special about this project is that Justin, the owner of Lucy's, also has a skill set that particularly um, enables him to actually design, build these projects. And so he's right opened a lot of businesses in the downtown area. Um, the other business owners don't have that skill set, just that it happened to have that combination of things. Um, so that's why we were so excited to try to move this one forward because we had um, a, a partner who had the ability to do that. Um, we have a few more steps I think we'll need to figure out with some of the other parklets. Um, they'll need to get uh, kind of maybe bid out in a different way um, because we don't have that com combined um, ability with any of the other uh, restaurant or bar Sarah, owners. Sarah, you don't see this won't, this ordinance uh, that we're going to pass will not limit us to one. There could be others if, if somebody applied. Today's will. Today's is exclusively for Lucy's to be the pilot so program. So just be one? Yes, sir. And mm -hmm. then when we come back in April, we'll provide you, uh, for your review, the whole ordinance that will open up the process for, for anyone else. Yeah. Okay. Well, again, I'll say I, I think these are going to be very popular, and, and mm -hmm. people who don't have the skill sets can go hire those skill sets, especially <laughs> when we're giving them $20,000 to do so. The, just for your information, Councilman, some of the other proposals um, that we received are, are close to the six-figure um costs for for mm -hmm. something in a different space right in different configuration different size but right. um they get very pricey so we're very fortunate to have a partner on this pilot project that was able to to work with us on this mm -hmm. okay thank you Councilman councilman lerma yeah let me let me when i was saying the four hundred dollars the flat fee for the for the year i meant just for this first year i'm not saying for the next 10, 20 years, guys, because this is a pilot program. I'm saying we, we need to give them the break the first year. You know, that's what I'm trying to say to everybody. And let me clarify that. It's just the first year after that. I mean, if we, we go to the 600 or a thousand, I don't know what we're going to go once we see how this works out, you know. But uh, I'm just recommending that I would like to see the pilot program the first year at a total of $400 for that year. Okay. Okay, and um, Councilman Panetta. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I, I guess you know once again, um, part of part of my concerns with the cost is once again, I, I obviously we we didn't see that the twenty thousand dollars in that presentation. Uh, what is it? So that way we, you know, the, the thing is, is my 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 point is, is that we 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 should be a partner to small business. Uh, and I'm looking at you too, Al. <laughs> if we have some more come up, we need to recognize that if we've got a small business owner that wants to expand, okay, so how can we ensure that uh, it's done on a timely basis and we're doing everything we can, which we'd look at it not as well from their side. So uh, the other thing is, is that as, as my colleagues are well aware, I'd be fine if we eliminated all the parking and we eliminate all the traffic down Chaparral. I, I wouldn't see that as a problem. I remember back when it was somewhat of a bar district, they shut it down on Friday evenings because there was just too much walking traffic. Yeah. Well, too much walking traffic is, and that was back in the, what, late 80s? Yeah, yeah early 90s. 90, <laughs> okay, it was 91. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. So, so, and, so, and parking was not a problem because the vibrancy of the area yeah. is the attraction. They're gonna, somebody will walk four blocks to go to an area. I mean, look at Bourbon Street. I mean, look at, look at the Majestic and all the restaurants across the street from the Majestic and across down the street from Gun, the Gunther Hotel. I mean, there's a ton of activity there <clears throat> simply because, and there's other parking areas. So I, I think, I, I understand we're looking at it from a perspective of South Texas, Corpus Christi, where, you know, we wanna take our, you know, F-250, and park right in front and uh, what is it and just walk right inside but uh, i think if that's the thing we look at it from a pragmatic standpoint that here my, my opinion is that we're trying to incent business to try and expand an area how, Alyssa, how many how many other businesses do we have down chaparral other than the surf club and lucy's 
along that stretch because I don't think there's that many unless until you get to uh, the sushi place, right? Yeah. Which uses their sidewalk, the bulbous sidewalk. So how many are there? So directly on that block, sir, there are only two businesses that even have a front door facing Chaparral Street, and that's Lucy's and the Surf Club. And then we have to get a few blocks over to Schatzel, where, where we have Dokio. And then Dokio. there's um, a, another few blocks, and I think we have 10 total businesses there right now along the entire stretch of the street. But yeah. that's our, supposed to be our main street, so our, that's our focus area. And, and see, I might add that when we've had events like I mean, I'm just saying we look at it more from a global perspective. I think we're pigeonholing, pigeonholing ourselves when we're worried about parking and safety. I mean, it's like I said, when we have Dia de los Muertos, I mean, it was, it was in a national periodical, the top 10 places for, uh, for uh, festivals, and Dia de los Muertos shuts down several streets, and parking's not an issue because it's the demand of individuals to go out there. I mean, that's a thing, as well as... Art Walk has expanded so much so greatly yeah. because of the fact that there's <coughs> there's attractions for the individuals to go out to. So I, I, and then when we have a business that once again that is willing to expand 24/7, you know uh, what is it? Not 24/7, not seven, 24, but seven days a week. And I think what are their hours? Seven to eight, seven to nine, seven a.m. to. So, so I, I think that's the thing. We have an individual that's creating an attraction. We ought to be his partner and saying, okay, how can we help you um, instead of, uh, and, and I understand, we're, we're, we're a bureaucratic agency, and we have to look at this thing, and we have to look at the value and staff time and do all that. But I think if, once again, as part of the DMD, and I challenge you, Alyssa, to say, okay, how can we provide some incentives so that way if this individual is, is you know, just like, just like we do with the church. So that's really my point is I, I, I understand what we're doing. We want to be compliant. We want to make sure that, uh, what is it, we're, we're not allowing a business owner to capitalize on public space. Uh, we want them to, but not to the point where it you know, obviously increases their revenue. Then that creates a demand. And we have an individual that's creating demand for us. We just, I think we ought to be rewarding that rather than punishing that. So I'll, I'll support Councilman Littermas, um, uh, $400. Um, it, it's a short way for, a, 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 I think we need to get there from that component, but I'll support that for right now. Yeah. Uh, but I, I'm just saying that for yeah. the second. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. Councilman, uh, I think. Yeah, I, is it my turn or not? No, no, it is, because he's making a motion. Okay, so. I, I just want to, I want to respond to that, Councilman. I want you, I want to be sure that the people sitting in this audience are not construing the comments I've made as being anti-business. No, 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 no. I'm not doing that. No, no, no. Okay. I said nobody supports business bigger than I do. Yes, I think this is a great idea. I said that from the outset. I just, I'm, I'm you know, <laughs> my OCD will not allow me not to say, you got to be careful about, you know, what you wish for. You may just get it. So, uh, yeah. but I, I fully support this. I think it's a great idea. And I've said, I think there'll be more of them. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And we want to be partners to business and we want to do what we can. And, and we're always working with Alyssa to try to bring more businesses to downtown Corpus Christi. I've supported all of that. Yeah. So I don't want my statements to be misused. No, and, and Councilman Pesley, they're not. And I'm glad you said what you just said because we are her greatest partners. Yeah. And we are, we, we funded $100,000. Everyone in this city wanted a part of that ARPA fund. We couldn't do that. We have a huge infrastructure need. Otherwise, guess who pays for that? So it came at a great time. But here's the thing. A partnership is exactly that. $100,000. So let's not lose sight of we want to be part. No, no. We are partners. We're your greatest partner. And I know you're not saying otherwise, but... I, I let's confirm. make that yeah. real clear we're, we're and, and we owe that to mm -hmm. not just Justin but everybody else and and that's why we're here literally today I know you get it Justin but that's why we're here today that is why otherwise you know the other side of this would have been yeah we'll see on the 12th and then a week after that for the second reading and then you get to open it 
three weeks after or whatever, because we're partners. And, and the majority, if not all of us up here, I was, I'm not a business owner anymore, but I was a business owner. That's the only thing I've ever did, did in my life was own my business. So we are partners. So I'm going to end it with that. Councilman Lerma. <laughs> Megan. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Yeah, I'd like to make a, a motion that we accept uh, this pilot program for the parklets in the downtown area with the amendment of the fee for the first year only at $400. Okay. Mr. Z yeah. Yeah, Mr. Zanini, do you have a... Just to clear, yeah, just to add, did you, did, if the council wants to make this a one reading ordinance, we can do that as well right now. Because it's an ordinance, it would have to come oh. back. So yes, one reading, yeah, Councilman uh, Lerma, you may want to also amend it to make it a one reading ordinance so yes. it becomes effective today rather than next Tuesday. Okay. Yes, sir. So adding to my amendment of the $400, I also like to make a motion to amend the original one to make it a one-time reading. Okay. And Councilman Smith um, seconded. Yes, sir. Uh, point of order, and I ask uh, the city secretary, do we have to make a motion to approve and then amend it? Or so I'm just so is the pilot is the pilot program policy are we approving that today as well in the ordinance because it's not it's not attached but it was handed out right so that's this is an amendment to the well, ordinance it's not it's not policy no this, this the is policy a, was just a, to an agreement by y'all this is a, a one-time project uh, mm -hmm. so in April we're gonna come with the policy that council will approve or the ordinance for parklets so this is kind of a project specific ordinance well, i understand i'm just trying yeah. to figure out where the so the amendment is in the policy right under the fee schedule that's what we're amending yeah oh, right yes okay so right where that, it says annual park i'm sorry yes no go ahead rebecca where it says annual parklet license each space it has 800 dollars. right now we're making it 400 dollars. right actually what for the, the first year that all that's being kind of replaced with the fact that in total it would yeah, have been 1825 total. okay that includes fourth, right that includes two parking spaces at 800 each plus the application fee plus the inspection so that would have totaled 1875 that gets replaced with the motion to say all that all the charge will be is a 400 dollar flat, okay. fee. flat fee so all that's being replaced so i'm just trying to figure out if the yeah. if it amends the ordinance as well so it uh, does it does yes okay so mm -hmm. we're doing a one reading ordinance and making that amendment correct okay as stated by the city manager is that clear i yes. was a little confused but it's, for the, that works. it's only for one the, for the, the first, first year. year yes ma'am yes sir for the okay, first uh, year uh, my point of order was do we need to make a motion in a set in a second and then amend it after we uh, make a motion in a second since we're amending the ordinance that's what i'm hearing then yes that we would do uh, the motion to amend there was a second and we haven't voted on it yet and then we no, voted I, I, I do, uh, okay I'll, okay what yes, i'm asking is it yes. do we need to make a motion yes. to approve yes. and a second and then amend it oh yes sir yes okay so right. that so i i would ask that to we uh, make a motion to approve in a second and then then councilman lorma can add his amendment to after we make that right. motion and, and okay. Second. Okay. okay. All in favor say aye. Wait, 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 wait. wait. He's got to amend, okay. amend it. He's got to amend it first. To oh, change the, the fee to a flat fee for the first year of $400 and make this a one reading ordinance. Right. I'll second that motion, that amendment. Okay. All in favor say aye. Aye. So I make a motion to approve oh, as amended. I didn't say any of <laughs> Hold on. Yes, it's, sir. It's not effective yet. Uh, the uh, okay. you have magic language you have to put in to make it into a one reading ordinance oh. and let oh, me read language. this magic language okay <laughs> Good Lord. okay go ahead upon the written request of the mayor or a majority of the members of the council copy attached the city council finds and declares that an emergency due to the need for, for immediate action necessary for the efficient and effective administration of city affairs and suspends the city charter rule that requires consideration of and voting upon ordinances at two regular meetings so that this ordinance is passed and takes effect upon first reading as an emergency measure on this the 22nd day of uh, march 2022 okay so that goes along with his motion what he just said and we, to make okay who seconded it no we were all any opposed say no Okay, the motion carries. Right, to vote on it as amended. The okay. ordinance as you amended. Make a motion as uh, amended. I, I, I made the motion to, uh, oh, to, uh, to, to move so, as amended. Okay, so then we're, and then we're you second it. Okay. So we did it. Right. 
Right. Yeah. As amended. That's when you made the motion for. Sorry. I'm trying to get the language okay, right. So make the motion. Confusing. All right. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed say no. Okay. The motion carries. Passed it. Sorry. I'm glad I didn't have to. Good. Good All right. Robert's rules of order. So we're, Peter, we're going to go to item number 32. Uh, actually, yeah. Actually, we're going to go. <laughs> we're going to go to section N. First reading ordinances, items 28, 28 through 31. And Mayor, if I may, I'd like to make a motion that we approve items number 28, 29, 30, and 31 as a group. Okay. Okay, I think we have to. Um... Okay, no request. Is there any request from the public on any of those items? Okay, I'll enter. You have the motion and a second. All in favor say aye. Twenty-nine. Okay. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. I, I have brought this up, this issue up with staff before, uh, specifically with uh, uh, Neiman, mm -hmm. and um, I've always felt like the city of Corpus Christi has charged exorbitant rates for the businesses that operate around our T heads and they'll head and the reason I think they're exorbitant is because we only have three restaurants down there and in the theme of being fair to businesses both large and small I just I don't understand how you justify payments uh, you know that either include these high monthly rates or 2.75% of the monthly gross sales. I mean, that's 2.75 for a lot of restaurants is that's their profit. And, uh, you know, I, it's, I think disappointing and sad in some respects that we don't have more restaurants located in the downtown area, especially around <coughs> our water features because of the rates that we charge for those right so councilman um we uh, to get to this first of all the landry's uh lease hadn't been updated in some time many years so uh to get to this lease rate today that we're recommending we used an appraiser that appraised uh rates both for purchase and lease so it's based on that uh, fair market value for the area taking into consideration the area uh, Landry's is in agreement with the lease terms here. And then the third point would be that we're putting uh, phase one, $30 million into the T head and L head uh, with the replacement of one third of all the slips and piers. So a tremendous investment. We're also working with the mayor on doing a master plan uh, for the T heads and the L head that will bring more business, more entertainment, a complete redo. It's one of the mayor's top initiatives. So. Uh, the lease rates won't won't be commensurate to that big upscale, so these are going to be dated in uh, what we see today. Uh, but that thirty million dollars is a significant investment. I don't know if is there anything else to add, Dante, Dr. Dante. No, that's correct. Uh, we we're, you know, we we took that into consideration the the rate structure, uh, and and we came with with the scaled down version of it. So every year, uh, we're going to consider a, to get to the point of where it needs to be. And this was agreed by, by Landry's as well. And modernizing is the lease, right? What, what, how long has the lease been? Uh, 05? 10 uh, What is they've that? Had, they've had the lease years? since 2010. Since 2010, mm -hmm. they've had the lease. Now, how long has the lease expired? It's been month to month or year to year? It's been month to month for a little over a year now. Okay, so over a year we've been working with, with Landry's on them. Yep. I know they're very happy to be here. <laughs> they are. Yes. Well, I'm, I'm sure they are. Um, they have a captive audience, and they have mm -hmm. almost no competition. So, you know, maybe that's the reason they're agreeing to pay a higher rate. I don't know. But I'm just saying I think it's a real detriment to the downtown area uh, and the nightlife that you might bring if you had eight restaurants around those tea heads instead of three. Right, we agree with that, and that's why the master plan is going to I don't help. know whether $30 million worth of boat slips is going to make people go down there and have dinner, but I just have always felt like that we, the city has 
and this is something, this is a torch I've carried for a long time, guys, is the fact that we don't do enough to try to encourage those businesses down there. And I don't know what that is, and I'll surrender. Councilman Smith. Well, thank you. Uh, on there, I'm, I'm glad we're bringing this lease forward. I, back when I was a little bit younger, uh, we did a lot of leasing when I worked for HEB, and, and to me, the these terms seem very generous. That the, the 2.75 percent, I know when we were doing the leases, we were running five to eight uh, percent on those. And one thing about uh, our greater on the lease that if, if you're meeting those levels that you're hitting our greater, your establishment is making really good money and we take something like a uh, a restaurant on there that's a high margin business so there generally I, I know from our standpoint at HEB if we were in the percentage rent we were very happy because that that meant we were hitting our sales goals with it and I think from the consulting side that 2.75 is like I say a, a generous and if I understand Landry's is happy with it, I can see why they are happy, because it is a, a generous amount, particularly on a longer term when we're going into an inflationary time. So the, the, the future dollar value of, of the fixed amount will be in that percentage rent on there. So I hope, as we're looking at this, that, that we take a hard look at the market. What are market rents for that? What are our real estate terms uh, with it? So thank you. Okay, did, did you record the vote for this, for the, for the items? No, we didn't. Okay, we said all in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed say no. Okay, the motion carries, and that would be 28 through 31. So now we're going to move, <coughs> excuse me, we're moving up item number 30. 32. Two. 32, ordinance approving the redistricting of the city's single member city council districts. Yes, ma'am. So, Mayor and Council, City Secretary Rebecca Huerta. So, the ordinance before the council today, this will approve the, 20, the first reading of the approval of the 2022 redistricting plan. Um, in, the, in your agenda item, we do have a list of events leading up to this. I just want to highlight a few, which is on February the 21st of 2022. The council held a special council meeting to develop a draft map, which is called Plan B. And that's the map that was disseminated for public input. And we did receive public input on the draft B, uh, Plan B map at our seven community input sessions, which have been discussed in addition to a website uh, and an email address that we have set up. So lots of opportunities for, for public input and also, of course, on our web page. And we did receive a number of citizen-initiated maps, which are C, D, D1, and E. Those are attached to um, your agenda item as well uh, for your consideration. And to be clear, as a practical matter, citizen maps will no longer be accepted at this point since this is our first reading, and it would be uh, we would have insufficient time to analyze and discuss any additional maps. So those are the, these are the citizen-initiated maps that we'll be working with. So on March the 8th, the council conducted a wrap-up session to consider all the public input, including the in citizen-initiated maps. And at that time, the council did not have changes. So what's before you today is that Plan B map, the one that was developed on uh, February the 21st for your consideration. And, and of course, the citizen-initiated maps as well you can, you can review. Uh, we do have our redistricting consultant or consultant council Kabi Caputo with Bickerstaff online, and uh, we do have Cameron Arsenault as well, and he's available uh, to make any uh, amendments that you'd like, modifications to the map, if that's um, something that you decide on doing today. So um, at this point, I'll hand it over to Kabi, um, and we're we're here to to hear your comments, see if you have any questions um, at this point. So. That's right.
Mayor, can we have them put the precinct numbers up? Yeah. Rebecca, can we ask? Did you hear that request to put the precincts up? Yes, sir. It's plan B. Do you need to zoom in anywhere in particular? I, I, I have a question, Rebecca. Yes, sir. Can can we hobby? Uh, this is Councilman Lerma for District 1. If we if we take out precinct 24 from District 1, what will the numbers look like? Can, can we please look at that, please? Uh, 24, so that's just one up here. So there's, um, do you look, would you like to move back to District 3? Yes, put it right back into District 3. Oh, okay. What's the other one we want? The one since you just added has very little ones. It doesn't have much effect, does it? Mm -hmm. That's about 1,800 people. So airline becomes to see how this encroaches. Hmm. I'm sorry. Did, did, was there another comment? So, but you already. Have. So that 92 then goes into four. Okay. And 65 goes into two. The other you know, uh, and I say that because it was brought to my attention by uh, Councilman Barrera that he would like to keep the uh, West Tulsa School District in, in his district. So you know, I just wanted to take a look at the numbers to make sure and see how it would affect my district. And, and like you said, it doesn't affect me, but by 1,800 votes. Oh. And that's keeping the downtown and the North Beach area in my district. I mean, uh, I could probably live with that, but that's just a, a comment that I wanted to bring up to the 1,800 uh, population to my, to my uh, number. It went, I went from 63.5 to 61. Uh, eight. Okay. Okay. Yeah, we're still well within the uh, the ten percent deviation, so it's, that's oh. that that's what I'm trying to to do. Because it was brought to my attention by Councilman Barrera that he. So if we take out um, precinct or, twenty four, or I'm sorry, yeah, take it, give it to give him. it back. Then you're still okay. I, I'm okay with that, ma'am. Copy that. Is that what you just approved or uh, confirmed? Okay. I mean, it, it, it's the pleasure of the rest of the council. I mean, how, how, how they want to look at it. I mean, I'm, but I'm very comfortable with it. Okay. Councilman Barrera is comfortable. I think that's the important part here. So I'd like to make a motion that we would make this adjustment uh, and vote on this, uh, I guess you call it plan, I don't know, E? I don't know. It's plan B. So you plan would B. be plan amending B, but we the make plan just B. That Yes, sir. Yes, okay. To move precinct 24 20, into move district, it back into district from three. district one to district three. Yes, okay. ma'am. Okay. So. B one. Okay. You're like, but I want another one. <laughs> okay. Well, no. If you want another one. Yeah. Let me. You you have that motion. Let me let's hear some comments here, Councilman Pusley, or and then and then Hunter, you're after that. Or where are you? Yeah, sorry, I <laughs> took my light off and put it back. Oh, I was gonna say, I just saw. <laughs> okay, yeah, I, I was gonna make the same suggestion. Um, and my only question was, did, did that include 60? But you're saying that it doesn't, or so that's CCISD, so uh. Yeah. Small precinct anyway. uh, six, 60 is? No, no, no. Yeah, it's oh. a small precinct anyway. So yeah. Not, I don't think it's going to have a whole bunch of deviation. Because we had 60 before. Yeah, okay. and, and I have part of CCISD in my district anyway, yeah. so. Yeah. I think that's where those two. Okay. Okay. Can we look and see what it would do? Just real quickly, just look at the numbers if we took. 24, 34, and 60, and move those back to three. 
I think those are all now in one, according to draft plan B. But, so if you put 60 back in there, does that fix the problem? I believe it should. It okay. should, yeah. Okay. There's not a lot of population in 34. Yeah, 34 and 24. It does. Okay, so if you took 34 and 24 out, you said that didn't change anything. Correct. Okay. Yeah. I, I just think it makes a nice geographic boundary to do that. Yeah. It keeps the airport all in one district. It keeps the airport good. all in one it, district. Yeah, that's a good That's a good recommendation. Yeah. yeah. Just like we didn't want to split the West Oso district. Yeah. And if West Oso has any growth, it's going to go that direction. Yes. Okay. So I, I would make that recommendation. We move along with 24, we move 34. Leave 60 and 31 both back in, in one. I, I okay, can, I can live with that. Uh, Councilman Molina. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I'm, I'm going to go back to the uh, the, the public comment that was made, uh, there, there was uh, several comments made by the public and uh, representatives from the League of Women Voters that had urged us to consider moving uh, the North Beach and downtown area into District 2. And then uh, we've also had some discussion about moving uh, Precinct 65 and 92 into District 2. Um, I, I still think that's something that we should consider. Um, and Kabi, can can we move those into uh, District Two and see what those numbers look like? Yeah, um, we'll probably need someone to help define North Beach and downtown in terms of precincts. But, but I know it's going to make two uh, pretty huge. Is North Beach? No, North Beach is precinct 21. Downtown is one. One and 21. One twenty one and 65 and 62. 65 and 92. And that's two copies. Oh, and 92. Okay. Um, Rest area. So, the five, um, one and four are. Gene, we're not going to change size. And two is. Uh, it is in there. We're out of balance, That's though. Way out of balance. Way out of balance. Can, can you remove 21? Um, mm -mm. Still out of balance. Yeah, Move downtown back into it, which is one. See, but that leaves four below. How about if you move 92 back into District 4? Four. Well, half of it. Ninety-two. Half, yeah, half. Half of it. How the heck do you do half? Along, <laughs> along airline. Oh, that's airline. Oh, okay.
Lenny, if you could move 90 uh, into four on there, because you, airline it should be the boundary line. Yeah, that'd be, that'd be good to see, make airline our boundary. Right. So four is now, but the only issue is two is still overpopulated. So basically, we need to move What if we took 92 out? How about, how, how, how about from yours? What, how big is your district? Like 70, 84 and moving it to one to talk to yeah. yeah, I would agree. 77 or 61. I, I had submitted a map, Why and that's we, what we did. That's what I'm saying. 77 if we moved into to one? Yeah. Are you moving 77 into district one? That'll work. I'm just, I'm just trying to balance the numbers. I mean, uh, take it back out and put it back in two, please. 61. 61. Yeah. See, to, it's overpopulated, even with the future of the growth of these other four districts. Yeah, it has to well, be. See, Oh, it's over the 10%. Oh, okay. So can we can we look at taking out sixty one and seventy five? Sure. Yeah. It's another way to go. And putting it where? We just did that. We did. Yeah, we did that, did that already. That. No, no. Keep. Three thirty. Mm, yeah. Yeah. We, we already did that with sixty one, and it brought me up quite a bit. No, you're going to make three too big. Mm -hmm. To three? Well, I think it might actually balance, but it would be... No, no it, just, it went the opposite. 61 needs to go in District 1 to balance it out. You're, you're opposed to that, Mike? I'm sorry, what? Was it in there before? No. No. We, we tried that, and it, and it uh, brought me up to, what, 63... Five, I think it did. Yeah. I, well, why, why don't you try removing 85 and adding 39? Put uh, 85 back in two and 39 in one. That's probably more population. Well, the idea is that to try and give District 2 as much of the Bayfront as possible. And I, I, I know Councilman uh, Molina wants to try and uh, retain as much of the downtown as possible. Well, at, at 85 and wants to retain the downtown area. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You said Lena. Lena. I'm sorry, my apologies. <laughs> <laughs> at at so, 85 and right. 85 to District 1. Freudian slip. To the numbers, Mike. 
what percentage does that give us? I'm sorry, say that again. Eighty eighty five and thirty one went from two to two to one. Thirty nine. Thirty nine. How did these changes affect the demographics? Thirty nine and eighty five went to from two to one. But what area does that give you? I don't know the area though. It's before you get to Cold Park. It's uh, I guess the where the hospital is. Uh, up to the Spawn Hospital. It Morgan's the dividing line. No. Cameron, can you zoom in on? Precinct 85 and 39. Can you get in there closer? I can't see the streets. <laughs> what is that? I still can't tell. Booty? Yeah, it's two blocks past Mormon. Two blocks past Mormon. What's the main street? Do you know what the main street is? That's Morgan, Craig. What's this street? That's Booty Street right there. So the Booty's the one that comes all the way out to Ocean? I know that we wanted to, to make two smaller, but it seems like we should be looking at adding oh, is that four, the six points not necessarily in one. No? But it, it, it's not, it doesn't come in though, six points, right? No, that's, no. that's what no. it is right okay. now. It's, the it way it is with booty. this map right oh, here. Oh, no, no, wait a minute, it does. Yeah. yeah. No, that's the, that's, that would be if they were all even, right? right. So where it is right now is that yeah. like sixty three seven ninety nine for one. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> that only gives us a that only gives us nine point seven percent. The other one's perfect because he needs to be larger. He needs to be. Well, they had, that gave you how much? That more? gives him the how largest. More did you just mm -hmm. give? What were you at sixty five? What? Yeah. So it increases. It actually increases district About two to one. The change has been made. I mean, it's fine. Yeah. Oh, that's good. Well, no, I think I think uh, District Two still needs to be the largest district coming out of this, so it can it can be durable. So we actually, from Plan B, this actually increases District Two by I think like a thousand. So what's the dividing line for 39? Well, I mean, what's, the, what's the southern? Yeah, what's the southern? Yeah, it's the southern border. 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 Yeah, it needs to be. I like that at, at the oh, five point. The, what were we? Five point. The deviation being nine point one is not necessarily a bad thing because what we're looking at is having District Two be a larger district, and so that deviation will shrink as time goes on because you're going to have growth areas in District Five and District Four. So the idea was to make District Two a little bit larger, and this actually makes it larger than Plan B by about nine hundred voters. Uh, and so that's not a bad thing because District 2 just doesn't have the growth opportunities the other districts have, that's right? So yeah, well, I, my comment was that I, I think 39 should be retained in District 2. That, that was the thing. I know it's going to – I don't know what, 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 uh, what is it, Tetris deal we did. You know? Well, it, it, we'll, <laughs> we'll have to get something else if it's not 39 because uh, 61 was too, too large. Yeah. And uh, thirty nine made it, it was too large. Yeah, thirty nine made it was the was the Goldilocks zone, I guess you could say. <laughs> Councilman Molina, comments? I'm sorry. Cameron, can you zoom out just a little bit now? Can somebody clear that blue line? Hunter has a comment. Thank you. Is this is Mayor? Is this 
or I guess Rebecca, um, is this, once we decide today. Second reading. Is it, this is the second reading. No, it's the first mm -hmm. reading. No, this is the first, first reading, so we go back to the second reading. reading. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I would really like to, uh, I'd like to study this more, but I don't want to be here all day uh, reviewing this because I, I I know we if we wanted to we can spend the rest of the afternoon here looking at this. So I'm confused about what we changed. Thirty nine and eighty five, sir, came into District One. Which one? Thirty nine and eighty five. From District Two to District from One. From District Two, and it came into eighty one. Uh, District One. And that balances everything. That puts us under the ten percent. Okay. Right, and six and sixty five and ninety one went from four to uh, to District Two. So sixty five and ninety two or ninety one. Yeah. <laughs> I'm so, I'm sorry, ninety and part of ninety two. What did you say, Cameron? Yeah. That's correct. Yeah. That's correct. Yeah. yeah. But it, it makes. So the airline is a pretty hard boundary mm -hmm. down there. So, copy is. Um, did you hear Councilmember Molina? We talked about amendments on the first reading, uh, amendments on the second reading, or modifications on the second reading. Would that be an issue? Yes, you can modify on yeah. second reading. I just from a redistricting standpoint, I was curious. Yeah, no, as long as we publicize this new version, you know, put it on your website and make it available. Okay, Councilman Hunter, is he? Oh, oh he just got it. Well, I have a question. Oh, yes, Councilman Pesley. Okay. Would you, so you put 39 and 85, you said, into one? Okay, if if you take those back out, and what does that do to the standard deviation? Put that back into two. Yes. Okay. Then how did two get? bigger all of a sudden did we add something on the south end yeah okay. yes sir we added 92 and 65 yeah 65 is a huge precinct so originally it was not in two that's correct it was in four right. okay so if you take that back out what does it do to the standard deviation Yes. Yeah. So is that what the original Plan B looked like? With exception of my changes. Except for exception of your 24 changes. and 34. Yeah. Right. Yes, sir. And, uh, and the original Plan B also included. Uh, I'm sorry? Ninety was in. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because you're too big still. It, it needs to go back into two. You're too big. <clears throat> and then also we just plan uh, precinct seventy-seven in the original plan to use precinct seventy-seven to uh, two. And now it's Okay, so that you're so what you're saying is that's what the original plan B looked like, other than the changes of moving 24 and 34. Um, and, 
And which one? Uh, 77. 77. Okay, where, where was it originally? That was originally in two. It was in two under plan B uh, that started out. Okay. So if you does it change the standard deviation if you move it back into two? Oh yeah. Okay. 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 I'm going to go ahead and um, any uh, ask if there's anyone from the public, Mr. Dowling, and would like to make public comment. Thank you, ma'am. I appreciate that. Tim yes, Dowling, 8017 Via Franche. Uh, it's been interesting listening to you here talk the last couple minutes. Um, I don't think you're quite getting the big picture. The big picture is. Should District 2 go north or should District 1 go east? You're kind of putting the cart before the horse. What I would urge you to do is to vote on that fundamental question first. Don't vote on a map. Vote on the concept. Then get into the map. So that's what I would urge you to do. You also heard from a lot of people public today. I counted them. There were seven people that said extend District 2 north, one who said extend District 1 east. If you look at the public comments, those are all very similar. I understand that there's a map that you all received yesterday that is from inside the council. And it sounds like a very good map, but we haven't seen it. So what I would urge you to do is publish that map. Don't vote today. I don't know if Mr. Caputo has the capability, and he, I'm sure he can tell me here in a minute, whether he can revise all the plans that have been submitted or just B. You should be able to have him revise all the plans in real time and not just B. B, you're not getting significant public support for. And you're ignoring that in your discussion right now. You're just all keeping it downtown in one where it's been since the mid-80s. So it, I don't think you're getting it. District 1 sprawls all the way from the Noasis River down to the bay. That doesn't make a lot of sense. I worked downtown for 40 years. We don't have much in common with the people in the refineries or the Cal Island area. But we do have a lot in common with the people south. I used to live in that area. So what I'd urge you to do is figure out what's the way we want this map to go? Do you want it to extend District 2 north? Or do you want to extend District 1 east like it is? Decide that. And then decide, OK, now that we've made that fundamental decision, which map do we like now that we've made that fundamental decision? And among the, the distinguished voices that you've heard from, and this is on their website, the written comments, Alice Hawkins, distinguished public servant, says, I want to extend District 2 north. You, and same, same thing for Ms. Holder. You heard from her this morning. League of Women Voters President, she's got written comments to the same effect. So what I'd ask you to do is to think of about it that way. Decide the big picture concept, then decide your map. And don't vote on a map just because somebody's your friend or you don't want to make anybody mad. What's the most logical thing? What I would urge you to do is this internal map that you all have seen that has been developed internally, publish that. Let's look at it. And whatever you do today, you're voting on a map in real time here that nobody has seen. So I don't think you should be voting on a map today. You can be voting on a concept. And if you like what Mr. Caputo does, publish a new map. And then people can come back next week after they've had an opportunity to look at it and say, I like it or I don't. But don't have a vote today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Dowling. Okay. Can I ask a question of Mr. Dowling? Sure. Mr. Dowling, it, I, I think I've only seen, it has, uh, of the seven that spoke, of the, of the people that have regularly spoke with, that would want to include North Beach into District 2, right. how many of those were actual residents of District 2? I don't know. I don't know the answer to that question. And, and one... Oh, well, I do know, I do know that uh, Ms. Oler, I believe, she's in District 2, but I don't ask my... I understand. <laughs> it's just that we, don't had, that question. Sorry. we had one resident today that is very active in the North Beach area uh, with regard to... She's, te she's, she's made public comment right. on numerous occasions, on numerous occasions. Right. And um, th there's been two things that, that I observed about with regard to this process in North Beach, um, that one individual who's been here on numerous occasions that spoke about 
uh, for other purposes, spoke vehemently against being included in District 2. Mm -hmm. And secondly, I, I, I guess that's the thing, and yet no one, no one from North Beach has come in to decry any of the maps that put them in uh, uh, that would put them in District 1, that left them in District 1. So that, that's one thing. And I, and I know I had, had spoke to you that my biggest concern was, uh, obviously my, my main priority was the continuity of District 3, sure. which is would be particularly the West Oso area. You know, I, 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 I thank uh, Councilman Litterma for bringing it up because we, uh, we talked about it today. All the work that's been done for Salinas Park, um, uh, all that area, uh, basically, it, it would have been taken away with some of the other maps. In fact, all of them, with the exception of the amendment today. Right. And um, so there's, there's, we want to maintain that continu community sure. of continuity sure. or whatever. The, sure. You know, and uh, and so um, I, I guess that's the thing. I'm, I'm just wondering where did this movement uh, from these individuals that are all in a specific, they're, they're, they have a common group that they're all in right. that. North Beach, I mean, where did the idea come from? I understand the methodology of why, but where did the idea come from? All I can tell you, Mr. Barrera, is just discussions about, hey, what do we think makes the most sense? I could see a log logical compromise where you could say, okay, we'll keep North Beach in District 1 and then have downtown, the C District, and all that area south go on to District 2. I could see that. That kind of makes sense. It's not what I would ideally do. But I think that the uh, idea makes sense. And I do recall Miss Elisa Gonzalez, who I've known a long time, she used to live in North Beach, and you heard her today. And she said, uh, North Beach, it really don't have much in common with those folks out in Cal Allen, et cetera. We, I feel more common with the folks downtown and south. Yeah, so, and, and that's a former resident, so sure. we have to look at it from that perspective. Sure. You know, that's a thing, you know, versus somebody that's decided to stay here. And, sure. And, sure. And is very active in that area. Sure. Okay, I, I just wanted to get a little bit of insight. Uh, because I've been very attentive, as you know, Miss Snyder had indicated, to try and be sensitive to sure. you. So, okay, yeah, okay. Sure. Thank you, Mayor. Okay. All right. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Burrow. Great. Thank you. Okay. Oh, Mr. Presley. Yes, ma'am, Mayor. Uh, in an effort to move this forward while we're all still young, <laughs> um, I'm going to make a motion that we approve uh, Map B as submitted with the exception of moving uh, precincts 24 and 34 back into three. Second. Okay. Mayor, I'd like to add something. Yes, sir. So I don't want to be the person to vote no on every submission, but I will unless we get the opportunity to vote for the original plan. Because I have a question for the uh, legal team that we hired. When you're talking about redistricting and developing these maps, what are your primary concerns? It's statistics. Is that not correct? The numbers of where people live and not communities of interest? That's correct. Yeah, I mean, communities of interest is part of it. But is it a primary concern? Is it your number one, two, or three focus? Okay, that's I because I will I, I've I think that that plan based on statistics is the plan that we should go with now I am NOT a district member and I'd be willing to work with it but I will vote no if we have to vote for anything before getting the original vote on plan plan B just throwing that out there well, isn't plan B the second one <laughs> Right, there was a plan A that they came out with. Hey, I'll vote for plan A. <laughs> oh, that's, that's the one I'm thinking of. Whichever right. was the original one that they brought to us is yeah. the one I would like to vote on. So yeah. that's plan A. Right. Okay, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. No. So, but we plan have a, a that is not available to us. So, we have so a plan B is the only one that is available. You, oh. Okay, but we have a motion in a second. Okay. So well, I'll let that go through. Let's, it okay. has already been submitted, so okay. Okay. I'll just vote no. Uh, All in favor? Could I, uh, should we still have a discussion? Sorry, yes. Okay, uh, uh, 
I'd like to say that I, I don't have an issue with um, the two precincts going over, but it does reduce, uh, uh, it does change the size of District 2 into something a little bit smaller than what we originally would like to have seen. Um, what's the current deviation right now? 7, 7.21, um, and it actually makes District 3 and District 2 almost, uh, it actually makes District 3 the largest one uh, with, those, with those changes. Uh, but it's really District 2 that needs to be the larger one in order to make this redistricting durable. They're the only ones that don't have the, the growth opportunities. I'd be more, uh, like I said, I think 65, uh, the, what we had put in originally, those other changes, which made uh, uh, the um, District 2 a little bit larger, makes a lot of sense as well and having the dividing line as as uh, as airline uh, would be a, a, an also a good option considering that we're moving since we're moving uh, some into uh, district three and district one is now what at 60 could you put that that uh, one back it, now district one is the smallest one by a large mar by a larger margin uh, so it so that change kind of unbalances, you know, in the wrong direction for, you know, District 1 was not the largest growth um, district in the, last, in the last 10 years. So I, I think that you, if you're going to make these changes for District 3, from district, from district 1 to District 3, you need to make some changes to bring a little bit more into District 2 and District, uh, district 1. We didn't change District 2. The changes I made only impacted District 3. Those two precincts. Yeah, but you made you made this. This makes District One the smallest, uh, and they, they were not the highest growth uh, area. So you're going to have an imbalance. It's not going to eventually correct itself. Okay. Well, we we, we have a motion. We have a second. So um, I'm going to we're going to go ahead and vote, Rebecca. All in so favor, say yes. What map are we voting on? The, the one with all. Oh, it's, it's Plan B with the modifications uh, stated by Mr. Pesley, which were to move. Precincts 24 and 34 to 3. No, because he made some changes. It's only 34 and 24. Right. Otherwise, it's plan B. Well, he can change it real quick. Yeah. Right now, it's plan B except 34 and 24. Yeah, that's right. No, 60 was. It's only 24 and 34. Yes, sir. Okay. That's the only change we made. 60 stayed in District 1. Yeah. That's yeah. all I gave up. It's just those two that were stated. And they didn't impact anything at all. Right, there right. Nobody living there. Okay. Well, all right. The impact, as uh, Council Member Mendez was just noting, is that it makes one very small. They changed it all back. It doesn't change the deviation. It doesn't change the racial makeup significantly. It's strictly. Because it's not on the agenda, we can't vote on it. Yeah, it makes one smaller. It's 12%. Okay. Okay, any further discussion? Okay, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say no? No. Who said no? Two. You said no? Okay. Which one? Martin. Martinez and Hunter. No. Okay. Oh, you guys said no too. Oh, okay. Yeah, let's do a roll call. Okay, so for passage of. Uh, the motion to adopt plan B with the exception of 24 and 34 going into district three. Council members Lerma. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't, I was, I was We're sorry. just doing a roll call vote on that one. On the one we just voted on? Yes. Yes. Okay, so uh, Martinez. No. Molina. No. Pesley. Aye. Smith. No. Barrera. Aye. Hernandez. No. Hunter. No. Mayor Guajardo. Aye. Okay, so it fails. Okay. So who would like to throw something else out? Mayor, I'd, I'd like to throw out an idea. And I'm not sure if uh, the time would allow us to, and I'm not sure what the appetite of the council is going to be, but I'll throw it out there anyways. Um, I'm going to suggest that... Uh, I, because it's been said, mentioned by the public several times that 
we go ahead and establish an independent review committee to review the maps that have been submitted and then make a recommendation to this council and give them a month to do it. Can you repeat that? I'm sorry. <laughs> Say that again. Okay, I'm going to form a committee. I'm going to recommend that we establish an independent review committee made up of the community to review the the maps that have been submitted to the city secretary's office and then make those make a recommendation to the city council. Oh god. <sighs> Madam Mayor, but this is something that we as a I think we've already established we, that we weren't doing we weren't that from the beginning. That. We should have done that. I mean if it was the will of the council that was an option uh, and and, and I, I I understand that. No, but I'm not. I'm I'm sorry. I'm interrupting you because I need to hear from Rebecca in terms of the timeline and such. Well, the timing, the the huh. we, the creation of a committee, um, at this point in the game, it, it's it's um, the selection process is cr critical to that. It would take a while to develop that process because that's what uh, determines your outcome on a, on a commission. So at this point in the game, it would be challenging to do that. Yeah. I think. Um, I understand. I just wanted to throw that out there and see yeah. if there was any okay. appetite, any interest in that. Yes, sir. The po point of order. Yeah. Uh, point of order is it? Do we have uh, because of the ordinance? Didn't we already vote on an ordinance specific to the process we're following? Yes. We would have to change the ordinance, correct? I think that's right. Is that correct, Miles? Because we adopted guidelines and criteria on how yeah, we would we select. Did. That's right. L legally, we could probably figure out how to make it happen. Functionally, it's going to be real difficult. You're going to have to select, recruit people and select okay. people. Uh, it would be a challenge. Okay. Councilman Martinez. Okay, I, I want to make a motion that we approve the map that was the last version before we went back to um, version two. So, so version plan B. B. So the plan, plan B. B. The original, original plan, plan B. B. Before, original. The, the, the map that we had before we went back to it, with all the changes that we made before we change them back to plan B. No, plan, plan B. Not today. The changes we made today B. before That's we went B. back to B. I'll okay. second that. You, you understand what I'm okay, saying? Okay, so all the changes, so you include uh, 85, uh, uh, 65, 92, uh, 92 90, Correct. and se 77, and there's one other one. Where it got us to 5.7 percent. And what? Deviation. Like 9.1 percent deviation, I think, is no, where it was. Is that the one? No, it was five. No. Before we made any changes? Kabi, what is that one that he's that uh, council members referring to? It, it's what the council had changed today until right B. So what do we refer to it as? It, it, I was calling it B one. We haven't B one. That's the one. B one. Uh, okay, B one. Yeah, we need to see it. That's and that that's where. I did too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, I see. What okay, saying. so it's, we're going to refer to it as B1. So B1. is it? Okay. 65, 65, 90, 65, right. 85, 92, and 39. That's correct. 92, and, 90. And 77 going to and 1. And 77, yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's it right there. Okay. With exception, with exception of uh, 77. Councilman Hernandez. What? Say that again? I'm sorry, I'm no, lost the, here. The only thing I cared about was having District 2 being the largest district. No, no. No, 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 no. It, it, this, is, this is something that we had discussed about having them durable. Uh, and it was a, I, I know I've had several discussions with uh, uh, council members about having District 2 be the largest district. Not me. In District 2? Not me. Well, District 1, I want to add some to it, not, not take away from it. Uh, this would be taken mainly away from District 4. And this was a discussion me and uh, uh, Councilman Smith had. Okay. So if you look at, the, if you look at those ones, it, it still makes District 2 the largest one and, and gets him the, uh, the numbers to be the largest district. Well, because we had a we had a large deviation in the last one to where it was thir it was thirty seven percent. Yeah. 
No, but I can say, I can project that District 2 won't grow because they don't have any growth areas. There's, there's no growth areas in District 2. There's no uh, new developments. There's no, uh, unless they're going to tear down a bunch of homes and, and put up apartment complexes, I, I just don't see it growing at all. Uh, so that was the whole, dis the, the whole thing about trying to make it larger. It had nothing to do with the, the changes with District 1 and West Oso. That's fine. That, nothing's changed there. We're not asking to change that there. It's about, uh, about uh, District 2. Um, there's no issue with the District 3 retaining uh, the West Oso area I don't have an, or, or the airport area. I don't have any issues. But I, I can tell that, you know, when I sit next to Councilman Molina, he's not real happy with how this is all kind of transpiring. Uh, and I think 65 would be a, a, some measure of, of, of getting him to the point where at least he'd you know, have the district he's looking for. Am I, and I'll let him speak for that. Um, we, have a, we have a motion and we have a second. Who's, uh, can, just can you, Councilman Martinez. Okay. Okay, let's so go over it. B1. B1 modified, or B1, uh, B1. 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 Right, it's B1? I believe so. Yeah. But let's that's what we're calling it. It's whatever's coming up. <laughs> that's. Is he on? Rebecca, is he on? Cameron, can you put the map up? Thank you. Yes. 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 All right, let me know, again, let me know. Is this the one now? Yeah, it's got the 9.1. I think that that's the right one. 9.1. Okay, yeah. Yeah, it should be the correct level moving. 85, 39, 77, oh, 65. Go, go, yeah, go through that. Cameron, go through that again and let us know what is, uh, what is each precinct, what are we doing? Bringing in and list them all. It's okay. Cameron, it, Cameron, is there any way that you could put the overlap where it has the old district lines on there? So 85. I don't know if they can hear you. Yeah, Councilman, I put your, your microphone yeah. on. I don't know if they, I don't know yeah, if they could hear you. They can't hear you without your mic. Yeah. <laughs> so those three precincts that you put into one just now, what did that change its standard deviation to? So 9.1 at this point. Yeah. So, so now one has no potential for growth. No, one is currently at uh, pretty close to uh, equal. So it's not overpopulated, it's not underpopulated. So it doesn't. Two, two is only 200 people overpopulated, otherwise, it's ideal. But the standard deviation of one is 9.10, correct? Yes. So that means, yeah. So it, it now has the 
So it now, by moving those three precincts in there, you've now created a situation where it has no growth potential, like Councilman Hernandez keeps saying for two. Yeah. Yeah, but but what I'm saying is that doesn't give you any room for the standard deviation to change. Well, if that's true for one, why wouldn't that be true for precinct for district two? Well, what? The, the idea, as I understand it, this plan is that over the next 10 years, one will grow a little bit, two will not grow, four and five will grow a lot, and three might grow a little, might grow more. Yeah, so there is room for growth. Right. Okay. But it depends. You know, if you have an explosive growth elsewhere in the city, your well, ideal uh, district size is going to go up significantly. Right. Right. So, five. You know, it's going to have to I mean, changes. Yeah. One. One and five, really. Before the others. Okay. Okay. Do we have any other questions, gentlemen? One, one last yes. question, I, and, and I, uh, I wanted to, um, uh, I understand your concern, Mike, I really do. Um, Councilman Pussler, the, what we're talking about is a difference of about 1,500 people within those precincts. Uh, not a significant number amount, but uh, I think for an adding to District 1, and uh, I think that that was more of a, uh, I think I understand your concern. The just looking at it from the perspective of the districts, District 5 and District 4 were the two largest and we should be a negative number. District 1 was third in that and then District, District 3 and District 2 were, I believe, negative in terms of the standard deviation when we came into this. Um, and just looking at it to, to, to where you don't have a, such a, a disparity like we had at the end of the last redistricting, you need to have some weighted uh, amount of population into District 2 and to a lesser extent, District 3, I think there's going to be a growth area in the London area. But uh, I still think District 2 still needs to be the largest one coming out of that. And a 9% deviation is leaning towards District 2. Uh, th and that's, that's the ideal place you want to be. So when it, it starts, when you don't have any growth in District 2 and you have growth in the other districts, you'll see that balance out as we go along. And, to, uh, and that will really, you'll see that you know, I guess in the next census, but it's really, uh, I think it's to, to make sure you still have a, long, a balance that stays long term. Okay, that, that, that's all I have to say, thank you. Okay. Question? I don't know, everybody's lights have been on the whole time, but do you have one? Go ahead. Yeah, uh, so what is the population in 39 uh, precinct? 30. <coughs> Okay, so it's fairly dense. Okay, uh, you know, to, to move the process forward, I'm, I'm going to support this resolution, but I think the end result that uh, 39 ought to stay in two, that uh, we can probably make some changes uh, in, in other boundaries to keep us within that 10% uh, deviation, but it's, it's very much part and parcel of, of two uh, with it, if, if Councilman Molina agrees with that. I agree. Uh, 39, I, I feel moving forward, it should remain in District 2. Yeah, okay. But, but I will support the motion on the floor just, just so we can go. Okay. 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 So we do have a motion. Do we have a second? I'll second. Second. Okay. Any further discussion? Okay. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say no? No. Okay. 
So we have two no's. Two no's, Hunter and Pusley. Okay. 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 But the motion to amend would, would pass. So then we just need to pass the ordinance as amended. Okay. Okay, is there a second? Okay. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed say no? No. Okay, same two no's. John. The motion carries. Okay. Thank okay. So, thank you, Kabi. Thank you all. We'll get the uh, map revised and get the table down here. Thank you. Yes, and the map will also be placed on uh, the website as well for, um, okay. for public review. Oh, sorry. Okay, so uh, this will take us to the last section, um, section L, public hearings, items 21 through 27. Item number 21 is a zoning case. Number 0122-06, Jackie Holmes, LLC. Mr. Raymond. Uh, it's 21. So that's our last section, 21 through 27. Right. And we're done. Good afternoon. Did we do, I don't think we did 30. Done. Yeah, 33 too, man, right? Did we do 33 yet? Oh, did, yeah. did we yeah, we did do 33. Yeah. Oh, you're right. We should. Well, Mr. Raymond, you go ahead. We'll, we'll come back to 30. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. Uh, the case before you is rezone the property located at 7802 Yorktown Boulevard from RS 4.5, single family 4.5 district to RM1, multifamily 1 district. The property is located along the north side of property is located along the north side of Yorktown Boulevard, east of Rodfield Road, west of Story Road. The applicant is Jackie Holmes. The proposed rezoning is to allow for the construction of a multifamily development. The property totals 14.834 acres in size and it is not platted. To the north is Master Drainage Channel 31 and across the drainage channel is single family subdivision zone RS 4.5. To the south is a vacant property zoned CN1 uh, neighborhood commercial, and across Yorktown Boulevard is a vacant property zoned RS 4.5 uh, single family 4.5 district. To the east is vacant property zoned RS 4.5 and CN1 as well, and to the west is church property zoned FR Farm Rule District. 35 notices were mailed out within a 200-foot uh, notification area. Zero were returned in opposition. Zero were returned in favor. The proposed rezoning is consistent with the adopted comprehensive plan, compatible with the adjoining properties, and it does not have a negative impact on the surrounding area. However, the the proposed rezoning does warrant an amendment to the future land use map because the south side area development plan calls for the area to be medium density residential use, uh, which is four to 12, four to 13 acres, sorry, four to 13 units per acre. And of course, RM1 is 22 uh, units per acre, thus the uh, amendment to the future land use map. The proposed north south uh, C1 Minor Collector traverses the property to the north and eventually will connect Yorktown Boulevard to Slaw Road uh, across the drainage channel uh, to the north. Um, the Planning Commission and staff recommend approval and I stand by for any questions. Okay. Uh, okay, Councilman Lerma. Okay, Councilman Molina. Okay, Councilman Hernandez. I guess. <laughs> Hernandez. Okay. Yes, this is. <laughs> this, it's good that I wasn't caught that way. Uh, all right. Uh, if you go back to the map there that shows uh, um, where the Fred's Folly uh, Road is. Get, is that the actual right map? There. No. See the that green. One, that one right there. Yes. Uh, is is that how the master plan is set up that way? The uh, UTP, yes. Right. Now, yes. 
Okay, because I mean, if you're talking about the C1 collector, it's on the on the property that's um, farm rural, correct? Mm -hmm. So unless that property is developed, that road will never get built. Is that's that correct? correct. That's why I said eventually it will connect Yorktown to Slaw Road. Okay, so the collector is going to come from Fred's Folly that's uh, on the other side. Now, you notice that the, the little section there is, is uh, farm rural, that it doesn't go all the way to the ditch. Correct. Why, why was that not? Is that? Uh, honestly, I don't know. Do you have any? Good afternoon, Councilman. Uh, Andrew Demas with Development Services. So the portion that's FR is actually for the entire drainage right of way. So the, the only portion uh, that the applicant is requesting is just the potential developable area. But okay, the, so what you have, what you know, the concern I had is that you have a, a plan for a, a crossing over that over that ditch, and I believe it's ditch thirty one. Yes. Okay. Um, and so um, the other side paid into, into an amount into construction of that ditch. I don't think it was anywhere near enough. Fifty grand. Yes. Uh, I don't know who got away with that, but you know, the there also has to be a contribution from this particular property owner into construction of that correct of that, a crossing. Correct. Right. So who's actually going to be responsible for building that crossing? That would be the developers. So regardless of the zoning, the platting responsibility would be if, if it is the same property owner, they're responsible for that bridge crossing. Uh, I can also tell you that the property next door with the extension of the C1 has already expressed interest in rezoning and platting their property as well. So there is a discussion between the two developers uh, if there needs to be slight adjustments to that C1 alignment but for the most part, it will remain as it's showing. But in this case, the developer is responsible for that bridge crossing. Okay, so the developer is also responsible for that section of the, of the C1 collector that is correct. up until the yes, property sir. line and then goes up to Fred's Folly on the other side. Yes, yes sir. sir. Okay, and you said the property next to it where it's farm rural there? Has already expressed interest for a, a very similar design of single family with C1, uh, CN1 zoning along the corridor. Okay, now I remember this came back, came to us a little while back uh, to change it to RS 4.5, and this is going to um, multifamily. This is not in, in compliance with our area development plan, correct? Correct. One one interesting part of about the RM1 district is that it inherently allows by right single family <laughs> homes, townhomes, duplexes, apartments. The idea is that by allowing something at the RM1 level, you're opening to all types of development possibilities. So you're not going to necessarily just have another C of single family homes. You might have small apartments, a section that's duplexes, a section that's single family, some townhomes to bring some multiple type of design concepts within the same tract of land. Okay, so we want to amend our area development plan in, in to, to make this into what it what they're asking for. Right. On, yes. on technically, RM1 is at 22 <clears throat> units per acre, which is above the maximum of density, 13 right. dwelling units per acre for medium density. So yes, it's technically uh, a, an amendment to the future land use map, but by no means has the applicant expressed that this is going to be one massive apartment complex. Rather, they're asking to have portions of townhomes, single family homes, and perhaps a small apartment complex within this entire site. So you may very well end up with the same density of 13 units per acre when you actually get to the end of the day, the platting phase. Okay. Maybe next time I'll borrow some of the flower bluff folks that are you know, <laughs> championing the area development plan. Uh, but we, we try to stay close, <laughs> right? Uh, okay. Well, I, well, we don't see the plat, so we don't know what they're going to actually right. do. Yeah. This could be all. <laughs> we uh, I mean, you, I mean, I mean, technically, this could be all. Sure. Every bit of it. But you understand, if if we if we adhered to the area development plan verbatim, it would eliminate uh, many cases being brought before you because in this case. Uh, yes, area this, the area development plan says medium density residential. This guy's doing high density. Do we say no? Uh, try again. Uh, you know, make, make sure you use this argument when they're in Flower <laughs> Bluff. Yeah. I'm just, I'm right. just, just making a point because this body decides, right? Is it close enough or is it not close enough? Mm -hmm. So, um, 
That's why we say it's consistent with the adopted con comprehensive plan and warranted amendment because the zoning would require that. But it's you guys. Okay. Make well, well, the main decision. the main concern here is, is that crossing over Fred's Folly, uh, and that is a you know I I know the they've expressed some interest as to not to build it or maybe even making it a pedestrian bridge, but there's connectivity issues. Absolutely. And that's important to have that bridge there. You know I'm. Obviously, I don't think you can go back and, 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 and get it from the other developer that only gave 50000 I don't know, know how that happened. Uh, but uh, um, it, it, it's something that we absolutely need to, need to have. Uh, and it would reduce the times for uh, fire trucks and ambulances that Correct. are at Station 17 to get into that neighborhood. Absolutely. So it's, it's important to have that crossing. So aside from this, I won't, I won't oppose it. Hopefully, it's not all... Uh, it's not all apartments, apartments right. uh, but we, you know, ultimately I'd like to see it develop and then get that bridge crossing. So um, yes, I'll, sir. I'll go ahead and support this. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. I'll go ahead and open public hearing. Is there anyone in the public that would like to make comment on item number 21? Okay. There being none, I'll close public hearing and entertain a motion to approve uh, item number 21. Motion to approve. Second. Okay. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say no. The motion carries. Okay. You want to go back to 33? Let's go back to 33 yeah, we can since go to 33. I left it out. Yeah, so item number 33 is an ordinance amending Corpus Christi Code to add sections 55 through 40 to authorize building official to disconnect utility services yeah. for renovation of yeah, certificate of occupancy yes, or for failure to remedy a violation of code resulting in a danger to the life, health, or safety of the public or occupant or the occupants of a building and providing for publication. I'm uh, sorry. Here, got it. Okay. Okay. Uh, Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. This ordinance uh, is to amend the Corpus Christi Code to add sections 55 through 40 to authorize the building official to disconnect utilities, utility services for revocation of certificate of occupancies or for failure to remedy a violation of the building code resulting in uh, danger to life, health, safety of the public and or building occupants. Currently, the city uh, may disconnect water and wastewater utilities resulting from delinquent payments. The building official also has the authority to authorize disconnection of utility services as provided by the national model uh, code adopted by the city. Under the International Building Code, the building official has the authority to the building official has authority, uh, building official's authority, sorry, is limited to emergencies only where utility disconnects is required if necessarily to eliminate immediate hazards to life and property. However, there are no provisions in the city code for disconnection to address the revocation of a certificate of occupancy uh, to remedy a building code violation resulting in danger to life, health, safety of the public and or the building op occupants. The proposed amendment would expand the authority to address national model code violations, um, national code violations. Uh, the ordinance will authorize the building official to disconnect uh, utility services uh, to multifamily, commercial, uh, institutional, and industrial buildings or structures uh, regulated by the National Motor Code adopted by the city. A utility, um, a utility connection that has been made without uh, required authorization, a uh, building official may revoke a certificate of occupancy, the building official may find the building or structure to be in violation of a uh, national model code adopted by the city, or the violation uh, is a danger to life, health, safety of the public and or building occupants. Prior to dis disconnection, the building official 
shall place a, a visible notice on the front door of the building or structure uh, with our intent to disconnect utilities, attempt to notify the owner or of the building or structure of the decision to disconnect utilities, give the owner 72 hours to cure or, or remedy the deficiencies, and give the owner 72 hours to request a hearing before the building official uh, to present evidence at the hearing to avoid the disconnection. Staff recommends approval, and I stand by for any questions. Okay. I don't see any lights on, so I'm going to oh, did Were you reaching for one? <laughs> Mr. Smith. Well, I want to thank all the people that came in public comment. Uh, you did a great job on, on pre presenting a reason that we should be passing this uh, on there. It's like a... You know, it, it's worth uh, so much to us, I think, to, to see this actually in practice. I want to thank staff for getting behind this and, and bringing practices that are used in other cities successfully on it. So hopefully we'll prevent uh, the occurrence that we saw happening in the future with it. So uh, Mr. Raymond, once uh, they lose their CFO, what does it take to get it back? Uh, they'll have to be inspected, and the inspection will require all levels of uh, building, mechanical, plumbing, uh, electrical, uh, fire, to make sure everything is operating as it should within the facility, the space, or the building. So it, it gives you a, a much better ability to go in there and find those things that uh, uh, weren't known. Correct. Uh, <laughs> A lot of times, if you have one problem, there's several other behind it, but we don't know about them. Is that That's right? true, yeah. sir. Okay. okay. Well, again, Good. Uh, th thanks, staff, for uh, coming to us with this quickly and, and, and respond your your quick response. Uh, Councilman Pesley. Yeah, I I I think this is a good plan, but. Is there going to be some verbiage in here that you're not showing that, you know, we, we just can't go turn the water off because we're mad at the owner of the apartment complex and you've got people who live there and it's not their fault that they have a bad landlord. So there has to be some allocation for relocation of the individuals who are living there. Right. So part of we, uh, I don't know if you want something documented or part of the ordinance and the whereas or something like that. But and please, we, please take note that a Republican brought that up. Well. Right. <laughs> <laughs> That's the first thing we did. Yeah. <laughs> no. Uh, we part of the business plan would be to have that. Well, you know, most council. Republicans just throw them out in the street. <laughs> really. oh. Right. Yeah. Part of the business plan would. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Councilman Pusley, part of the a big part of that business plan to do something like this would to have that relocation assistance plan in place. Uh, so that would mean either we have the staff that would help the residents, or we partner with an agency. We already have two that are lined up and ready to work with us. Okay. So in this case, an agency would help us, but in the future, it could be staff persons helping those individuals, and then financial resources as well. We have money available from our federal allocations for housing okay. or emergency housing. So only in those cases would we use this. We wouldn't just turn the water off and say, you guys are on your own. Yeah. Because uh, we know there's a big humanitarian part uh, to this. Okay. Yes, sir. All right. Yeah, thank thank you. you for for asking that. Okay. Uh, Councilman Hunter. Thank you. Okay. So we're going to do this with some of these larger multifamily projects. Will it ever roll over into the single family locations? Because... <laughs> I have never had my water turned off before. Mm -hmm. so. Well, um, <laughs> <laughs> don't make us check. <laughs> Just the, seven the, or eight times. The building code, the IBC and the IRC allows the building official to do so, right? So there have been some times in this community where uh, we can't get the, the owner's attention, right? So as soon as we know that the renters have have left the home, let's say it's a rental home in this case, because it happens twice, then we pull the power because things are going on in that home that they're, he's renting to, to citizens and he's not pulling permits. So electrical, plumbing, mechanical, we need to make sure that the, the place is safe. So in those instances, we pull the power, but we don't pull the power on, on people it, dwelling in a home and, and right. saying, hey, get okay. out. But, and it will never go in that direction, correct? No. 
All right. No. All right. No. That's not what. We, that's not the no. intent. Okay. No. But I will vote for it. But if but if we do, but if it does, you'll be the first home to be. Yeah, I'll right. be no. the first one to know. Okay. I bet you. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Councilman. I'm going to go ahead and open public hearing. Uh, is there any public comment for item number 33? Okay. Being no being there being no public comment. Uh, yes. Entertain a motion. Do we have a second? Second. Um, all in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed say no. The motion carries. Item number 22, zoning case number 0122-01, Javier de la Garza. Mr. Raymond. Okay, I'm waiting for uh, the presentation. Okay. Okay, very good. Uh, the case before you uh, uh, is to rezone a property located at 2407 Mary Street from RM1 multifamily district to RS4.5 single family 4.5 district. The property is located along the south side of Mary Street, east of 22nd Street, west of 21st Street. The applicant is Javier de la Garza. The proposed rezoning is to allow for the construction of two single family residences. The property totals 0.34 acres in size and it is platted. However, this property is going through a replat to create three separate lots. The first lot will front along Mary Street, which is where the existing home is. The, uh, the two subsequent lots, one will front along 22nd Street and one will front along 21st Street. To the north, south, east, and west are either single-family homes or existing multifamily developments zoned the RS6 single-family 6 district or RM3 multifamily 3 district. 32 notices were mailed out within the 200-foot notification area. Sorry. Uh, zero were returned in opposition. Zero were returned in favor. Uh, this proposed rezoning is consistent with the adopted comprehensive plan uh, compatible with the adjoining properties and it does not have a negative impact on the surrounding area. Planning Commission and staff recommend approval and I stand by for any questions. Okay. Do we have any questions, Councilman? Okay, then I will go ahead and open public hearing. Is there any public hearing on item number 22? Okay, there being none, I will close public comment. Uh, Mr. Lerma, do you have a question? No, ma'am. No, okay. Uh, and entertain a motion to approve item number 22. Move to approve. Second. Okay. Second. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed say no. The motion carries. Item number 23 is a zoning case number 0122-05, Land Majestic LLC, located in District 4. Uh, good afternoon again, Mayor and Council. The case before you is to rezone the property located at 302 Graham Road from RM1 Multifamily District 1 to RV Recreational Vehicle Park District. The property is located along the north side of Graham Road, east of Waldron Road, and west of Laguna Shores Road. The applicant is Land Majestic LLC. The proposed rezoning is to allow for the construction of a recreational vehicle park. The property totals 21.118 acres in size and it is not platted. To the north is, is the O'Neill drainage channel and across the drainage channel is a single family development zoned uh, RM1. To the south are single family residences zoned RM1. To the east are vacant properties zoned RM1 and IH Heavy Industrial. To the west is a park and a mini storage zoned CG2. 29 notices were mailed out within a 200 foot notification area. Six were returned in opposition, represented by four owners, and zero were returned in favor. The six in opposition indicate that 6.14% 6 of the landowners within the 200 foot notification area are opposed to this rezoning. Uh, as to note, the opposition focused primarily on traffic uh, congestion. Uh, this development would lower property values. This development, uh, the RV park would create homeless encampments and the RV park would eliminate uh, the preservation of some of the birding areas in, in Flower Bluff. 
Uh, this proposed rezoning is consistent with the adopted comprehensive plan, compatible with the adjoining properties, and it does not have a negative impact on the surrounding area. The property consists of vacant land that has remained undeveloped since annexation in 1961. The Flower Bluff Area Development Plan <laughs> calls for high density residential use. Uh, high density residential use is 21 units per acre or more. Uh, the maximum allowable number of, of RV lots uh, per acre is 25 units, so it is in, indeed in and of itself high density. Therefore, staff and planning commission recommend approval, and I stand by for any questions. Councilman Smith. Thank you. Uh Uh, absolutely. There's screening. Um, one second here. Yes, sir. There's a, the RV uh, screens from the CG2, which is the, the west side of the property, uh, with the 10 points, five, uh, 10 foot buffer and five points, which is about a six foot uh, tall fence, and that could run along that whole boundary. Uh, incidentally, and you had talked to me about screening from the from the RV to the ditch, but that ditch is approximately 120 feet in width, so the UDC doesn't require screening because there's such a large berth. Uh, but if you wanted to make it a condition of the zoning, you you're certainly free to do that. You turn your mic on. Yeah. Thank uh, you. On, on Walden Road, there's a. a Good size RV park, and it it is beneficial for them to be screened. So uh, you know the grand frontage, and we we notice the opposition is located all on the north side and the south side uh, with it. So screening, I think, is is very helpful uh, on there. That uh, you say the maximum density uh, is 25, but it, it's really hard to get 25 of course. lots in that. And, and if you do, that RV park is probably not going to be successful because it's, it's, it's too tight. It's cramming them in. It, it, exactly. It's cramming them in. And uh, maybe in the future we ought to um, be looking at that uh, on there. But... Uh, so as I'm looking at the map, we've really got basically high density surround on, on all corners uh, of it. We've got the, the residential uh, zoning is, is uh, am I reading this right, CG2 on, on the north side? Uh, that's CG, that's uh, general commercial on yeah. the north side. Okay. So it, it, at some point in time, Nick and, Nick and Bacher, that allows for short-term rentals, uh, exactly. other kind of things that, that go into the CG2. And, and I'd, I'd like to co comment on the homeless issue uh, with it, that historically this property was a homeless camp uh, on there. It was very popular for the homeless uh, with it. So I, I think developing it into an RV park would uh, really change that character uh, with it. And uh, so I, I'm going to support this. Uh, I think it's good. Good for the bluff, uh, adds to our tax base, and uh, it, it's an overall good project uh, with the requirements of the screening, screening right. the north and the south boundaries. So. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and open public um, public hearing. Does anybody like to make a comment on item number 23? Yes, sir. Mayor, City Council, and staff, appreciate you um, looking at this in the agenda. Um, you're right, it would be ideal to change that, that code. There's no way feasibly. We actually are submitting um, plans for the platting of this property and the design. There will be 160 spaces is what's going to end up being there, 158, for a total of 25 acres, this track and the adjacent four acres. So um, the I... I we intend with the platting process to put curb and gutter in the front of the property and we would and and we're going to have a pretty significant kind of water feature it'll be a it'll be a gated entrance into the property and um, significant ponds with lights and a fountain on both sides of it i really don't 
that's kind of the amenity, right, is pulling you into it. And so I'm, I'm, I, the east and the west and the north side will be, um, will be um, fenced because um, we don't want people walking in there. But on the south side, we'd really like when people come down Graham, they can see this beautiful curb, gutter, sidewalk, water feature, and the, the, the development will actually be set back. So um, if it's at all possible, we'd really like to have the landscaping draw you in and not have a fence up close hiding the, those kind of amenities. But um, anyways, if you have any questions, um, I'm Thank here you. to answer it. Can you identify yourself, sir? Sorry, oh. I'm Spencer Fillmore. Spencer Fillmore. I'm the, I'm the landowner of it. The okay. okay. So, Mr. Raymond, we can't just by zoning uh, address that. That would have to be a, a special permit. Well, you can make it a condition. Are you talking about steal the screening? So well, well, the, the condition he's mentioning on the front. Uh, so, Spencer, what would your setback be? Um, um, I, I would say it's a minimum of like 40 feet because we have to have curb, gutter, right-of-ways, and then we have to have a pond. In fact, the um, – anyways, I, I think I have a lay, a, a lay a, a PDF of what the anticipated look will be. Do we have that? Yeah. Uh, we're going to have ponds on both sides. Uh, there will be detention, but they're more of landscaping, okay. fountain-type ponds that will. That will they'll, they'll provide a very nice buffer because they have to have that distance in the front. Can mm -hmm. we address that in platting? Yeah, that, now? Will, that will be covered in the planning stage. Great. Yeah, yeah it will. It will be. Okay. Yeah, it will be. Yeah, it'll be. It'll be a beautiful. It'll be a beautiful yeah. development. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we'll go ahead and clap. Are you reading? Anyone? Yes, sir. Mention. Uh, yes. The property owner uh, is bringing forth another case next week. To the to the east of this property, uh, and it's 20 acres, and it's also an RV uh, park as well. Mm -hmm. So. Four, sorry, four acres. Four acres. Four acres. Four, I apologize. Okay. Four acres. Okay. Okay. Thank you, um, Mr. Hunter. Just a quick question, but I believe. You kind of already say this property owner is the same as the business owner? Oh. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay. Thank okay. you. Okay, I'm going to close public hearing and inter entertain a motion to approve to approve the um, item number 20, what is it, two, 23. I'll, I'll make a motion to approve contingent on the screening on the north side. Okay. Do we have a second? Second. Okay. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say no. The motion carries. And Madam Mayor, I ask if we could just go over item 24. Uh, oh, right. Okay. Tw uh, 24, right. Uh, that is a zoning case uh, number 0122-07, the Mastagasi. Pardon? Port of Water, wasn't that pulled from the agenda? Yes. Well, are you wanting me to do a presentation or you just want to ask questions uh, or? Well, what, what I would like, it, it's uh, page 385. It's ACU's map. ACU's map, okay. Uh, on there. It's the next to the last page in the presentation. Well, that, Mayor, the reason I bring it up is I had people texting me wanting to know about this case, and I told them that it had been removed from the agenda. So I want to make sure we're well, not. It's only discussion. It's only discussion since it's on the yeah. agenda anyway. Well, and, we'll, and we won't take very long on this. Yeah. What was the question? Okay. Can you put that up uh, on the screen? I, it's not in my presentation, okay. but uh, okay. well, let me make sure. Uh, well, it's uh, your slide uh, nine the or, or six. It's in the next slide. Let's see, so let's, let me just go and see. No, it's not in my presentation. Okay. This is you're, yeah, it's what you're looking at right there. Right. It's the page. the page you got open. But that's okay. We don't. I mean, if we can't put it up, that's okay. Just you've got it there. I, I, I guess the point I want to make to council when we're all here because we can't talk off the record on there. We we've got an ACUS for Walden Field uh, with it, and uh, 24 that was pulled on there is in the middle of it. But there's a lot of other properties. <laughs> within this ACUS area around Waldron Field. And 
this year we had a 10 acre property that was zoned R6. So it had the zoning in ACUS 2. But since it was zoned that way, this was a 10 acre piece of property. That subdivision is in place. The Navy doesn't like it on there because it, it's, it's against ACUS. And as I was looking at this map, we've got other areas, other uh, we've got on the south side of the property, we've got on the west side of the property, and, and we have on the northwest side of this property that we have R6 areas that don't need to come before this body. They can just go to platting, and we can surround Waldron Field with high density that the Navy doesn't like. Mm -hmm. We didn't see it on that 10-acre tract on there because it didn't need to come here with it. Planning uh, by default, uh, they didn't uh, vote on it, and, and so it went through. Uh, we've got an R4.5 that just touches this uh, with it. I don't know what we should be doing. I think uh, this council is very supportive of the Navy uh, on here, but we could see in, in this area of Flower Bluff a substantial development that is uh, contrary to the Navy's ACUS plan because of its current zoning. Again, we have it on the south side, we have it on the west side, and we have it on the northwest side. And they, they are developments uh, coming in that are doing that. And it may not come to this body, but it's gonna happen. And like everybody talks about the Navy, when, when they address all of this, Waldron Field is becoming encroached on. With it, and I and I hope this body takes note of this. And uh, we in Cabinsfield, we protected that. Uh, we we went and got some DAG money and, and things like that. And I think we have some similar issues in Flower Bluff, where we have this existing zoning. And if we take that zoning away, then you get in Fifth Amendment property rights issues. Uh, you can't take you you can't down zone for the public interest without running into those issues. So I, I think development services, they have a big issue with that. Uh, somebody comes to them and has an R6, even though, though it is in ACUS too. And what can you do? We as a body here, we need to be taking a look at that. So that's, that's a good point. Um, mm -hmm. again, it's on 385 of our packet or the, the seventh, everybody's got your packet sitting there. You can mm -hmm. look at all the squiggles and lines and like I said, a lot of this goes into your higher density residential that is contrary to the Navy's ACUS plan. So that's all I wanted to say. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Okay, and I think, Jennifer, we're just uh, uh, accepting and appropriating. So let's go and do item number 27. I know you've been waiting. This is an ordinance authorizing acceptance and appropriation of uh, a little over $4.2 million for the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development for implementation of the Home Investment Partnership Program American Rescue Plan. Good afternoon, I'm Jennifer Buxton with Neighborhood Services. Thank you very much. There has been no change to the item since two weeks ago and I can address any questions you have before the public hearing. Great, any questions gentlemen? There being none, we will open public comment. Does anyone have any comment on item number 27? Okay, I'll close public comment and entertain a motion to approve item number 27. Move to approve. Okay, any further discussion? All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed say no? Motion carries. All right, let's go back to complications. <laughs> uh, let's see, item number 25, ordinance authorizing a water arterial transmission grid main construction and reimbursement agreement for up to $471,448. $471,448.10 with Cypress Point Capital, LLC. And, and, and thank you, yes, sir. Uh, Mayor and Council. I, I just want to go back to your comment that you made in, in the Flower Buff area. And we had a developer uh, several months ago, probably later, uh, late last year, you know, he, he had some property. It was in the ACUS. It was, I think it was RS6. And he you know, he built exactly what it is. He didn't come before this body. It wasn't a rezoning. And, and everyone was up in arms, right? The only way, one, one, of the, one of the direct ways to deal with that is that the city could rezone the properties to protect 
the installations, and that mm -hmm. may many people landowners would say, "Hey, you're devaluating my property," so the city could rezone the property and possibly purchase the property, right, to protect the installations if they are that important to us. Otherwise, it's going to get into the the personal fight of, "Hey, it's my property; I do what I want with it," like that developer did, and he's building you know homes in that same area. So. I just wanted to say that I understand what you're saying, but that's a bigger issue that we have to take on with a planning to say, hey, look, if we want to protect our our um, our uh, installations, we have to downgrade the zoning and say, hey, nothing can go in here but you know compatible uses. So anyway, sorry. Okay. Just want to make that comment. Thank uh, you. The uh, the. Uh, the purpose of this resolution, sorry, is to uh, enter into a 24-month reimbursement agreement with Cypress Point uh, Capital LLC for $471,448.10. This agreement is for the construction of a water, arterial transmission, and grid main for the proposed residential development called Carolyn's Height Unit 1. This is an, an aerial overview of the property uh, on located on County Road 43 at uh, FM 2444. The property totals 18.72 acres in size and the property is platted. To the east of Carolyn's Heights, Unit 1 is a subdivision named uh, Swan Village, Phase 1. To the north is the Promenade and they are both uh, utilizing city water service. Again, this shows the property located on County Road 43 uh, at FM 2444. Uh, this property, the subject property is approximately 2.4 miles outside of the city limits. This slide uh, shows the approximate location of the plan water utility transmission in Grid Main. The offsite improvements consi will consist of installing 3,153 linear feet of 12 inch PVC pipe. Additionally, a total of five fire hydrants will, will, fire hydrant connections will be installed to provide fire protection to the proposed subdivision, which will consist of 29 single family homes. The total portion of the eligible reimbursable amount for the project is $484,907.78, less the lot and acreage fee, which he gets credit for, which is $13,459.68, which leaves the, the total maximum allowable reimbursable amount of $471,448.10. This slide shows the trust fund balance at January 31st, 2022. At that time, the water arterial transmission and grid main balance was $315,900.97. We transferred at that time $79,036.81 from the water distribution main trust, and we transferred $76,000. $510.32 from the Sanitary Sewer Trunk System Trust uh, to reimburse the developer for his total of $471,448.10. The numbers highlighted in yellow represent what will be left in the balance if Council approves this amount uh, going forward. Staff recommends approval, and I stand by for any questions. Councilman Smith. Thank you. Uh, so, Mr. Raymond, you, how far outside of the city limits is this? 2.4 miles. Okay. Did the developer make any um, indication they'd like to be in the city limits? No. Okay. Are, are we required to do this? Yes, uh, because he's in our CCN and he... Uh, um, we're not required to do the trust fund, is the question. Oh, the yeah, is, is yeah. It, the question is, should, are we required to reimburse them out of this trust fund money? Oh, good point. Right, the so. answer is no, we're not required. Oh, okay. And in fact, if I can, what I, once this came to our attention, it's kind of 
too late to, for staff not to recommend it because it's approved policy. But we do want to bring back to council in the next few weeks a recommendation to the council that says only properties inside the city limits are eligible for trust fund reimbursements. Okay. That's something we want to bring forward because this is it, we really shouldn't be reimbursing this developer outside the city limits where we're getting zero property tax, and it's on septic. Well, you said it. You've said it better <laughs> than I could say it. Thank you, Mr. Thank city you, Manager, on that. Next. Next. Okay. Well, I, you know, I thought it was kind of funny that you mentioned uh, fire hydrants for, um, for fire protection, considering they don't pay city taxes, they pay for the fire department. Well, it's, it's in the county. I'm sure the county has fire protection. Oh, no, okay. no <laughs> there is none. It, our units would go out there because there's not a, there's not an emergency service district in that area. As a matter of fact, that's something we had talked about in terms of being able to find a way to recover right. for those areas that are outside that are not covered by an right. emergency service district um, now going towards this I don't think we should be incentivizing construction for developments outside the city limits using trust funds so with that since uh, the city manager mentioned it and I agree with uh, Councilman Smith we should not be paying for this should not be coming out of trust funds in developments outside the city limits um, so I will be voting no on this yeah Okay, um, I'll go ahead and open public hearing. Is there anyone in the public that'd like to comment on item number 25? Okay, there being none, we'll close public hear hearing and I'll entertain a motion to approve uh, the ordinance. Motion to deny. Second. I'll second. Yeah. Okay. It's motion to deny for 25. Okay. Okay, can we, is that an okay action? Yeah, that's great. Mr. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Okay. okay, all in favor say to deny, say aye. 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 Any opposed say no. Okay, aye. motion to deny passes. Okay, well item number 26 is an ordinance amending the unified, unified. Oh no, 20. Oh. Oh, I know, sorry. I don't normally vote in the negative. Okay, so. Okay. You voted no on item number 20. Right. Okay. Okay. Motion to Okay. Deny. Item number 26 is an ordinance amending the Unified Development Code to rename the Community Enrichment Fund to the Park Development Fund. Not quite. Yeah. All right, good, good evening, Mayor, Council, City Manager, Dr. Dr. Dante Gonzalez, Interim Director of Parks and Recreation. And today with me is uh, Mr. Chris Anderson from the Office of Strategic uh, Innovation, Mr. Buck Bryce, uh, City, Assistant City Attorney, and Kevin Johnson, Assistant Director of Parks and Recreation. This is one of, this, this is one of the items that we have brought to you uh, several times as a briefing, and today we're bringing it to you uh, after we had taken it to Planning Commission and they have approved uh, some of the recommendations that we brought forth to them. This has been a collaborative effort between uh, Parks and Recreation Legal, Office of Strategic Innovation, Development Services, members of City Manager's Office, and with approval, as I've said, with stakeholders such as the development community as well as the Planning Commission. So just a very brief overview, uh, since I believe you guys have seen this, this message before, is there's two ways in which that a, develop, a developer can uh, provide open, public open space uh, for recreation areas in the form of public parks. One of them is through the land dedication or the fee in lieu of land, and the second way is to do a park development fee or park development improvements. The land dedication and the, uh, so to demonstrate that particular process, I uh, would like to take it through just a very short uh, example of how the developer usually typically d donates this land. So the first way is the land dedication, which enables the developer to propose a certain land amount for parkland during the planning stage. Parks and Recreation reviews the, the dedication of the land, and if it's not accepted, the developer can then come back and modify the plat or opt out for a fee in lieu of land. The FILO, which is the fee in lieu of land, is determined by the assistant city manager over development services and is calculated by an equation 
which is A times V equals M. A is the amount of land that is required for dedication. V is the fair market value per acre of that particular development. And then M is the number of dollars to be paid in fee in lieu of the dedication. So how that really works is if we take an example and we calculate that out for a 100 dwelling development, it would be one, it would total one acre land donation. So in the simplified example, one acre donation at the max value of fair price, fair market price would yield $62,000 in Philo. If you, uh, with the park development, it would be $200 per dwelling unit, which would yield $20,000. So altogether, at the max in which we can collect, specifically on that one acre of land, uh, we would collect about $82,500, which is at the max value. So as the concerns would be brought forth uh, to the from the development community and other stakeholders to city staff, as well as the city council, Parks and Recreation was tasked to take a look into the process and recommended areas for improvements to make this process more transparent and easier to understand to make it equitable for not only Parks and Recreation but also for everyone involved in the process. As we dove into the process, we identified several challenges which you, have, you guys have come to, her, to hear. Some of them include the amount of budget line items that we have. Uh, current stage, we have ballooned over to 165 line items, and with, with each development that passes, we're adding more line items to that particular uh, budget line items. So over time, you know, these has become more increasingly difficult to manage. Uh, as this process was developed, it was easier to manage 10, 15 lines, but now that we're at 165, it's, it's very difficult, not only for staff, but also to be able to provide a more transparent and to be able to run the reports that are being asked of us. So because there were so many budget line items that were being created, uh, what that led to was that no longer items were being created and funding was being assigned to legacy budget line items. So, and finally, the, the third thing that we found was that there was no clear detailed process to prioritize and communicate the community enrichment fund investments to the community, meaning that there was not a very clear and an open process in which the community could uh, provide input to uh, the expenses that were being done. In addition to the complicated internal process, uh, we also met with the community, with the development community, and what they had voiced was that they felt that the formula in which we calculate how much uh, funds they're being provided was very difficult and it was uh, left open for interpretation. So, for example, um, you know, if, if they believed that a, a certain piece of acre was, was valued at a, at a certain amount of money, then that equation, which was A times V equals M, would, would be subjected to each one of them, each individual. Uh, so in order to fix that, what they suggested and what we all agreed upon was to create a flat fee system that would be a lot more clear to understand and a lot easier for them to follow and for us to understand as well. So if we build X amount of dwelling units, then we would simplify by just simply multiplying that number of dwelling units times a set fee value. So it would be a very easy process and there would be no open um, for interpretation. The second proposal that we have is to simplify the follow five mile radius requirement. Uh, what that does is that instead of having 165 plus line, budget line items, we will reduce that to about 11 line items. This would be a lot easier for us to be able to provide that transparency that is being asked, as well as for us to be able to provide you with the report on where and specifically what, what are the amounts that are being placed uh, per development, I mean uh, per area uh, development. So what we have recommended is to, the recommendation will alleviate and create a more transpar transparency since we would be only proposing 11 budget items rather than 165 plus. So to simplify that equation, uh, here is the, this slide shows you the flat fee that we have calculated based off of what we have collected during our current process as well as what we're uh, proposing to collect uh, with the proposed fee. So after going back and forth and having many conversations uh, with the development com community, uh, we negotiated a flat fee of $462.50. That uh, negotiated flat rate will simplify the community enrichment fees and it would be consistent and equitable with our current collection system. So just as, as a quick example, in our current system, in a 600 dwelling unit example, we would roughly collect about $270,000 in both uh, Philo and park development fees. 
uh, with the proposed system, we would be collecting about 277500 So that would be a difference for about $7,000. In a 1,500 dwelling unit sample, then we would collect with our current system 675 with the proposed 693 That would be a difference for about $18,000. So as you can tell, this is a very neutral increase. So understanding all of the challenges with the current process, uh, the staff recommends that we also update our policies to include a the development of an annual community enrichment fund budget, uh, which would mean that this budget can be presented during the annual operating budget. So the update would, would require the city managers to present the proposed budget during the annual operating budget and the capital budget process. This would be staff recommended, city manager reviewed, and would allow the public to discuss and provide input during our public town halls, and ultimately will be council approved. So as part, of the, as part of the process, we also analyze the current level of funding. However, the, upon further review uh, with our proposed budget, we recognize that there's a need to further refine it. So uh, we had a, a budget that we were bringing to council for approval. However, uh, we're, we're, we no longer have that budget. We'll be bringing it at a later date. During some of the during the the times that we have been here, as well as in the planning commission, we had some requests for information that were also requested from us. So I will briefly go over those responses. The first question was from planning commission: was what the percentage of developments uh, that was dedicated land for park space over the last ten years? Responses as less than one percent. Over the past ten years, staff has always been able to find our development whose lands was accepted for, for park space. Question number two from Planning Commission was, what is the percentage of the general fund and other Texas City dedicated to the parks and recreation? What we found is that we were equitable amounts. Some of the, our, our, the cities that we uh, typically compare ourselves to, uh, and we are at 6.86%. 6, 6, uh, 6 this was a uh, request for information number three was a city council uh, request and our meetings included in the city records park acreage. The answer is yes. Uh, according to our 2012 partial recreation plan, uh, some of our, our uh, meetings are included as part of the parks. How much revenue would be generated if park development fee was raised from $200 to $250 and the file was left static? Uh, it, would, it would remain basically about the same $87,500. How has residential development trended over the city over the past 10 years? Uh, typically, uh, here you see a heat map, and you'll see that most of the developments has happened in the south. Can we split the larger area development zones? And as I've included earlier, we have, we have included 11 uh, different budget line orgs. So these 11 budget line orgs are represented in this map, which will include to uh, divide the Padre Island into Mustang Island and Padre Island, as well as Southside A and Southside B. How much parkland, federal, state, counts, uh, county, and city is there within the city limits? The response is 6,530.6 acres. Out of that, 2,100 acres are city park acres. So with that, our recommendation is to amend the UDC to rename the Community Enrichment Fund to the Park Development Fund amend the UDC to dissolve the five mile radius requirement and restrict the use of the fee in lieu of land funding to the city development area zone to the contributing residential development, change the follow from a formula based fee to a flat rate for per dwelling unit, uh, dissolve park development fees, adopt the proposed F, oh, well, th that one we will bring in at a later date, uh, and updating the, fi uh, the budget finance policy to require the city manager to present the proposed community enrichment budget with the operating budget and capital budget at every the beginning of every fiscal year. Furthermore, removing the language to allow a refund if fees are not spent within seven years, and this will be addressed by every year, we will be able to continue to make those, those recommendations in the budget, what every year would be spent uh, as, as we would recommend those changes that are approved by city council. And then finally, the assistant city manager of parks and recreation shall determine the amount of FILO instead of the ACM from development services. And with that, I will take any questions. Thank you for the presentation, Dante. Um, Councilmember Hernandez. Thank you. Um, 
I want to say we're intimately involved with this discussion, and I've been to the Planning Commission meetings where I thought there was somewhat of a lack of candor in uh, the presentations to uh, the Planning Commission. That being said, uh, I don't have an issue with updating this new to a new system that does area development plans. What I've always had an issue with was how we spent the money currently that we've already spent, and then the, the uh, and I see that you uh, removed the budget, and the reason uh, I brought that to the attention to both uh, yourself, city manager, and to uh, Neiman Young, was that budget didn't comply with the previous uh, UDC uh, ordinance as it stands, and it doesn't comply with the new one. So, you know, I don't know where you came up with that budget, but it has to either comply with the old one or the new one. Either way, you would still have to wait for an audit to determine where all that funding should be going, even if you're doing an area development plan. So um, what, I will, what I will recommend is that, is that whatever we decide going forward, and I, like I said, I don't have a problem with the, with the new system, it's that the budget for expenditures should be in compliance with either the old one or the new one. So I'll make a motion to adopt the new plan However, uh, the spending of the existing balances must be in compliance with that new plan. Right, and Councilman, we, uh, uh, Dr. Dante didn't cover that, but you, as you can see, we removed that budget. We had, what was it, 3.4? 2.8. Two, what? 2.8. 2. 2. 2. We, we have 2.8 million in unspent prior year's money dating back 10 years, and some of the prior presentations you saw, we had a recommendation on how to allocate that. Uh, but uh, with the councilman's input and legal's advice, we need to make sure how we allocate that's consistent with the the ordinance that was on the books when the monies came in over the 10-year period. Uh, so if that makes sense. So what we're doing is we're looking, we're doing, the, the audit's actually being done by Dr. Dante's staff in Parks, and it'll be cross-checked by the auditor. So we'll see where did that money actually come from. And then in parks that it will be recommended to be spent it has to be within those geographic limits set forth by the prior ordinance so that explanation to say we'll be coming back in the near future with an item uh, that'll allocate 2.4 million consistent with the prior ordinance that existed that's okay so that that's that had been my, my right. whole uh, issue right is it you know if we're not going to comply with the ordinance why do we have an ordinance right and that's right. why we withdrew withdrew that from from today's presentation okay so, so it's a two-step process so today is the new policy to be considered uh, this is the one of two, today going forward today going forward exactly and then we'll come back soon dr. Dante actually said they're making pretty good progress mm -hmm. on assessing where did those monies come from We'll work with Kim, the city uh, interim city auditor, to validate that, and then we'll come forward with a plan after we work with the council on how it could be spent. Okay. Now I know she's done some extensive work, and also looking at uh, at how money was previously spent. We gave some examples of some, uh, which I thought was funny that I was being accused of of not wanting to pay for for West Side Parks, and and you guys actually did that with the funding of Cole Park Pier. Uh, I won't, I, won't, um, I won't beat a dead horse with that, but uh, all <laughs> No, no, no. What, what I'm saying is that they actually took funding from Cano 2, which is over off of Greenwood and Holly, and spent it, and spent it there. So I, I'll, just so you know, I, I didn't do that. Okay, so we have to do it, spend it in compliance with the original ordinance, uh, part of the UDC, which is the three, the three items that you have to take into consideration, most likely to be used by that subdivision, uh, no more than five miles away, taking into consideration natural barriers such as highways and waterways, such as Oso Creek or some ship channel or something like that, right? No, that's correct. You know, we're, we're looking at every single account right now. I mean, it's taking a tremendous amount of work, but it, we're, we're making some pretty good progress in, in looking at every single one of those, those um, accounts. And we would be taking into consider in consideration the five mile radius, uh, which is the requirement, and then consider the, the barriers, which is uh, the barriers, natural high, highways, and natural barriers like waterways, most likely to be used by that subdivision. Correct, as long as they're uh, neighborhood parks, community parks, or regional parks. Regional parks, right? Right, not niche parks. Not, not niche, niche parks. parks not linear parks. Not li well, it, right. Right. So. Uh, so that that was my main concern it has been the issue that reason why we've done the uh the audit so i think you've addressed it i don't have an issue with it going forward uh, as long as that budget um uh, with the existing funds and we'll do a, a full audit on the um on the ones that have already been spent 
Okay. All right. Thank you. Councilmember Member Pusley. Sorry. Yeah, Dante. Um, why, why $462.50? Why not $463 or f an even $500? I mean, it's like Councilman uh, has said several times, why did we make this a calculus problem instead of <laughs> something simple? I, I don't understand. Well, I think that falls down to we just every did we just take a number and divide it by some. So we've we've taken into consideration uh, a lot of different factors. One of them is you know we want to make sure that we're getting equitable uh, with our current system that we have, and and to make sure that we're we're not re taking up less amount of development fees that we need to be. Uh, at that four hundred and sixty-two dollars, we're pretty safe. In, in ensuring that we're, we're collecting the amount of fees that we need to be collecting, and they're equitable with the current years that we have received the funding. Um, and the 465, the $462.50 was, the, um, was the, the negotiated number in which they came about. You can blame it on Moses. <laughs> <laughs> and Wendy. <laughs> So uh, that's. I just got really tickled when I saw that. I said, "That's a perfect government number." Um, okay, I, I've expressed this before, and I, I'm going to say it again. I, I still have an overall basic problem with the fairness of this program. Um, I think that, uh, and I'm going to use District One as an example. Um, the city has spent very little money up until this year. I know we've increased the budget there, thanks to Councilman Lerma's work with staff, um, that we're going to budget to spend some additional money in District 1 for parks and recreation. But heretofore, that time, the city has spent very little money uh, in that area and I think has a lot of ground to make up. And so this program to me rewards one section of town where all the growth is at, uh, which uh, even though Councilman Hernandez doesn't believe we're gonna have any growth out in the Northwest area, I still think we will. But uh, the, uh, uh, the overall fairness of this, I have a real problem with. So I'm just stating that. Okay, any other questions from council? So I'll, I'll, I'll make a motion to approve to go to the oh, next. Hang on, so. it's a uh, public hearing. Okay. Uh, with that being said, uh, I'm going to open this to public um, hearing. And if there's anyone in the public that wishes to speak, please come forward. Okay, I'm going to close public hearing. And at this point, I'm going to entertain a motion. So I make a motion to approve of the new the the ordinance has written uh, effective uh, upon I guess signature upon, upon signature of the second reading yeah and this includes the well the budgeting process is something separate that needs yeah. to be in compliance with the old yeah, no, with the mean. old uh, with the old portion Right. We'll bring back that as a separate item for the 2.4. Okay. There's a motion on the floor with a second. Uh, any further discussion? I just have one question real quick. So the uh, development community was concerned about us taking a vote on this before. I'm sorry. Somebody's yeah, no, no. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. I'm sorry. Uh, before the audit was complete. The, uh, so the audit was complete. Uh, for the test, the sample test that they did do, we presented it to the audit, or actually Kim Houston presented it to the audit committee. Yes. And uh, and so they're fine. Um, I think what I punched in to speak because I did want to thank the development community. Uh, generally, when they're not in support of what we're recommending, they're here. And you can see today they're not here. Okay. So that tells us that they're in agreement. We we owe them some thanks. We do as staff. We work with them in numerous meetings okay. uh, Neiman uh, Young did in particular and, and the park staff and so uh, they're in agreement with this new policy they like the transparency the ease of it uh, it's a net neutral to them there's no increase in fees we'll do that at a later date uh, and they were in and agreement the money with you've collected you're going to spend it based on the old policy not uh, exactly on the old ordinance yes sir okay all right yeah thank you uh, okay uh, council member Hernandez 
Sorry, I just wanted to know, to verify that the developers, once you lowered the fee to where it was equivalent to what they were already paying, they kind of bailed on the on the on that process, which was fine because realistically, once they turn over the money to us, it's it's our it's what we have to spend it, right? They can't ask for it back after the seven years because it's not their property. The homeowners would actually have had to ask for that that money, which they're not going to. Okay, so with that, the the audit, uh, I don't think it's complete. Complete. We want to make sure we don't have an audit report on it. She gave an update on it, so we want to still do co complete it. That way, we assist in making sure that you know you it, it's spent appropriately, and we determine where the all the funding went because it's it is a mess, and uh, it is something that we put on a regular audit schedule. It's not something like an ad, ad hoc audit. It, it's something that we put on there. We. Uh, we uh, plan for. So uh, with that, I, I ask that you work uh, closely with uh, our interim um, auditor, uh, city auditor, to uh, make sure everything is uh, kosher. Yeah. So Absolutely. And, you know, 11, 11 in council would be a lot easier. There is a motion and a second. Um, and uh, so with that, I'll uh, call for a vote. All in favor, say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Same sign. Motion carries, and at this... Mayor Pro Temp, I was tempted by Councilman Martinez for pizza in the back. It was his fault. So I missed on item 25 that they were not going to come into the city, even though they're located out of the city, that they will not be coming back into the city. So I have worked with Rebecca to go along with majority of the council on that vote. Okay. Yeah. I so he apologize. changed his vote to yes. Okay. Thank I, you for I saying was, that publicly. I had yes. pizza in my mouth and not intelligence in my ears. I okay. Appreciate. Rebecca, there's no uh, further items, is there? Okay. Uh, so with that, uh, there being no further business, this meeting is adjourned. Almost everyone agrees recycling is good for the environment, but one of the biggest problems facing